Tell the word, everybody. Welcome to this week's very special episode of Let's Talk FGO. We're going to talk to you about Lost Belt 6, Act 1, Chapter the First, Subsection A. There's a lot of subsectioning going on here. But also, hey, Ordeal Call happened. It started, technically. So we're going to teach you about class scores, probably. And also... <laughs> yes, thank you, chat. This is the appropriate response. I gave Lucky the headphone warning before we got in. But yes, we're also going to talk to you about Mailbag, which is very full this week, and a little bit of... So you didn't roll that five-star, just in case you didn't. Not any specific five-star, that one. You know the one. Hello, I am one of your hosts from the Court of Summer Omega. With me, as always, the King of Autumn, Lucky. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying Fate Grand Order, a.k.a. a fairy tale like no other. And while we will be talking about the latest in FGO-related news and memes, we will be talking about current and future events for both the JP and EA version of the game, so anyone not wanting to spoil it should find their own Child of Prophecy. Yes, as, as usual with shows that are about ongoing story events, we are not fucking around with the spoiler warning. Not this time, no. Our notes are detailed. Very. They are thorough. They are rigorous, perhaps. So, obviously, you will be able to pull your eject lever at your own time. And we're probably not going to go further than, what, Section 5? Section 5. It's we actually had... about the halfway point, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're you're all the way caught up, you don't need to worry about getting caught out here. But there's quite a lot of stuff to talk about. Before we go any further, I would like to remind everybody, this beautiful live episode is brought to you by our patrons like Adam DeHarp, Blacklist OG, Call Me Zed, Carlos, Dragon, Ferris, Flightless Icebird, Jerry Vasquez, JDV, 9000, Adjust of the Fae, Jonathan Sandoval, Starlight, Legendary Bond Center, Liam Castle, Regent Raptor, Rise of Kenji, Rogue Robin, Charvor, Sean Pryor, Some Guy Named Bob, and Baron the Crow. Thank you for your support very much, patrons. And if you want to see us do more, you can consider supporting us on Patreon and get access to episodes early in an audio format. Thank you. Uh, Section 5 specifically is Fragment 3? Question mark? Question mark. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, somebody in, in chat brought this up. Um, the This is a very dense story. This, there's a lot going on here. You now we're already doing Robin to future... Uh, <laughs> future time codes. But yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. So we'll be talking about it. Also, hey, by the way, chat, I'm also going to warn you. No future spoilers. Anybody dishing out future spoilers ahead of where we're talking about will be shot. Oh, I should have added a gun click to the soundboard. <laughs> I played it right there. Maybe later. But all right. We still have, you know, regular show stuff to go through. So we're going to go down the list. First of all. Wake the fuck up, Senpai, regular second for pro tips. My first pro tip. Holy shit, there's so much text. Oh my god, make sure to hydrate. Hydrate or dihydrate. Like, seriously, this is very dense. I, I, I know some people didn't even have time to get started on this until uh, a few days ago, you know, because it dropped in the middle of the week. But, like, seriously, it, it, you're going to be sitting and reading for a while. So, you know, be aware of your surroundings and all that good stuff. Because I, I know I've been sucked into some long periods. Uh, but also, a more generalized tip. As always, try to make sure you're caught up on story stuff. You get lots of free goodies this way. This applies not only to future NA stuff that's, you know, in the process of coming, but also applies to JP stuff we're going to talk about. Because the economy has been uh, been firing. Bang, bang. But that means we can get to the shit you guys actually care about and talk about records from the throne, our regular achievement topic. Because I all know you guys want to hear about the rolls. <laughs> uh, I will start. I have the first note here. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, Chef. I'm in complete bamboozlement of this banner. We start off. My literal first 10 spin. We start off getting me my NP2 Tamamo and my fifth K-Scope. By the way, this is the first Tamamo I've actually physically rolled. I have a Tamamo from the free SSR campaign, not from actually rolling her. That's right. We're like five years in. This is the first time I physically rolled. And that's just how we started. Uh, the end result, the final damage is NP3, Fairy Gawain, NP2 Tristan. Same 11 spin, by the way. 
completely bamboozled. I uh, got my NP5 on Herc. I got an Ozymandias. And I got Rare Prisms from Cat and Emia. Plus a sixth goddamn K-Scope. That's right, I made a Super Scope and I have one left over. And also several of the new CEs. So after like 390-ish Saint Courts, I think. Because obviously I got some extra from actually, you know, doing the story and stuff. I'm not really like upset or anything. I'm just fucking confused. You know, it, it was it was a humdinger. Two SSRs, neither of which were on raid up. Quite a few of the the SRs, but also some non SRs. Oh yeah, and I didn't put this in my notes, but it's true. I did actually get my uh, final NP copy of Casku, who was only NP four before, and some extras besides. But yeah, it's just all over the place. Uh, that said, Black Dog and Fairy Liz's smiles are protected. I did my usual and took my day out to get that free EXP in there. Well, I guess that means it's my turn now, and I will go ahead. Um, so I blew my savings about 70 rolls, and for my troubles, I received MP2 uh, Tamlin Gwaine. Um, for about that. As well as a Shahrazad and Nido Chris out of nowhere, Go Team Chocolate. But decided that, you know, my usual rolls were inevitable, and I decided to buy a, uh, a big full pack. Uh, first roll, MP2 Morgan. Um, I have a small panic at that mo moment, and do a full stop. Just, um, you know, just sit down on the porch, contemplate my life choices, and what I want to do. But at that, with that, uh, Morgan and Tamlin Gwaine smiles are protected, and both are at a comfy 666. So, yay for that, but uh, don't you worry, everybody. We're going to go into Not the World, All the World's Evil Damn Close after this. Because after that, after like, oh god, I think it was only last night. I was probably going to do this on stream, but I decided since we were putting it off, I wasn't going to wait anymore. But I did decide that I wanted to keep rolling because I wanted more um, Tamlin Gwen in pays. And I did want at least one copy of Tamlin Tristan. So, I uh, spent the rest of the quartz that I had. I got nothing. I was not too surprised about that, so I bought another 10-pack and rolled it. I got another Nidacris, nothing else. So, I'm a little concerned here. I'm wondering if just Tamlin Tristan just hates me, which is completely possible from what I've seen in the story so far. And I'm considering what, I'm considering what to do. At this point in the point in time, we still have Tamlin Lancelot banner with Percival coming up. We got summer on the way. We got anniversary on the way. And while I have put some um, recover into my funds, I'm not entirely sure I want to keep going right now. There's uh, a lot of stuff going on. I mean, at the very least, you know that you'll have another opportunity uh, for all three of our current banner servants. Uh, this is why, like I said, I'm not really super upset about Morgan because she has so many read-ups. But at the end of Act 3, after Oberon's initial banner, there will be, assuming that NA keeps things going at the same rate, which they probably will. I mean, it might be a little later, but there's no reason to skip out on the read-ups because it's just more monies. Mm -hmm. um, there should be another triangle banner of Morgan and the two uh, SR Tamlin Knights. So... You know, you'll you'll get another opportunity to look at all the devastation that's coming and see. You know, uh, probably that'll be just after or just before New Summer. I'm not actually sure how that's going to shake out for us. Do we get a new SR ticket within the next year? Ro uh, Rogue Robins, uh, Robin says so. Yes, I believe I saw some people talking about that. So yeah, I think there's an SR ticket with story locks on it that's in the future somewhere. In the future. I didn't mean to get rid of all of that, son of a bitch. Uh... So, if if that is uh, completely correct, that's gonna leave us open. March of next year or something? Yeah, okay. Keep that in mind. Yeah, so there's no uh, no need to, to freak out about it. Good old story locks. But alright, that seems to be the end of our records and rolls and stuff. Ooh, the Castoria banner, cute. By the way, hey, if you guys uh, don't remember, there should be a uh, Castoria banner in like the next couple of days. Also, BT Dubs. It's just it's gonna be banners around the clock, y'all. But that means we need to move on to our next normal, perfectly normal, regular segment. Did you finish your master missions? Complete your master missions this week. I'm gonna need you to defeat 
10 Earth Attribute enemies and then 20 Earth Attribute enemies. Uh, defeat 15 enemies with the Dragon trait. Defeat 15 enemies with the Humanoid trait. Complete quests 5 times and complete quests 10 times. Oops. For the most part, you can do that just by doing the Lost Belt. The only thing you can't do completely is, in Act 1 anyway, there are not actually 15 Dragon enemies to fight. So you will probably need to take a dip in Orleans. I think La Charite is the lowest level, uh, lowest AP level quest you can do that is a shitload of wyverns. So yeah, catch up with your story, get all your stuff done, and then, you know, pop in for uh, La Charite really quick to polish off some dragons. This is in fact what I did, because I've already well cleared these way ahead of time. Is what those frags. I'm not sure if I'm going to get another 10 spin by the time I'm done with Act 1, but if not, I'm going to be ready for that, that follow-up banner. But alrighty, okay. Uh, that means it's time for Skelegram! The new. Uh, because once again, I would like to reiterate, there's quite a lot of that. Uh, not only, obviously, do we start with NA, the actual Chapter 6, you know, Part 2, Chapter 6, Lost Belt Number 6. Yes, no, they actually named it that way in the new title. Fey Roundtable Domain, Avalon the Fey, the moment a planet is born, Act 1, was actually released on the 6th. Act 1 is here, comes with the predicted Morgan, Tamlin, Gwyn, and Tamlin, Tristan banners. By the way, note, uh, I've already seen some people in chat talking about it and stuff. Uh, when we do, so you didn't get that 5 star, I have a note to actually talk about the localization choice of Tamlin. So, unless you guys are really chomping at the bit, we can leave that until it's actually at the point in my notes. But do, do note, if you are curious about that, I have a, you know, a thought. Uh, we also have a graphic for the main story clear campaign that actually uh, dropped, because that's being updated. So they've given you kind of like the, the walkthrough of what to expect there. The initial set of missions, you know, was released at the start of this month and was catch up to like... Uh, I think it was through hand -hand was the start. I'll check in a second. Let me pull up that graphic. But yeah, that was for 12 St. Quartz. The next block of missions will release on the 15th. We'll include another uh, 12 St. Quartz and a bunch of Blazes of Wisdom, stuff like that. And so on and so forth. And they'll be releasing basically every, you know, 15-ish days, every half-ish month for a while. So, uh, and they will say that there's going to be story complete missions added at a later date. Yeah, the first one is for uh, actually doing Heian-kyo nodes. Or up to Heian-kyo nodes. So, at some point, those missions will probably transition to uh, Lost Belt 6 part clears, I believe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, right now, they're still catching you up on making sure you're actually through the story that leads up to this one, so you can get in this story. And uh, as per the, uh, the stream notes... Uh, we did watch the stream. In fact, we pipped it in while we were uh, streaming our own stream. So if you want to hear our reactions to that live, go watch the Hollow Knight stream. No, this is not a blatant redirect to get you to watch the Hollow Knight stream. I'm perfectly honest. Smile. Devious smile? Devious smile, yes. What if there's a good... Is there a good head... Actually, yeah, there probably is. I'll check Oberon's expression sheet later to see if we can get the devious smile. Turn that into an emote. Devious smile. But, uh... While they had some some tech diff on playing the pre-recorded parts of the stream, uh, which I think ate into their timetable a little, because I don't actually know how easy it is for Anaplex to block out their conference room. But they did show, uh, you know, reco pre-recorded segments with some guests in Albert, and also had a couple of insert videos from Nissan, still practicing in English. Uh, we even had a translated note in English from uh, Nasu himself, which is very interesting. Actually dropping us a line, that's pretty cool. Basically, he did clarify something that I think a lot of people suspected from the way this Lost Belt is structured, but... He basically, Nasu basically explained that uh, Lost Belt 5 is broken into two parts basically because they wanted to do this kind of like two different tones, right? Mm -hmm. The first half is kind of a sweeping ocean adventure, and the second one is more of a like boss rush tower climb. 
they have distinct feels and uh, physically in the game assets, they have completely different maps, themes, etc. So it made sense to thematically split them up. Lost Belt 6 was more split up as basically just yeah, trying to relieve the pressure on, you know, Lysengle and Delightworks uh, to actually, like, get it all done in time. So we are probably on the ball for a much faster release rate of those stories. Uh, including the fact that Act 2 is expected to drop on the 20th of this month. This was a little... Uh, it's a little unclear. I don't know how much of this was them wanting to, like, not telegraph too much. Some people were kind of, like, wondering, does that mean that we're going to get all the way to what was the third drop in Lost Belt 6 then? Uh, I believe the answer to that is no, because there's uh, no way that Oberon would appear before the uh, GSSR. But, also, uh, just in general, I think uh, I think we can dramatically prove, because at this point, people have actually cleared Act 1, and I believe, I'm pretty sure it stops at Sector 10. If you have cleared the, the Lost Boat Act 1, to let me know. If it, if it does indeed finish after Section 10, which is the uh, Act 1 drop in JP's finish. So, it, it's proceeding apace, it's just your gaps between the releases are going to be much shorter. Uh, we'll see if we get the Nerofest uh, around the anniversary. We might just to fill the time, but we're, we're going to be slightly more compacted pace here, which is good. I don't know. I'm starting. To, I'm wondering if they'll push the Nerofest in September and move up the summer event. Ooh, I kind of hope they don't, just because that's so many good banners back to back. But I know yeah, they might. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's it's the the yeah uh, section nine of story. So the 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 tenth ish section counting like beginnings and stuff. Okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, that means that you're gonna get uh, Act Two will be uh, the next block of sections. Which to remind everybody who didn't watch the pregame, uh, one go back and watch the pregame just so you can prep. But also that means that in 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 uh, a little over a week now. Uh, that's going to be uh, up to section 24. Jeez. And that's not the end. So, uh, get ready for every single episode in July to be talking about another chunk of Lost Belt 6. Holy shit. I mean, Nasu not kidding. When he when he when he showed when when uh, when Mafia busted out that those six stacks of printer paper, they weren't fucking around. <laughs> Oh, I didn't actually look at Act 3, so I don't know what the final count is, but I think it's got to be, like, in the 30s. It's long. It's a lot of printer paper. It was a, it's a lot of tree. Nasa took a whole entire tree. He cut down a tree of emptiness, he used that to write Lost Belt 6. That's what he fucking did. Yeah, so... Obviously, you know, keep your eyes peeled on stuff. Uh, as as Lucky mentioned, you know, we don't actually know what order they're going to do stuff in. Usually they stick pretty close to the JP order, but they do move stuff around to fill dead weeks and, like, make some stuff click more. So, I, I genuinely do not know. I kind of hope the Nero Fest is sooner rather than later. One, because we could all probably use a little bit of a break from just the, the dense reading we're about to be doing. Uh, but also, it's a great way to farm mats. Uh, earlier, Lucky mentioned that he's gotten his uh, his new servants to a healthy 666. I got uh, Vargas to 666, but I did not want to do that right away with uh, Teal Tristan because she wants stakes. Ooh. Which I only have so many of. I am. it's the monthly item. I am. I think I have less than 40 stakes myself, so I am okay with not yeah, having it right now. Around one, I'm hovering at around one hundo, but, you know, it's a bronze mat, so she wants, like, 14 per or something like that. 12 per. Well, we are getting more per pure prisms with the story release. That's true. Uh, probably towards the end of the month, I'll feel a little more comfortable with that 666 push, but it's 444 for now. But Jamo Slamo. Yeah, I know. A lot of people want uh, Oberon for farming. Mm, it's going to be pretty interesting apps. to think about the the way our meta is going to go. Um, like it's it's pretty crazy. But uh, let's actually talk about some JP news, also. Woo! So yeah, um, Ordeal Call release campaign started the seventh, goes until the fourteenth. And so, this officially is Ordeal Call. The next thing is the Paper Moon. 
or the Sovereign's Memoir. There, there's a lot of names. But strictly speaking, the part that is actually released is called Ordeal Call. So the, this whole thing starts Ordeal Call. Anyway, clear Ordeal Call number zero to get three Storm Pods. After that, your Storm Pods are added to your daily logins. You get three per day. The cap is nine. If you get extras, they are lost. So FGO is very firmly getting you in the, hey, we would like you to log in every day and do a little bit of work every day. You know, obviously you can let that pass, you know, for a few days, but once you hit three days of not logging into FGO, you are technically wasting resources, so keep that shit in mind. But there are new extra master missions for class score stuff. Basically, if you have a lot of Final Ascension servants in a lot of different classes, you get a lot of the materials you need for your class score. The Stellar Dust Mat, which you spend on unlocking nodes, and uh, these little sigilly things that you use to unlock more areas of the ta talent tree. I'll be doing a little bit of a breakdown on this later to explain more, so keep your eyes out on that one. Uh, there's also limited time master missions for St. Quartz, EXPs, Teapots, and Stellar Dust as well. Talking about, you know, story clear, do audio call stuff, etc. The master level cap was raised from 160 to 170. And now let's actually talk about the class score. Uh, most of my information comes from a couple of different, you know, reports and videos and stuff. But actually, the one I found most uh, helpful was uh, Hanako Green, another FGO YouTuber, actually has a, like, two-minute video explaining everything, which I really appreciate. I know that doesn't generate a lot of ad rev that way, but, like, the man managed to actually explain everything in, like, two minutes, which I appreciate. But basically, it's a skill tree. Uh, specifically, the graphic reminds me a lot of either the uh, the sphere grid from Final Fantasy X or uh, the skill trees in every Yakuza game ever that has a skill tree. Oh, so also like a Path of Exile. Yeah, it's it's a big... I mean, obviously, it's star-themed, so it's big and round, and then you just fill out nodes that kind of go their own directions but also wrap around. Mm. The only... Or rather, I should phrase this as only the seven original core classes are available right now. Extra is divided into two different trees we will unlock later. So once again, kind of emphasizing extra classes less right now. Unlocking each individual node requires mats, QP, and stellar dust. So you are looking at a resource sink. I think somebody's got a graphic for it in the channel we have on JD. It can be pretty gnarly to unlock literally everything. But like a lot of stuff similar, I think, to reaching level 120, I don't actually think they intend you to do this, like, all at once, y'all. You know? You're, you're gonna be, like, farming that as part of daily quests, so this is a gradual grind, not a you hammer it out in one night and then you don't look at it again kind of a thing. Now, that said, most of the buffs you acquire are pretty normal. You can increase your damage, not overall effectiveness, but just damage with Buster Arts Quick and Extra Cards. Yes, there is an Extra Card buff. I believe if you max out all the nodes, it goes to 50% Extra Attack on Extra Cards. Pretty interesting. Is that addition to the append skill, or is that on top of it? Uh, I believe it's counted as Attack Up, so that would be cumulative with the Extra oh. the append skill. Interesting. But yeah, um... And uh, the attack up on Buster Arts Quick maxes out at, I think, 20%, just raw damage up on those cards. Uh, you can also increase critical damage with each card type by quite a bit. You can improve your star generation by like a for every member of this class, by the way. That's how this works. It's not per unit. It's just every servant you have of this class gets these buffs. Uh, you can improve star generation straight up by like 10%. Uh, you can also just give everybody a generic maximum of like 10% critical damage and NP damage, like just overall improvements to output, and a interesting and somewhat unique buff. Uh, you can buy skills in the class score to give uh, a servant of that class attack and defense up for one turn after you use a command spell on them. Oh, interesting. And this can go up to like, I think like 40% up for the one turn. So like, very interesting stuff we're going on here. Uh, it's not like a perfect band-aid, but I think in general just these kinds of like buffs you can work off of. If you're a longtime player, you're probably going to see some improvements of some of your more anemic units this way. Obviously, like I said, this buff still makes good units better, but slapping like 10% star gen NP damage and critical damage on quite a lot of the lower rarity members of classes would be pretty useful. So this, this seems like a... Uh, effective enhancement out there. Ah, yes, for the critical damage per card. Uh, it's uh, it's 20% for Buster, 40%, and for Arts, 60% for uh, 
crit uh, for quick. So it, it, it scales so that you're doing better crits in quick, etc. It's very funny. And yes, as I mentioned, but uh, Chad is reiterating, the the specific card type buffs are only attack up. They don't, like, increase the other stuff. So you don't get, like, extra NP gen you off of an arts card you buff. It's just the damage. Uh, honestly, not that nobody needs extra star generation or extra uh, NP generation at this point in the game. Uh, raw, like you can make up a lot for team comps. Uh, now, the new mats you want for this, the special seals and the stellar dust, are farmed from the bleached earth. Yes, the bleached earth is a thing you can now tap on your menu. It gives you a fucking globe. You can move it around to touch different free quests. Interesting. Uh, so you've got repeatable free quests, which take storm pods to use. They use one storm pod for free quests. You have one-time explore quests, which are big infusions of mats and stuff. Both of these are 90 plus plus nodes. So these are not for players who are still working their way through the story. Obviously, you have to have completed Lost World 7 to even access Ordeal Call Zero. But I'm just saying, like, this is actual, like, current tier content, all right? End game. Yes, this this is is the new end game content for you to be doing, and it seems like generally you want to be doing this cutting edge content if you are actually like all caught up on story, you are fully through everything, and you need something to do while they whip up new story stuff. Also, uh, this is another thing that has been reported. I have not been able to nail exactly uh, why for you are getting these buffs, but there is a shitload of upgrade materials like gold foes, grails, and grail shards that are coming via extra master missions. Uh, I I'm having a hard time tracking down exactly what unlocks these, but there is a shitload of them. I think the maximum that's been reported is like 18 grails um, between both actual grails and grail shards to convert. Uh, and I'm presuming this being tied to, you know, uh, permanent extra master mission upgrades. This is probably related to uh, advancing the main story, uh, leveling up your classes, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, uh, if you are caught up with content, you will get a big infusion of enhancement materials because, hey, 90 plus plus nodes, baby. FG wants you to be ready. Uh, and to follow up on that, also at the same time, we have the Paper Moon pre-release campaign. So, yes, uh, alternatively, like I said, titled Sovereign's Memoir and, you know, the Paper Moon unveiling, whatever. Uh, this goes from the 7th until the 18th of this month. Log in for some stuff, you know, usual daily login rewards. There are some limited time missions for main story progress to give you quartz and stuff. Quartz and stuff. Yep. Uh, for this time period, if you've cleared Ordeal Call Zero, you get double suck and half AP embers. So, you know, if you need to get that grind on. And in one of our fastest turnaround times ever, I don't think the fastest because, uh, like I said, there's still that, that Morgan banner at the end of Act 3 of Lost Belt 6 that's a very fast turnaround time for a limited SSR. But uh, we've got a Nito Alter Tlaloc banner and a Kukulkan Tlaloc banner. So that's like a like a like like a five month turnaround time, four months technically. It's like it's, it's fucking fast, okay? And uh, we also have knowledge, knowledge that the Snowledge. stream will be on the 14th. So yeah. this is where the actual story drop of Ordeal Call stuff will be hitting. Though, as I said, Ordeal Call Zero does have a uh, playable prologue you can go through where we kind of discuss this story stuff ongoing. I don't know much about the exact details of that. You know, I haven't been clicking on any YouTube videos or anything because I don't want to fuck my algorithms forever. But it, it do be out there. So there is, you know, story stuff ongoing. And yeah, in general, it seems like FGO's, uh, you know, hitting the time. Yes, oh, Kaosumi, Kana Ueda, and Akabane Kenji. Wow, Bargain needs a lot of sitting, need a lot of bells, Jesus. It's a lot of bells. Yeah, but those skills are worth it, baby. It's a lot, that's a lot of, that's a lot of bells. Bagako is a monster. Holy bells. <laughs> Not to hold off. But yeah, that's uh, that's our JP news. As uh, I, I believe the, 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 the thing the kids these days say is, we are so back, everybody. And then in two weeks after everything comes out and you've cleared, all, everybody's eaten off through all the story like it was nothing, uh, it'll be, it's over, bros. Hmm. 
least we had a little bit of pre-prep work with Bells. A little bit. Oh yeah, is it like I, I didn't explicitly mention the Bond Girls, but yeah, there's a lot of Bond Girls in the new Master Mission. Somebody in chat is saying you can get up to 36 of them, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. That's so much Saint Quartz, guys. All right, but we're... that reminds me, I think my uh, my um, Arash is pretty close to Bond 11, because yes, I still use him for three-term farming sometimes. I should uh, find an excuse to rotate him in to some part of the Lost Belt. But yes, Lucky, you were doing a transition. I was doing a transition. I am just slightly bamboozled that Bargas needs 180 of these bells to get to 10, 10, 10. I know some, a lot of other people were probably more prepared and, you know, prepped. But that's a lot of bells, guys. That's a lot of bells. If I ate more, I could. Yeah, but Anyway, I'll think about it later. So, with that, let us move on over to this week's Let's Talk FGO Mailbag, the segment where we read what you have to say and comment accordingly. Let me do a quick refresh real quick. Let me just check. And we are at a healthy number 19. And I'm glad to have every single one of them. So, without further ado, let's just dive right on into it. And this first one comes from Saved. 720 Saint Corns for Morgan. Only needed uh, 750. Uh, question. When you roll new servants, do you use them immediately for their new star content or do they wait? I'm just imagining one's newly summoned fairy knights being shocked. Along with Master and Da Vinci's at the learning the extensions of Tamlin, Gwen, and Tristan in the story. I'm pretty sure neither of them would be very shocked, TBH. Yeah, but I usually, if I'm, for story content, I usually, uh, I could kind of flip back and forth. Like, I'm going to be real, in this, um, in this Lost Belt, there's a lot more story-based fights rather than just, um, you know, pick-your-own kind of team kind of fights. And a lot of the pick-your-own team kind of fights usually have one or two NPCs in there anyway. And, uh, for this most part, I usually stick my, my highest level servants in there which is you know the Talamos plus comma and like I said I've been working I've been trying to put a little bit more oomph into uh into Morgan and um Tamlind uh Gwen here and I have just got cock blocked by bells a little nettled at this yeah, usually I stick uh, brand new units for any reason, uh, you know, somewhere in my line, either, you know, back row for three turn farming for EXPs or uh, QP or whatever, or I, you know, fire them up uh, for story content to get bond levels out as well, you know, because that's a, a pretty smooth line. But as Lucky brought up, generally the structure of this first act of the Lost Belt, you don't we really have as many opportunities to do that. Uh, in general, a lot of the classes don't line up to use them. Like, obviously, Morgan is a Berserker, so, like, if you have one, she works fine for this stuff. But, okay, like, I'll be um, fine for Morgan. Uh, I just need the goddamn QP! Yeah. Uh, but, uh... Actually, like, using uh, Tamlin Gawain and Tamlin Tristan, I, like, I've had them in my back row a couple of times, but it hasn't come up because usually, the like I said, the classes don't match, and when they do, I have needs to use other better units. Uh, hey, you know who's real handy in this Lost Belt sometimes? Super Orion. Because he, uh, he's a real big, six. strong damage guy who doesn't go anywhere. Okay, I'm going to need 96 fucking million. Okay, let's go for the wife. Oh boy. He doesn't he does need a lot of that QP. I need that QP. Okay. But yeah, there is uh, I think there's some some uh benefit to either, but you know. Let's start I, spinning I, I, them I apples. Know, perfect about frontlining them. If anything, I'm I'm more excited to do my own wombo combos with my own uh my own Muramasas and Da Vinci's. Yeah, if Lucky ever needs uh, needs a lot of Saint Courts, he can uh, do all his rank ups. That's like 120 SQ right there. I've worked through them slowly, very slowly. 
Listen, the man's got a lot of servants. Now, before we move on to our next question, I have to step away for a sec. I'll be right back. He will be right back. We will wait till he gets back. As I try to remember what the hell I was doing. Ah, yes. Grab Medusa again. Oh, if, they're, if they concern you so much, once I get done fi farming 96 million QP, we can go do some more. And everyone can go along this journey. Aren't you glad? Let's prioritize getting more. Let's prioritize getting more QP. Yeah, every uh, rank up mission gives you two Saint Quartz, and every 10 you do gives you, I believe, uh, 10 Saint Quartz, so. And like, I usually save them for something to do while, while on stream. <laughs> Alright, I'm back. He is back. But with him being back, let us move on to the second one. So, the second one comes from Arts Enthusiast, Touring the Land of Fairies. Mm -hmm. Hello, Lucky and Mega. I just wanted to say that I've greatly enjoyed the new best friend the story cast story and the rest of the story so far. Sure hope things don't suddenly take a turn for the worst. Good luck on your future pools and story fights. Well, thank you very much. I will say this lost boat does have a pretty good uh, a pretty good uh, track record of going up and down. I've only had to cry once, which is a record for Lucky. But let's keep moving on. So this next one comes from partying with fairies all day long and all night and all next day. You can't stop partying. The party is eternal. Goodbye forever. Question. Howdy, Lucky to make. I hope you're feeling the first part of LB6 as much as I have been. As for my question this week, it is, have you ever been interested in rolling for a servant and then seeing them in store late on only want to get them more? My own example of this is Oberon. When he came out and I saw his animations, I thought they were awesome. So, have wanted to roll him since, and now that we're seeing him in story of LB6 so far, I want to give him, get him even more. I, I feel like this is our default state. No, yeah, this is our default state. Like, 90% of the time, we're like, oh, hey, that servant looks cool. And then we play the story, and we're like, no, I must have them. Yeah, no, I'm... Give it to me. This has happened to Lucky more times than he wishes to count, so he cannot, you know, pull out a... a pull out one just off the top of the head. But yes, no, totally, I get this. I am, I will say, like, specifically on Oberon, I am more into him now than I am, than I was before, but he is still just in a really bad placement for me. It's like, I have to choose between, like, I have, I have, well, Tamlin Lancelot's not a, a knee, but definitely is a want. But then we also have a Queen Sky of Light, then there's Oberon, and then after that we have um, Avenger Comma coming up in summer. I'm just all like, oh no! Yeah, the, mi the middle block of the year is pretty packed. Oh, no. Yeah, we actually have Oh no. I gotta remember um, to do that. And uh, then it kind of tapers out a little bit, but this year is also the great big Liz rerun and um, Juxta Mole, I'm pretty sure. I think that's mm -hmm. this year. Yes. This time. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the year's going to round out with uh, Tunguska, with uh, the Ring of Nikits and uh, Taigobo, and then at New Year's is uh, Koyansuke of... Darkness. Darkness. 
So yeah, there's uh, there there's a round end to this, but it's it's a lot of stuff packed very rapidly together. Like I'm very interested in uh, Percival, and honestly, after actually like seeing her in story and seeing some animations, uh, I'm 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 a little more on Tamlin Lancelot, though it is funny that. Um, her banner doesn't come until the second part drops because she's very minimal in this story. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if that turns into more of a hard sell. But yeah, like I, I just I don't know if I'm gonna have the sync courts for that at this stage because I you know Morgan kept dodging me. I was technically spooked by by two SR berserkers because uh, both that Herc and the cat I got were the uh, silver card and sparks to gold. Oof! So I'm just like, oh berserker, berserker. Cat? Wait a minute, don't I even do MP5? I did. And then it was Herc? That at least was MP5, so all future Hercs are rare prisms, but Zam. A lot going on here, yeah. It's dense. There is a lot. A lot of these mailback questions, but speaking of, let's keep moving on. So this next one comes from a master taking consort Yang on a date through Britain, burning all the fairies we've seen along the way. Some people are savage, I'm starting to realize. But they say, hey, Lucky Omega, happy, hope you're having fun with the new story release. I, for one, can definitely feel not so spirit in the writing. He really went hard with this chapter so far. Given the nature of the Fae Present, my question is this. Do you think their actions make them evil or more along the lines of innocent monsters? Morality is such an interesting concept, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sending you to good vibes. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, may all your Avalon rules be blessed. Uh, P.S. Records from the Dawn. I can confirm your one of videos are excellent catalysts. I got Morgan, Tristan, and Gwen within 300 sand courts and have a little bit left over for Koyan. Rock on, dudes. Oh, well, doing better than us. I'm just I'm just that one clip of, of Red Skull from uh, Infinity War or whatever. I lead others to a treasure I cannot possess. <laughs> but also, hey, shout out to everybody for the appreciation of the, the Wanted. Uh, somebody was like, "Oh, it'll be the most watched, of, wanted, uh, watched, wanted of all time." No, I just, I, I simply do not think that the algorithm in the FGO space works that way. Uh, our best-selling wanted uh, previously was Scotty, which is at like five and a half thousand views. Uh, obviously, it's also got a couple of years under its belt, but I, I think just the space was different. SEO was different and how YouTube recommends stuff. Uh, FGO is bigger, but I think that means that there are more videos out there for it to recommend, so we don't always get put to the top. That means but yeah, no, it's still out of, out of uh, latest videos uh, for, for Wanted's and stuff, I definitely like feel a lot more interested in than usual, so thanks, everybody. I, and... I did have to crawl down some, uh, some crazy research holes for that one. Mm -hmm. um, as for your question... Um, I, my thoughts of this are in this good, evil, and such things as morality is an entirely a human concept. Fairies are not human. <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably the best way to look at it. The, the fairies have their own system of value judgment. They don't play by our rules of morality. S some of them can uh, play pretend well oh, enough. Oh my um, and actually, like, seem to have internal values that might match up with us. Uh, but also, even a lot of those guys who seem to have positive values also have some other weird values we don't like. We'll be discussing quite a lot of these characters uh, when we actually get to breaking down the story, because, I mean, there's, like, one human character in this narrative. It's you. <laughs> Everybody else is fairies, mostly. There's Beryl as well, but that's okay. We don't have to talk about him. He's not human. It's true. He is he is a weird sociopath man in a human skin suit. Pretty much. He's a cretin, and I shall send him crying home to mother. Anyway, uh, yeah, so... By their own accounts, I think there's some evil fucking fairies in this story. But necessarily holding them to the standards of good and evil is not the most productive. They are not required to play the So. With that, though, let us keep moving on. 
This next one comes from the one who wishes to spend Babo Joy to all in any form you wish, except my Saint Quartz. That's mine. Hiss. Well, fine, keep your Saint Quartz. Keep your secrets. So we all know this is gonna have a lot of notes, but how many screenshots have the both are the both of you on so far? I got 44 myself, and I might go back for more. I'm actually fairly light on screenshots. This is probably because I took so many goddamn notes. I don't have time for screenshots. Yeah, I would probably take more screenshots, but I talked about this when talking about my rules uh, on our Discord server. My uh, my phone case is slightly warped and bent now, so uh, actually like pressing the two buttons to take a screenshot is hard. I'll probably take a screen cap for like the when the big you know the Lost Belt finished or whatever graphic comes up, but it's. It's kind of a pain in the ass to, to set it up, so I don't take a lot these days. Also, I don't need to because I'm in our Discord, and oh, trust me, you guys have taken so many screenshots. <laughs> Let me get. Black I mean, I'll tell you this, Robin. Your uh, your abbreviation of uh, Babo is definitely. I'm already like, yes, that's the easiest way to abbreviate this. <laughs> Because it, it's it's funny. It seems like in in Japanese they don't even bother trying to abbreviate the the Baobanshi part of her name. Uh, I think like the the alias I saw on uh, like the FGO wiki was like uh, you know the Tree Chan or something like that. Like you know based off Tristan. So yeah, uh, uh, I'm 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 willing to accept Babo as. A, a firm abbreviation. Oh. Besides, she's just a little bobble. And with that, we shall move on. Uh, this next one comes from Morgan of Order, who successfully got the Tammies. Hey, Omega and Lucky. I don't have a question for you, but I will say that in some of the LB6 nodes, boss servants finally have skill captions, so I thought I'd let you know. Sending good thoughts your way, and enjoy the mouthful of LB6 until the next act. Yeah, there's a lot more subtitles in this section, actually. Yeah, I know. Noted. I've noted quite a few of them. So, with uh, no other words on... Oops. Hang on, we gotta make sure you get your attack up there. So with that, we will keep moving on, moving on. And this next one comes from Kahulian God, who says, given the introduction of LB6, if you weren't a master, but a regular surviving member of Chabay SS, what role would you believe, <laughs> what role do you believe you would have been? It could have been as complex as an engineer to as simple as a janitor. Lucky is easy, I would have been the cook. I'm pretty sure I would end up as like a research assistant or something in the in the Caldea groups. You need, you know, somebody to be a librarian. Figure shit out. Somebody does some kind of, of art our uh archive deep diving off screen. That are just Da Vinci knows everything. What doesn't Da Vinci know how to do? Well, even Da Vinci has a research assistant. But with that answer, let's keep moving. The next one comes from the Tyrant King who spent... came out successfully... I feel like there was something missing there. The Tyrant King who spent came out successfully with his MP7 Morgan summoned and then looks to Mellow Sign and points as he says, you're next. The people, the amount of, the amount of saving and or disposable cash people have scares me sometimes. They go ham. They go ham. Question, hey guys, with first audio they'll comment with that. Hey guys, with the first audio call coming next week, what are your thoughts on who on who the potential servants are gonna be since we have be headed since we might be headed to Atlas and digging into Saren's characters according to a theory? Question mark. Anyways, that's it for me. Sending good vibes your way. Wa 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 wa. And hope you all have a great weekend. I have heard from some people that it sounded like from the prologue we are actually like looking at either Atlas Academy again, or um, might be in the direction of Egypt, which could be interesting. Uh, that said, I, I don't know nothing about the banners. 
I'm, I, I I agree with the general theory that that one that one lady might be related to Lilith. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I don't fucking know. We'll find out in a week, I guess. That's Lucky's theory, by the way. I take credit for all of that. It's mine. All mine. If it actually turns out, if it actually turns out that it is Lilith or some some Lilith adjacent, I expect everyone to be going like, "Good job, Lucky. You're the best." And heap lots of praise on me, so I feel better about my life. Okay, okay. Let's move on. <laughs> this next one comes from the guy who accidentally skips the post combat story and regrets his life choices. Sad my room recollection noises. Oof. Yeah. They say, Hello, my dear content creators of Mega and Lucky. Just wanted to say that you saved my ass with the Lost Boat recast because I did not remember some important history bits, like some information about the cryptors and the alien god. Uh, P.S. I love everyone's drip in LB6. Um, Postscript 2. Uh, let the lion cook. <laughs> you cooked a little bit too much. Well, I'm glad that you're enjoying the recaps. I hope, I, I hope that's gonna be uh, f future big is gonna have a hell of a time. That's okay, we'll be fine. Thank you for for enjoying them. It did actually like take me a decent amount of work to stitch all those together. So we move on. This next one comes from Monster Girl Aficionado, who says, "Dear Lucky Omega." Uh, no questions this week, just sending good vibes. Wah, 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 wah. And wishing you well. Keep up the great work. Same to you, my dude. Same to you. Moving on. This next one comes from Morgan Enjoyer, who got impaled by an angry Dracula. Twice. Oof. Hey, Lucky Omega. Hope the no story release is exemplary, not so storytelling as always. No question this week, as I haven't been able to finish part one yet. Surprisingly, nine sections can take a really long time with like seven pips per section. Sending everyone good vibes. Wah, 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 wah. And wishing you well. Keep up the great work. Same to you. Let's see. Uh, we're only going up to section five today, but I do believe I am on section seven myself. I would check the notes, but that'd be scrolling like through 30 pages, so I don't want to do that. Uh, I am at the start of section nine, which I believe is technically the, uh, the end. Ooh. I will probably polish it off after this, depending on how long I believe this goes. Just so I can focus on doing other stuff this upcoming week. Catch up on some stuff. So, we keep going on. This next one comes from a full fond of cute, cute adorable, tall buff woman now. Melanini did good work. Bless. Hello, Lucky Omega. Sending good vibes. Wah, 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 wah. And hoping you've been enjoying the latest chapter. Simple question for the week. Who out of the current story to date has gone the farthest in your initial impression to what they are now? From love to hate or vice versa. Hope both of you have a great week and good luck saving these next few weeks because I don't see my wallet coming out in one piece. No. I don't either, if I'm going to be real. Oh, uh, we're talking about... Switches in opinion. Who's come the furthest? That's that's a good question. Oh, for me personally, it probably has to be Bunyan. Like, if people don't know, um, Lucky used to really, really not like Bunyan, mostly because they of the design choices that they made. Um, I was quite vocal about it for a while, too, but um, I adore Bunyan now. She is, you know, the bestest good girl. The tallest bestest good girl. I mean, not the tallest. I do have a KP, but, you know, the biggest, you know, big small girls. I love them. Usually, my opinions don't really start from, like, bad to good. Most of my opinions usually start from neutral. And usually improve from there to some degree. Yeah. I'm trying to think. 
Because even, even characters who appear negatively, I usually understand that they're doing a thing. Like, uh, like Camelot's original Tristan run. I knew already that, you know, that that was a deliberate trick to be, you know, make him really nasty. I, I st you could still probably argue that was a slide from negative to positive, but it was a very understanding slide of just like me being like, yeah, I, I, I recognize that regular Tristan probably isn't like this, and he isn't. He's great. But, you know, there's a few of those. I'm trying to think, like, how many people I actually had, like, really negative impressions of that slid the other way? Yeah, in general, I think that's a good one. A lot of people, uh,. Warmed up to Finn McCool. His his initial impression as the spookster and uh, making moves on Mash got him really blocked out by the crew. Also, generally, Dearmid is fairly well liked in the fandom. Uh, so knowing that they've you know had their own disturbances kind of get in there, but uh, actually getting in there, you know, uh, gave him some great character development, which was pretty cool. Actually, I don't know. I could say that. Um, uh, definitely from a neutral to a positive. Um, after Okeanos, I really do like how they've uh, kind of given Yurali her own separate character. Mm -hmm. Sveno is still... Sveno? That's neutral to neutral. Yeah, that's just... Uh, you know, again, my own vague fandom understanding of what Medusa's sisters were like, and then we actually run into them, and I'm just like... Yeah, no, that's, that's kind of what I expected. Gremlinology. They did some interesting stuff. I think Jason was, was okay in Okeanos, you know? I, I don't know, maybe I've, I just bought into the, the initial premise of, um, uh, of fate in general, so I understand that, like, most of these characters' characterization is very, very, uh, summon-focused. Um... Actually, I don't know. I mean, if you want to talk about alternate versions, I think I've kind of softened on Gilgamesh as a character uh, because Kaz Kazgil is so cool. Whereas I, I am al always one of those people who my impression of Gilgamesh, at least at his core, is heavily rooted in his original Fate Stay Night runs where he's always an antagonist and kind of a useless asshole. <laughs> yeah. Um... You know, uh, like, a, a decent number of people turned on Gilgamesh because of CCC. I don't really have a lot of experience with that one because it was only on the PSP in Japanese, and I did not want to go through the hoops of all that stuff. But, yeah, um, you know, uh, I, I never really took super umbrage with Jason in that character. I'm like, yeah, he's kind of a weasel little asshole, but he's my antagonist, so, you know, it, it's, it's fine. And he gets, you know, eaten by a demon pillar. Of pancakes. Yes. Not actually, the pancakes were later, but it's still funny. But yeah, definitely like I I no longer see you know Gil as just like oh look it's this motherfucker. It's not. It's like oh hey it's Gil. Which Gil is it? The funny one. The small one. The big witch's one. Ah, Gil. And we'll see how uh, how that shakes out with the you know the strange fake presentation as well. Yeah. We are less than a month from that too, so yeah. I think I've talked about this as much as, much as I want to see uh, strange fake. I am really hoping that Anaplex decides to license and release. Uh, Fujimara doesn't understand. Oh uh, yeah, no. I hope we get. Um, I do actually believe it has been announced about AX that Anaplex is having a project to discuss. Uh, a general type moon project so i'm hoping for like uh because uh, it's already been rated by the esrb but i'm hoping for official release notes on uh samurai mm -hmm. and uh i would love to see some some official drops for fujimaru doesn't understand those are so funny my guys <laughs> those are so good i i do not remember the person who who's been uh translating but thank you so much for your work you 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 give me life yeah, you are a legend. Uh, that said, honestly, um, not to take away from the effort of actually translating and subtitling those and releasing them, uh, especially knowing that Anaplex might get annoyed at that at any time, but um, some of, because they're so short and simple, some of them, honestly, if you just have a little bit of a conversational grasp of, grasp of Japanese, you can follow along on your own because, like I said, they are not very deep. They're not, no. 
Oh, no, no, yeah, I knew, I know. I think there was just two of them that I was able to follow without translations. I can't remember which ones, but... Yeah, no, that's what I'm expecting them to just, like, drop it all at once, because they're only, like, two to three minutes long. Yeah, and that's what they did with um, some other shorts we've gotten. Like, um, uh, I uh, technically, I think... Um, uh, great, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, Order Phantasm. The, oh. the FGO Carnival. Um, oh. Um, Grand Carnival? Yeah, I think it was Grand Carnival. Probably, because Grand is the name we just left. Like, that, that ended up just like... Uh, like, a, a couple of those were teased beforehand, and they just threw them all out there. Uh, similar with some of the other, you know, animated shorts we've gotten have just been, like, compiled. So I'm hopeful. Please. I mean, it's... it's I highly doubt we'll actually be able to watch them play the pilot of Strange Fake live on the internet, you know, anyway, so I'm, I'm hoping for some, some simultaneous internet releases. So, with that though, let us keep moving. This next one comes from Dave made a mistake. <gasps> they say, Well, I will pretty well on the banner, but in my haste, I burnt all my extra copies of Kester Ku. What have I done? Frowny face. Oof. Oof. That's what we, you know, gives the, as we say in the day, emotional damage. I hope that wasn't too loud. Now nah, I'm looking at the sound levels. That was pretty, uh, pretty reasonably paced. All right, cool. Compared to me clapping in the microphone when we started this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you sh you uh, startled some people with that. Oh, they need to wake the fuck up. We're here, and there's 50 of you watching. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. But yeah, no, that is pain. Luckily, I do believe my cask is already MP5. I don't remember how or why. It just, it just is. So, I have, don't have to worry about that, but, you know, every time I'm, like, deleting stuff, I'm always, like, you know, checking once, checking twice. Yeah, I'm so glad my first copy of everybody, uh, is auto-locked, so it's, it, these days, so it's a lot harder to do that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain they're gonna release it, uh, like I said, worldwide the same day. It's just, I, I'm pretty sure at the FGO panel or one of the Aniplex panels at uh, AX, they're literally going to show the audience the, the episode. And that will probably not be simul streamed because that's not usually how we do those things. But we'll see. We will see. Anyway. Anyway. We've still got like five of these left. We do! So, this next one comes from the Angel of Chaos, striking down moors in Fairy Britain. That's a visual. Good evening, everyone! How is your voyage to the Nine Stacks of Paper Worth of Text? That is the Lost Belt 6 faring you so far. I mean, I don't even know if we've gotten into Nine Stacks. We're probably, probably into three. Uh, this chapter helped me occupy my time when I had to stay indoors due to the dense smoke covering the East Coast during the week. Plus, I believe, uh, 200... Plus, with, I believe, 238 sync cards, I managed to snag just one Tamlin Tristan, which, while I would like to have all the Banner Servants, she was indeed my most sought after. Anyways, good luck to you guys, and I hope you didn't get too much emotional damage so far. I'm doing okay. I mean, yeah, this is, this is fairly average for an FGO release so far. Just a little bit. Also, yes, no, seriously, like, the... Uh, keep, keep an eye on your local air quality meter. Cover your, your face if you go outside in some areas. I think we're doing okay over here on the West Coast, but for once, yeah, it's not... It's, fine. For, for once, it's not our forest burning down. No. Uh, down here in the way down in the wet south, it's fine. It's just, you know, uh, it was my turn to go hit, hit up the mailbox today, and it was just a mere 95 degrees as I walked outside up the hill. Mere. A casual 95 like Fahrenheit. It, I would be cooking on the sidewalk if I had to go outside in that. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I was wearing flip-flops because, of course, I was. Uh, I, I could. I feel like I could feel my toesies getting a little edging towards sunburn when I was just standing out there. Oof. And, uh, mm, 
I don't need tingly toes. No sorry. But let's go. This one comes from Agent 418 who says, Hello, Lucky Omega. Have a good weekend. P.S. I relate to Omega, my first multi on the banner, and I got myself a Vlad. No orbs, just pain. Agent 418. Oh, I, sh I should specify, by the way, the, the Tomo I rolled was Rainbow Sparks, baby. We went, we went full nines. I'm just like, what? Why? Tomo, what are you doing? I spent a ticket on you. Whatever, I'll take the extra healing. But yeah, uh, big oof. Uh, also, a lot of Vlad spooks going around, it sounds like. I know he is, like, the the primary, um, what you call it, permanent berserker, but yeah. Hmm, interesting. Secret Vlad raid up? I mean, don't talk to me about no secret Vlad raid up. Yeah, you're what? NP5 question mark? Yeah, no, it's still fun. Again, I've talked about this. I have several NP5 permanent servants. Still no, um, still yeah, no, um, USOs. That's your curse. That's my you, curse. You never get the sixth. It's a curse and a blessing. It's very much a fairy curse, now that I think about it. But, let's see here. Where were we? Ah. So this next one comes from Queen Consort. Yeah, that works for me. Greetings to you, Omega. How are you today? Let me check the temperature real quick here. Yeah, it's only 59 and cloudy, so it's temperate. I had a cup of coffee. I have a zero sugar Fanta right here. I'm going to just crack that open. Don't you want to chat? I know I want to. <sighs> also, yes, no, I know it's been like God knows how many years, like 20 years since they ran those ads. The, the Fanta ads are burned in my brain. It's very catchy. Don't you want a Fanta? But this person goes on to say, It took 900 St. Courts to bring home Morgan in her knights. But it makes me ask, why does it feel almost as bad to just beat Pity as it does to hit it? Um, all the best and take it easy. Oh, I know this pain when you get like so close to hitting that Pity, but you barely just undercut it. And you're just like, why? I think it's one of those, it's one of those moments of you wasted... Like, hitting, hitting Pity is kind of like a consolation prize, I guess I want to say. Because you just, you hit and you're like, alright, well, I've hit my guarantee, I guess I don't have to do anything else. And, you know, you kind of, you kind of, you, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the word I want to say? It's, I'm trying to think of a term where you, you know, you just accept, you know, you just accept the defeat or, you know. The, the 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 uh the consolation prize but you accept it because you know it is what it is be reaching a point that's almost there but not quite just kind of feels like get kind of get like a little slap in the face you know yeah uh somebody in chat said resignation i think that's right like you're you're resigned to your fate and then you get that last little bit of burst and you're just like why yeah resignation is a good mean? word thank you man i am I Did really want to have a bad time. I, I don't re really watch other uh, FGO YouTubers, like I said. So, but Oof. I really want MP5 Gwen. I don't know if I want to fucking. How many? How many raid ups does Gwen uh, and Link Gwen have? I mean, she's also got a couple. I yeah, I'm noticing I'm a little quiet. I'm not sure what that is. Let me let me make sure I'm right up on there. My bars were a little low. I'm not sure. I'll try and get right up on my pop filter right now. Two more? Okay. Mm, when are they, though? Hang on. I'm going to look that up real quick here. Let me see here. Seems like a solid choice. Like, I can live without getting a Tristan right now, and I got an MP2 Morgan. I'm fucking fine there. I am set. But I would like I would like MP5 Tamlin Gwain. I like, I'm going to gonna sit on my, my three. But... Let's see here. Let's see. Replace yeah, like the conclusion yeah. campaign, summoning campaign, and twenty-five downloads campaign. When's the twenty-five download? Oh, is that the? Oh, that's the. 
Do, do, do. That's the SR ticket. That's next spring, I believe. It yes. says May 2022. That's the Castoria banner. Uh, let's see who else is in here. It's also Tristan and Percival, though. Yep. Honestly, if you miss if you miss this, this is a pretty good one. Because it has Castoria, Percival, Tamlin, um, Gwen, and uh, Tamlin, Tristan. So if you miss out on that, plus you get this, this SR ticket. Oh yeah, and uh, somebody brought up Morgan Fest uh, at the the pre-release to uh, Fairy Night Cup. That should just be uh, Morgan and the two Tamlins again, the two SRs ones. Yeah, let me see here. This is the Castoria banner next year. Uh, what was JP's twenty-five million downloads? Is what Discussy Lucky is discussing right now. Discussy, yes. Okay, and it says the conclusion. This one has alternate rate up, so you can go for just Tristan or just Gwen or both, which is pretty nice, but I don't know. This is gonna be later in August where I'm definitely gonna be feeling the hurt for feeling the hurt for uh Koi and Skaya and um Yeah, Avenger that's Kama. that's the, the second Morgan one that'll be either immediately after or immediately before summer. Probably before at this rate. So watch out everybody. I guess it, it, it's. I'm doing some big thoughts. I I guess I didn't. I, I think I meant to mention this earlier, but it's like I have been like I did put a dent in my finances or my uh, credit card bill. Like I I what I did owe like nine thousand. Now I'm down to seven thousand, and then I was able to make a little bit extra money by selling my scooter. I got rid of the damn thing. I was just like yeet. Sold it for like three hundred dollars, and that's the reason why I felt okay doing the um. Ooh, excuse me. The two um, 80 packs for that because technically that was um, that was um, I don't know what the term is call it, but it was an un unexpected uh, an unexpected um, I'm trying to think of the damn word here. It's an unexpected windfall, I guess. I guess to best explain it. So I'm pretty okay with probably doing one or two more right now. But, but I'm not sure. Because I would, like I said, I would like to get at least one Tristan and at least get, and if I can get three more Gwains. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll mull it over. Maybe I'll have a small roll, um, maybe a small rolling um, segment before we cut off for the night. I'll continue What's to debate it. it. And hey, you know, there's like somewhere between 56 and 58 of you. YouTube can't make up its mind. But, you know, hey, remember, you can support us on Patreon. Uh, your super chats, your memberships. Super chat of time. All that fun stuff. Uh, or, hey, you can just watch the thing and, and see the ads and stuff. Because, guys, there's a lot of you. Seriously, just getting this many people in to watch the thing and see the sequence. It's good. Also, my next paycheck is going to be pure disposable cash. Hmm. I don't know. Should I like set some sort of goal? Like, if if people donate, if I get a total of like eight, we get a total of eighty dollars. I will just roll into I get MP5. Tamlin Gwen, is that what people like? Is that what people like to see? I don't know. I don't actually watch a lot of these streams nowadays. I'm so I'm so held off. I think that's the structure, but yeah. I mean, we've done that before. I, I did recaps and stuff for like, uh, you know, the Lost Belts. I think uh, I ended up rolling on on stream for uh, uh, Canis and uh, Romulus Clearness because we uh, juiced up enough to hit like an 80 packs worth of profit. Oh. We'll see. Well, technically it's not at my expense. Like I said, I'm actually in a better financial situation than I was. And as the, like I said, basically, Lucky's financial situation is pretty good. I take pay, take care of basically all my bills at the front half of the the front half of the month, and the, basically the second half of the month is that's all disposable cash. I can just do whatever I want with that. That's about a thousand dollars. So I thank you for for gifting a membership. Yep. So it would not necessarily be at my expense. So 
Yeah, because I'll still have July's disposable income, and I'll still have August's disposable income. I still have June's disposable income at that. Um, So I won't be hurting for cash, and as long as I don't go over 10k on my credit card bill, um, which is just mostly because I don't want to see a bill saying 10k on my fucking bank statement, I'm not going to feel weird. Not to mention that I'll have August and September to save for... For Jacques, who I just need MP1 of, because I just want that for I want that because you know, chan channeling big shub shib, and then after that it's all saving for Clan Sky of Dark, which will give me another couple months. So I do have plan. I do have plans. I do. I will. I do have enough money for a little bit things for like emergencies and stuff set aside just in case. But we'll see. Yeah, I'm still working out on exact budgeting of uh, a new PC for streaming and stuff. Thank you for your super chat, there, Robin. Um, so I, I will probably not be be, be even with uh, big donations. I probably won't be goaded into any uh, big roles there. Uh, but we'll see with my budget because I think actually I'm seeing some good pricing on some points. Just double check on some stuff. Might have a little bit better, but again, so it might be a little closer. But I had some uh, some unfortunate bills involving the tax situation earlier in the year that I had to get sorted out. But uh, after. Uh, basically, after Final Fantasy 16 comes out, I'm I'm like, uh, which I have already pre-ordered my, uh, you know, not collectors but deluxe edition of. I'm pretty off the book for purchases for the rest of the month. So, other than you know, uh, updating groceries every couple of weeks just because perishables. It's very hot here, so even with a AC, you have to you know keep your perishables in rotation. Thank you, Carlos. Well, yeah, no, okay, yeah. If we actually hit eighty dollars in donations, I will roll until I get five. I will roll until I get um, MP5 Tamling Gwen. I will commit to that. If we already got two people, so yes, uh, and obviously uh, YouTube has added a, a lovely new. Uh, we can actually check our fan funding feature permanently, so we can see everything everybody's done, including your special membership ch shout out chats, being a member, gifting memberships, super chats, etc. So thanks for your support, everybody. Thank you very much. But we are still. We were still doing things. So, let us move on. This next one comes from someone who just might be a bit tired of being pitied. Wait, actually, hang on one second here. Does it actually. We do actually have that. Pretty big one. <laughs> yeah. Default. Default. That's one of the default soundboard options. But they say, going to be a bit of a rant, but yeah, we had that bet going on the day of the Morgan Bank. I collected all my Saint Cords from a gift box and frags and had a total of 866 Saint Cords after doing so. Well, this and the Daylight setup seemed to be, you know, pretty likely I'll get all three banner units before using all my Saint Cords, but no, that was not the case. No Morgan in all of that. No SSR spooks even in all of that. This left me having spent what had been about the Super Chanted by now to get two more 11 spins, thus hit Pity to get one SSR. Uh, upside, uh, at least Lucky did live up to his name when he said to come in the banner. I hope you get some luck your way, Omega, and not the bad type that makes one of makes one have to use up everything they saved up for six months. PL's got to send the good vibes, wah 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 wah, to out vibe the bad vibes others speak of. You know who you are. You be vibing. Hey! Also, thank you for the pink super chat, Region Raptor, and Dustin Carroll with the ten gifted memberships. People raking it in, and we have already hit enough. Jesus. Okay. I mean, that's how it works. You give them, you give them a little bit of a treat. You give them a little bit of the the ring a ding. People buy in. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, when should we do the roll? When sh when should we do the rolling? Uh, maybe after mailbag because we're getting pretty close yeah okay we also do it after uh so you didn't get that five star or maybe you would prefer to roll then talk about the five the four stars oh uh, what do you guys think do we should we roll after mailbag or after um servant deets so my computer 
computer was speaking on my new computer front. We got a little bit of lag there, so I'm going to stop the audio real quick and reset it. I don't think we lost anything, but sometimes it's very, very feisty. We got, like, one mailbag. Well, we're 2-2. Two, two. I don't know what's the... Two, two. I don't feel like leaving it as the end cap. I want to get the rolling in. That will also, that will be like two hours from now. We got four deets, three mailbag, five deets, three mailbag. Hold on, wait, actually, hold on. Can I just run a, am I allowed to run a poll, YouTube? Is that a thing we do? Engage my audience. Start a poll! Oh! Well, how does that work? Hold on, I have to actually fire it up. Fire it up. Okay, so I just click Ask Our Community, and uh, if you're watching the stream live, you should see a poll pop up. And, you know, just now it says the vote total, and so it'll just, uh, you know, fire up. It'll let us know who's winning, and uh, when we're de-engaging, we're going. Also, let me resume recordo. Okay, all right, okay. It looked like uh, after Mailbag was going strong, but now after Servant Deets has taken a slight edge. Oh. Let's see. We'll... Oh, we've got we'll 25 this, points. Uh, we Jesus. This, yeah, we can let this brew until we, uh, we we round out. We got, like, at least one more Mailbag to actually read. Yes, we do. Also, I, I appreciate your, your opinion on my luck. I personally feel like after, like I said, just under 400 state courts, two SSRs is pretty lucky, even if they weren't right up. So, like I said, I'm just flummoxed. Bamboozled! That was my first Oz, by the way. My first Ozymandias, so... Yeah. Watch, I'll throw like a week and take it and get two normal Sundays. That'd be powerful, to say the least. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Let us move on to the last one. It comes from that guy overconfident with his pre-anniversary gotcha savings. They say, yo, lucky and omega. Hope your quartz, quartz is well as we start gotcha hell. Read more. So, I hit pity for Morgan. Then I continued. And technically the statistics say my results when I walked away is well above average, but man, it sucks. Looking back, my rolls have been statistically lucky, but I've been monkey's pawed. Getting early MP2s when I only wanted MP1s, getting spook SSRs in the same multi as the raid up. MP2 Okatan before one Izu, and when RNG ba finally balances the scales, I get dry spells with no gold servants for hundreds of rolls. As for my question, if you could direct fate, how would you maliciously comply around gotcha rules and pity system? I.e., technically, there is no petty pity for SRs. So... How would I maliciously comply around gotcha rules and pity system? Huh? I mean, I don't necessarily know about what rules they're talking about, but I, technically, we've we've storyboarded this. Before they actually added pity, uh, the, the fix we've discussed, and which I still think could be feasible in this economy, is uh, you should just be able to buy a certain number of USOs every month in the rare prism shop so that you can actually convert SRs and SSRs you don't need into um, into USOs to eventually secure a servant. Because obviously that would still require you to roll in order to get your extra rare prisms of enough. Because I'm not saying it would be cheap or anything. They'd be like, you know five or ten prisms for one USO. I think five would probably work, because that balances out with the SR rates. Um, and, you know, you can only buy so many a month, but if you save up for, you know, a couple of months and you wait for the right banner, you can snipe your servant without needing to get in there, but you obviously still do have to stay on top of things. So, that is our, uh, our, our suggestion. Yeah, two USOs every month for, like, five RP, two SSR NPs a year. Seems fine. Um, you know, and depending on how you wanted to do it, you could lock it so you can only exchange like once for USOs, or maybe you could encourage people to only exchange to exchange multiple copies that way and be like, ah, so this is a good way to get your extra NP levels, but you know, you gotta get that roll if you wanna get those, those first levels, that's more efficient or something. Because you gotta be, like I said, you gotta be aiming to roll anyway. <laughs> Lucky, any thoughts as you murder more doors for QP? No, not really. Oh, I am halfway there. Something, something. What? 
came in. Living on a prayer. Listen, when he super chatted, Regent Raptor already said that one, so. Oh. And I've only used three fruits so far, so hopefully. I'm hope I'm trying not to go below 150 golden fruits right now. The lotto is not too far away. He is true. I plan on using maybe 50 apples on that. Alright, but that was our last mailbag, so I'm gonna click uh, end poll. And, and looks it like it was uh, after yep, there's the results. After mailbag with 45%, after servant deets with 54%. 31 All right. total votes, so here we go. Yeah, it's just 50. Yeah, it's just 50. I am not as big on um, grinding as some people are. Uh, Fate Grand Automata really helps me out with that. It lets me brain dead some things, but like I said, I don't necessarily have the comps to do like the biggest big ones. Yeah. So I usually I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bad at, at, at FGO grind. Yes. I'm good at other grinds. Bad FGO grind. All right, it has been about an hour and a half to the end of our mailbag. We're moving into Caldea Free Talk, which will be starting with new servant needs. Yay. But I feel like this is another perfect time to take a brief breaker. I'm going to pause the audio, and I'm going to step away myself. And, uh, <laughs> Die, a first. Jesus. Die a little bit there. Yeah, okay, all right. I'm over that part. Uh, I'm still going to step away for a sec. Probably go refill my bottle of water, which is mostly gone as well. Uh, but everybody, you know, take an opportunity to get up and stretch your legs. It's been an hour and a half. Stretch them. Stretch him. I'll be right back. I will still be here. Thank you very much for helping us reach our our goal here. Be appreciated. Yeah, no, I don't know why, but I just do want to just have a stockpile of gold apples for some reason. So, no, I don't want to go under a hundred. Which is why I don't want to go under 150 pre uh, this next um, Nero Fest. Like, I really do envy those people who can just sit down and endlessly grind. <laughs> endlessly grind uh, lottos. Oh, shoot. Oh, I forget. Doesn't this an is are we gonna have half a PQP and uh, embers for this anniversary? Mmm. That's also usually a really good time to use apples. Cause I think this will probably be the time where I actually get my uh, Tamamo cat to 120, and probably work on. Getting Koi and Sky at the level 100 as well. And well, it actually, depend. No, no, no. Koi and Sky will be out. Summer, summer will will definitely be after. Any. Me? Uh, how many um uh, 120s? I just have one. And that's Tamamo. I have Tamamo at 120, Tamacat at 104, Tama Lancer at 100, Kama at 100. Those are all my Grail servants. I have a, actually, I have a lot of plans to Grail others. Like I'm gonna Grail my BB, Grail my Melts, Grail my Passion Lip. There's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of Grailing going on, but like I said, I'm horrible at the grind, so I don't have the QP. I'm back. Uh, speaking of grail plans, I, I have a few more grails. I think probably need to be tossed out after this. I also have only stopped at uh, 100, so I don't know about 120 for stuff. But maybe, especially with content getting harder, I might you know find some room for it. But well, yeah, no. You shaking around. I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, no. Lucky's big waifu waifus is Tam Tamamo Sakura and Tamamo and Sakura. So basically, any Tamamo and any Sakura, I will grail to minimum 100. After that, though, my taste gets a little bit more varied. Like, you know, I love I love uh, Tamlin Gwen here, but she's probably not going to get grailed. Same with, like, Raiko or, like, Kentoki or, um, or, uh, or, um, Musashi, as much as I love them. I'm uh, thinking about taking my, uh, 
my uh, berserker, my summer Musashi she's 100 actually, because she's one of my main farmers anyway. Oh yeah, no, she's good. She, like I said, she spawned 10. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I it's a lot of mileage out of that one. Mm -hmm. She so is. I can see throwing around a few. I'm, I'm, I personally also debating does Super Orion need to go to 100? Because yeah, he's pretty good. He, he could use the extra stats. He's a great boy. Like honestly, that's like the thing. Like once, like once we get. Grail casting, I'll probably reconsider that, especially with, yes. you know, additional... Sadly, people are insisting that is a uh, story related to the end of uh, Tunguska, so that probably won't be until the end of this year, which is going to be sad. Uh, but still eventually coming. Uh, and obviously, like we just said, the uh, the start of Ordeal Call uh, starts with some uh, extra master missions that give you a shitload of Grail stuff. So... That will be ho hopefully, you know, loosening up some of the restrictions and some of these resources to get in there. Because like, there's there's quite a lot of servants I use a lot of times, and some of them I do think could actually use the jump to uh, to 100. And I've I've taken a couple of four stars to like 90 and so on and even beyond. My uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I stopped at 90 for both Canis and Pison. I don't think I took either of them to 100 right now. Because my red is 100. Like, <laughs> like he's all about the Sakuras, it's you, you give me a Rin, there's a, there's a 100. At some point I should probably take Space Ish to 120 when I get the EXP. Maybe maybe off the free XPs we're getting out of the main story clear campaign. I think they've got like 84 star EXPs for the next like four drops. Could be a project to work on. But alright, okay. I'm fully back. Let me close the mailbag tab. That means it's time for Servant yes. Deets. So, you didn't get that 5-star. Tamlin Edition. So before we do either profile, this is actually my notes, we should probably discuss Tamlin. Mm -hmm. The name Tamlin is a character uh, and also the name of a very popular ballad from the Scottish border regions about a knight who serves the Fairy Queen. He falls in love with a mortal girl who has to rescue him uh, from his monstrous transformation, specifically. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, All Hell is Eve here. He, you know is riding on a white horse. She pulls him off, and then he goes through a lot of forms. So, uh, one thing to note here is that Tamlin's name has about 9 million different spellings because it is sufficiently Celtic. Uh, there's Tamalane, as all one word, Tamberlane, Tamlin with a Y. It's, it's all over the place. So, there's a lot of variations there. I know some people were like, oh, this makes me afraid we're never going to get Tamlin as an FGO character. We, we might not because there's, you know, 9 million folklore characters to go through anyway, but they could very easily work with this in localization and just use one of the different spellings. Because his name could be rendered a lot of different ways. But the ballad itself is super archetypal. Um, you may have heard of the, the phrase child ballads. That's not like ballads for children. It's the last name of the uh, author who collected them. Uh... I think there's like over like 120 of them, or it might even be more like 300. Anyway, there's a shitload of volumes of Child's Ballads. Uh, Tamlin is officially ballad number 35, still in the double digits. Okay? So, uh, and I think it's 39 in uh, another folklore index. So, it's a very, if you are in those folklore circles, a very well-known archetypal story to get out there. Sorry, I was checking the chat real quick. I mm. tapped over. Um, but yes, uh, it's it's really out there. And so, as a title, I think it still works to explain what is exactly going on with the fairy knights. Well, I do. You, yeah. I do kind of feel like. Well, because Tamlin is a fairy knight, and like, there, it's not the first time that someone's name has been used as a title, or like other such thing, or other such things for other such things. I understand some people getting like weirded out for it, but it to me it makes a weird kind of sense, you know? Yeah, like I said, I, I think it actually like follows the story of what is going on with these fairy knights. It's a little bit of a flowery localization. That said, this is I, I presumably this is a tight moon directed choice, so uh this is probably like Nasu's idea himself. We all know he can be a little over the top with naming conventions. Um, but it does, it does, I think, still work out and make sense. The only thing that bothers me a little bit is sometimes the grammar, like it says, says, it sounds weird to me to say 
the Tam Lins while talking about this group of servants, you know? Um, and there's a couple of other spots in the script where it reads a little awkward, but it's still pretty direct. Um, I, like I said, if you if you think it is a little bit too much of a flowery translation or too much of a localization, I can understand that. In in Japanese, uh, even Albert himself, uh, but everybody still said on the stream, Yosekishi, which can be fairly directly translated as Fairy Knight. Uh, so obviously, like I said, this was intended by Type Moon. So basically the way I would put this is uh, unlike... Altria, this is not so much wrong. And yes, I will stick to my guns. Nasu is wrong about choosing to spell it that way. By his own logic of how what her name is supposed to be based off of, those should not be L's, but, you know, we, he's the one who runs the franchise, so he gets to write it that way. Um, but it is, like, actually a, a choice to actually work out. So, uh, and like I said, I, I believe it is meant to be meaningful because keep in mind... Um, this is explained in story, so slight future spoilers, but it's not. It's mostly a background detail. But uh, Morgan has basically completely concealed those characters' original true names in story. Um, and so, uh, under normal, and like completely bestowed these titles and new names on them. Honestly, which really plays into the Tamlin narrative. I was about to say, like, when you think about it, Tamlin, Tamlin who is a fairy knight, who gets transformed several times. And get someone who gets transformed several times. You know, you can consider, like, this is a Tamlin of Gwaine. You know, the transformation into Gwaine. A Tamlin of Lancelot and stuff. I think it has very thematic... Very thematic, um... Synergy with it. Also, it could just be something as simple as, you know, character limits. Um, I just, like, like I said, I only use Google Translate for this, so it could be wrong. But I typed, uh, Yosei Kishi... And here, which does translate into Fairy Knight. This is four characters. Three of them, it's all kanji. It's all kanji all the way down, so it looks complex, but it's only technically four spaces. Um, so, another another thing they could have been doing is instead of having to write out, you know, Fairy Knight completely, they were probably looking for something maybe a little bit more compact and short, so it didn't necessarily weird out the, uh, weird out the, uh, the bar, the character limits and whatnot. Yeah. And also, um, this was, I, I believe we all thought this might be coming, those people who were aware of it ahead of time, was because the phrase was used on some physical merch at, I think it was last year's FGO Fez. Um, which again, you know, blatant English translations are kind of like a, a, a thing that happens in Japan sometime with merchandise. And like you said, using just the phrase Tam Lin as just, you know, uh, two one-syllable words with a space that probably works a lot better for certain elements of graphic design and saying things obviously you still would write it with the four characters for yosakishi so like you can understand what the fuck is going on but it's a it's an interesting choice um and like i said if you are like upset like if you don't like it in some way you don't have to worry about it this is another true name unlock just do your ascensions and clear story and like i was actually quite surprised like literally after your first ascension, uh, which, by the way, when trait-wise, the two Tamlins we have right now stop being uh, round-table characters, which actually matters for uh, Morgan's and me. Um, uh, uh, they basically, like, start talking about their names directly. So, it, yeah, it's... it's. I, I debated whether or not it was a spoiler. It's not a spoiler. <laughs> also, yeah, somebody in our, our chat just brought this up. Um, Angel Blanco just said, technically there are also fairy knights in this lost belt. Like there, there are the queen's knights who are knights who are fairies. So, it's one of those things that in in English it doesn't necessarily read the same way. And like I said, if, if you don't if you don't prefer it, that's okay. Nobody's saying you you have to call them Tamlins, right? Like I I literally just said that I don't use Altria in my own notes because I I took two semesters of Latin in high school. Okay, it's not it's not how that works. Those L's shouldn't be there. But I'm just too I used to Altria. Yeah. Well, there were there were um, before basically Type Moon's direct intervention with the localization. There were previous versions that used it. Like I think it's is it Artoria or Arthuria in Excel or uh, Excella? I believe so. It's one of those two variants. I'm so, pretty like, sure. Yeah. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it's Artoria. Yeah. So like, uh, and there there have been previous mentions that have used those before. So yeah, it's it's an interesting case where um, like phenome wise. 
when when you hear them the like the actors speak you can clearly hear them pronounce you know Arutoria Pendrag. like the syllables are that way the the way japanese works the l and r sound are the same so you can write it both ways but it's pronounced in english it sounds like artoria and as i've said before at least the way the own their own writing pitches it in shinjuku it's supposed to be some feminine form of the uh latin name artorius saying artoria is about as close as you can come to giving that name a feminine version there was no actual feminine variation of uh, artorius it was a clan name not a given name in latin but still it's a historical name and usually the way latin suffixes work it would be artoria so that's just logical but yeah they just added some some l's and an extra ia and it's like whatever dude um i'm also kind of curious um albert kind of implied that he might talk about this localization choice at a future panel because he straight up said like I know you guys might have some questions about the stuff you've just seen. I hope to get an opportunity to talk about it with you, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like maybe he understood that that might be a hard sell for some people. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a thing. And like I said, there, there will be completely normal story, uh, true name unlocks and leveling, and you'll get in there. I'm going to be real. <laughs> that localization choice isn't the one that bugs me. I mentioned this several times in my notes, but I'm still myth about people getting upset that um, it's called the moment a planet was born. The more I read, the more I read in the story, I'm just like, no, Star, Star was right. Fuck you all. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, it's and it's interchangeable too. Like it's just it's literally interchangeable, which is probably why it got translated one way or another. But mm -hmm. it's 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 weird. Um, and that one I don't because it was it was uh, pitched as Planet First, so that one I don't I don't know if that was like an uproar thing and like social media got back and was like, hey, we could also translate that. This is is as uh, as as you know. Or no, it was Star First, right? And yeah. it was like we could have translated translated this as as planet. That makes more sense. But also, Star make like Star works really well, I think, for our themes. And um, some people say, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." Sorry. Uh, I just now saw Robin's comment about I hear wife is also an acceptable pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me. Killing me, Smalls. Um, but yeah, it's. I think way too many people took it as planet because, like, oh, Avalon, the sea of the planet, the breath of the planet, you know, the planet's inner sea. We get that one translated a couple of different times, but like, it's the the word is Hoshi. Like, if you were gonna if you were gonna translate it, you would say star. And uh, I have no problem in Final Fantasy XIV when they refer to Heidelin as a star, even though it is a rocky terrestrial body, because again, the words are the same Japanese. It works. Anyway, um, there's a few thematical things up there. But yeah, so that's that's our talk on localization. Um, it, I don't think there's any point in fighting it about it. Like like I said, even Albert, I think, understands this might be a weird ask for some people. Um, I've heard some people complain online that it's too obscure. That, I would say, like, uh, clearly not. You just need to read more. Because, <laughs> again, the, uh, like I said, um, I'll actually, I'll, I'll look up. How many how many child ballads are there? Three hundred and five traditional ballads from England and Scotland. Tamlin is number thirty-five out of three hundred and five. Okay, and it's clearly not alphabetical. So like, yeah, no, this one's well known in the right circles. <laughs> that's not a problem for that's not obscurity. That's a problem with your education. And listen, listen, that's okay. You can admit you don't you don't know. There's a lot of characters we find obscure in this game. Sometimes I gotta go down some deep, dark rabbit holes to write wanteds and shit. But yeah, all right, okay. With that all in mind, I'm sure you guys want to see the rolling as well. So let's talk about our new SRs. And like I said, I debated whether or not their true names are spoilers, but I think they literally say them after like one ascension, so the game doesn't really treat them that way. So we're gonna we're gonna be using a, a mixture of the two. So playing the role of Gawain is Bargus, who is an SR Saber. She has massive HP for this rarity. Her non-grailed max HP is higher than Ibuki Doji's. So, a lot of HP. Consistently quite low attack. Not at the bottom of the line, but pretty low in there. Like, the, the number of sabers who have uh, less attack than her is pretty small. 
But do not let this fool you, chat. The dog of war brings the damage. She naturally, of course, as playing the role of going as a gorilla deck. Quick arts, buster, buster, buster. High NP game to compensate. With good hit counts on those NP generating cards. I think she's like 0.74 or something. And she's got like a five hit quick card and like a three hit arts card. So so good, good NP game. So as you might expect also, for the role she's playing. Her NP is a Buster AoE. It improves her Buster output for one turn based on overcharge first. After the hit, it lowers her skill cooldowns by one and gives her 3k extra max HP for five turns. That's right. Her HP becomes embiggened for five whole turns. Uh, and honestly, we've discussed this before in strats going all the way back to Merlin, but max HP gain is technically better than healing because it replaces the HP you've already lost and means you might have more HP to lose. So, very solid here. Uh, also, the skill cooldown reduction is very well needed for her kit. So, her first skill is naturally Numeral of the Saint. It gives her a flat 18% attack up for three turns all the time and a 18 to 28% buster up on Sunlight Field. A pretty normal, but, you know, there are ways to set the battlefield to Sunlight through various means. Uh, her second skill gives her 20 to 30% buster up for three turns. Keeping in mind, this will stack with her Buster Up on her uh, NP proc. It gives her also a special Survival of the Fittest buff for three turns. On normal attacks, this means she heals 1k HP and strips an enemy of their latest buff. So whatever their most recent buff is, gone. Yeeted. Devoured. Reduced to atoms. Also, if she removes a buff from an enemy, she gives them 10% uh, defense down for three turns. This is a 500% chance debuff, so almost always they will get stuck with this defense down. And the final skill, the dreaded Foul Weather, gives the entire team three hits, three turns, damage cut for 500 to 1k, and it puts a buff on Vargas herself for 10 to 15% NP gain for, per turn for the whole team. The buff is on her, but everybody gets the NP gain. It's pretty cracked. Uh, she also has Magic Resistance C and Madness Enhancement A+. So, uh, yeah, she's a brick house. Uh, many damage modifiers, even more defense and recovery tools. She's great in the long haul, and any any gorilla teams you're running, she'll be a great addition. Uh, we're talking, you know, like I said, huge damage cuts, team-wide NP gain, very unique ability to recover HP and strip buffs on regular attacks. Very potent. Uh, also, fun fact, I want to point this out because uh, these characters do have trait change. Oops. Uh, Bargast is canonically chaotic good and stays Bryn's beloved trait even in higher ascensions. So perhaps she is a good doggo in there somewhere. Just very angry and very hungry. Keep your Snickers handy. And now, uh, playing the part poorly of Tristan is Lady Spinel herself, Bavanshi. Also sometimes written as Bavanshi, if you need to. Uh, like I said, there's another bajillion ways to spell this and several other ways to pronounce this. You could say Bavan Sith, Bavan Shi, Bavan Si, etc. Again, you could you could take the BH sound as a V, Bavan Shi. She's an SR archer. She is also weighted towards kind of high HP, lower attack, but it's not as pronounced as her fellow Tamlin Knight. So there's a lot of room in there. She's quick, quick, arts, arts, buster. So a pretty normal deck for an archer. Slightly above average hits and NP gain on the higher end there. So pretty solid. Her NP is a single target quick. It gives herself sure hit for the turn. It also curses the enemy for 1k damage for five turns and does evil curse. Disastrous curse is the translation. Uh, for several turns as well, based on the overcharge. It starts at 200% curse damage, so you're actually doing, like... Actually, I should double check. Does that mean it's 2k or 3k curse damage? I think it's 3k, because it's 200% it's additional curse damage. So, yeah. Very solid. But, then there's her skills. So her first skill gives her 30-40% quick up for three turns, gives herself one turn of invul, and gives the whole team one hit of evade. There is no deadline on this evade, by the way. But it does deal 500 damage to the whole team. This won't kill you, but still. It it's to remind you how much of a little shit she is. The skill is literally called Grimalkin, so... 
Uh, why does Baoban Shi have the name of a different fairy? I don't know. She's not a cat girl. By the way, also, fun fact, this is mentioned in her profile, but I should also say, uh, Baoban Shi is a, uh, it's a, it's a Scottish term, it just means girl fairy, or fairy girl. It's kind of funny that way. It's very generic. But yeah, so, uh, first skill does some stuff. Second skill gives all enemies one turn of skill and NP seal, and is also a 20 to 30% battery. Her final skill absorbs 2k to 3k HP from an enemy. This also will not kill that enemy, but still. Uh, and it is explicitly marked as absorb, so she gains as much HP as she takes, if you're curious how that works. It has a 80 to 100% chance to drain their NP gauge, and is another 20 to 30% battery. This is why uh, when Lost of Six originally came out in JP, I made a meme of uh, that, you know, the two hot dog one with uh, Mordred to, to Babanshi of like, gee, why does mom let you have two batteries? 60% total battery, by the way, if you level these skills all the way. Uh, her passives are uh, Magic Resistance EX, Writing A, and Territory Creation A. So, very solid baseline. Those quicks are going to hit. Those arts are going to hit. You're not going to have any problems. She has a yeah, decent amount of hits on her single finish. target. And you've got a, a broad spread out there. Yeah, if you work out all your skills, you can eat everything. Because you got to max it all out. Uh, also, by the way, fun fact. Uh, Bob. Bab. Bab. Bab's here is, uh, uh, she's chaotic evil all the time. All chaotic evil all the time. Uh, her Thanks profile even says, while many fae bring boons and banes in equal measure, uh, Baobachi is just a walking disaster. There is no benefit to knowing her. She is just a curse upon you. Anyway, she should spice up your single target life if you need some arching done. Just mind your feet, okay? <laughs> I think it's like even in her profile that says that some reports that have she says she has, uh, like, the ability to probably things that giant clunky heels in her later ascensions. Yes, uh, as Robin put it, uh, Babo is here to cause problems on purpose. <laughs> Whereas, like I said, I, 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 you know, I think Vargas is going for more of the, uh, the noble demon type archetype. She means business. <laughs> Yeah, she is. She is our walking disaster. We'll we'll see about that. Hey, you know, two two thirty percent batteries, not bad. Um, I, I like the stun tools honestly. Like you get you get a lot of stall with her, uh, which is very interesting for her NP type actually being quick. But uh, she fits in pretty good with your with your stalling teams. NP seal and a charge down, very solid. Also, just the HP drain is very funny. Even if it can't kill enemies, it's it's just hilarious. But yeah, that's our Serpent Deeds. All right, well, let me finish this off, finish leveling Morgan, and we'll do some rolling. Goal will be for NP5 Big Doggo. And uh, you'll be hitting that point uh, at, at around two hours. So yeah, this show is going to be... We haven't even got to our Lost Belt notes, y'all. This is the preamble. I mean, we had a pretty full mailbag because you guys are all jazzed about the the release as well. Okay. But uh, that does mean that hey, af after the rolling is done, if if you are have done nothing of Lost Belt Six and you want no spoilers, that's a good time to leave. Ooh. Let me just double check here real quick. All right, everything looks good. Yeah. Let me make sure I'm scooched up on the preview so I can at least see some things. Hang on yeah. one second. So let me finish off Morgan here. Leveling. But yes, as usual, I uh, I find uh, servant traits to be very interesting. Like I said, the the fact that I can look at Bargas' profile and see that she said it says that she's Bryn's beloved and just be like, hmm, I think that's all I need to know. And specifically, at least as far as I can tell, that trait doesn't go away when she raises her ascension. Uh, their first ascensions when they're in the, the armor is they have, that's the only time they have the round table servant trait, but uh, I at least have not seen that it, that goes away at higher levels, so it sticks. It's a very interesting, interesting comment. All right, well, give me a second here. We're going to swap over so you guys don't see all my personal information. That's against the rules. We might.
Mm, they are very lovely. Ah, uh, you know what, let's... Let's... You know, let's, let's, let's double up here. Alrighty, well that's 300, well that's 350, that's a good, that's a good number. Alrighty. So we're back to it. So let's get this started. We will not go full skip game, but we'll go we'll go we'll go half skip game. Moderate levels of skip. Moderate levels of skip. Yeah, I didn't go, uh, for my own rolls. I did not go super skip, but I was clicking through. All right, let's see here. Let's go. All right, we're starting off. It's a CE. Prisma Cosmos. Ooh, not a good CE anyway. You're, you're all about to see my fucking CE look and how fucking stupid it is. Okay, yes, Chad is not kidding. They're talking about, um, uh, Vargas does say when you leave her first ascension that that armor was tight. Oh, hey, it's Origin Bullet, personally recommended by the voice actor of one, Barrel Good. Mm-hmm. Imaginary around. Jesus, you're not fucking kidding. That's three five-star CEs in one roll. Nope. Nothing in between. That's it? That was the whole thing? Yeah, no, trust me. Like, people don't understand. My CE look is fucking ridiculous. You are the man who... How many super scopes are you on? Three, and I've sold K-scopes. Yeah, I'm balling. I, I have been playing the game since launch, and I just said that I just got my fifth and sixth copies of uh, K-scope, uh, like, this week. Ooh, that's a new one. Mm-hmm. Already got it. Yeah, but still good to see. Those CEs are pretty tight in the new ones. Yeah, I, I like the art direction a lot, and some of the effects are good. Uh... This is also why I'm really glad that they do, in fact, rotate out four-star CEs eventually, because, damn. Yep. Not now, Taiga. Come on, let's go. Come on. Oh, wait, hang on. Activate. Covering fire. Room guard. Was there a little bit of load lag there? I don't know. Nope, that was nothing. This is normally how my rolls feel. Yeah. What's that? Four four-star CEs? Be elegant. How about be fortunate? That's what I need right now. God, this one's still in the gacha? How dare you, old man Tobioli. Yeah, gentle affection. I see these CEs a lot. I'm kind of sick of them. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah, a decent number of these are on the slate eventually get taken out, but uh, not just yet. It's the really old ones that go first. Nobody likes to see 500 year obsession. Come on. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, wait, hang on. I got it. Chad, put your hands up. Give Lucky your energy. I have noticed that depending on the 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 hour and the date, the uh, the app does just load sometimes. A little bit of load lag. Oh, that was pretty min. Not absolute min, but pretty close. Yeah. Got a couple of my friend. Put your hands up. Uh, I should be able to MLB that now. I have to remember to do that. See? Tree. Another two or come on. Give me something. Oh. It is something. Oh. Oh. Well, she was going to show up eventually. Oh, another one. Who this? Really? 
Really? Anyway, I'm excited to see it because I'm in the backdrop here. Yeah, I thought so. That's how this is how it happened to me. The double bobo. Yeah, double bobo go. Oh, it's still going. It's true, she came to cause trouble on purpose. <laughs> she lied as he's... What's with this sassy lost child? Concern. I just, I, I just, she says, I too champion justice after all. I think she actually uses the phrase Segi no Mikata. Uh, but I just look at my notes, chaotic evil. Oh, just a Siki, not Daisuke, Robin. We're up to over 60 people watching this happen, by the way. Great! Ugh. Well, that's good, but it's, that's not what I'm here for. Oh, wait, hang on, I forgot to... You said you'd be doing. Oh, Servanto. No, nah, it was a uh, it was pre-skip activation. Yeah, yeah. Gotta get going. We gotta get trucking. Another fucking room guard. Another gosh darn covering fire. Yeah, no. Welcome to my life. This is this is why I uh. This is why I too have come to just fucking hate most four star CEs. Oh my god. After after I get done with this, I'm activating full skip gang. This is gonna take too long. Oh, I haven't seen a divine banquet in a while. I'm gonna be real. Oh, that's nice. I think this one's getting phased out soon. Oh, we end on a fucking men roll. Okay. Okay. Let's see how you guys are. Full stop. Alright, well let's go buy and let's go buy another 160 here. Hang on. Mm -hmm. I'm good for it, don't worry. All right, so here we go again. We're going full skip gang now, though. Full skip gang. Activate oh, speed. No. Three CEs. Bullshit. Get out of here. Man, gentle affection. That was it. You sons of bitches. Medusa? Okay! Hi, Anna! Why the hermits? It's not even the right class.
K scope. Woo. Covering fire. We're going at such a speed rate that the the uh what do you call it? The Jesus. Preview can't cape up. We're in human. My Tristan now outlevels my fucking Gwen. Are you kidding me? Baba. If I hit MP5 Tristan, I'm done. I am fucking done. That's the rule. It's whoever gets to MP5 first. Yes, we'll be upon you. Kirky? I'm still a little because you're going so fast. Fion? Behind the, pre the preview and just like. Yep, oh, good. okay, we're tied now. Alright, what is your NP total on uh, Bargast? We're both. We're MP3 now. Okay. They're tied. Hang on. いらっしゃいましたくん。カタログはこっちだよ。退屈がてらおすすめアイテムを紹介していい。聖書石の購入ありがとう。Yes, like I was talking about it, my CE luck is ridiculous. Four star CEs you don't need. Cool, thanks. Activate speed! Kind of like a doubt. Come on, just two more. Nope. Man, that's a little fast, so fast that I didn't even see. That was a Morgan and a Gwen and a Trist. What? Hold on. Yep, Morgan. It's Lucky's third Morgan, by the way. That was one of everything. It's fucking <laughs> tied. What the fuck? Oh. What am I looking at here? <laughs> Chat, what the fuck? What is happening? <laughs> Damn it. Look at this sucker. And there's a five star and a four star CE in here. And a Casku. <laughs> this is stupid. What the fuck? Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. There, got it. Okay. Wait, no. Is that four or five? Fuck. No, that was that was five. Okay. She said she was three. They tied, and you got two in this match. Okay. Cool. Go. We're done. Going home. Going home. Fucking five pack, tacos pack equipped. Pack it up after this shit. Let's go. Close Let's this go shit that. out. Yeah. Oh God. Oh. Okay. Check them. Check them, chat. Oh God. How much was that? Was that? Okay. So I did the two. Two, no, six? I can't remember. Mission complete. But yeah, no. So I got six, eight. Mission completo. That's eight. That was it. Was that six packs? Okay. So six packs plus the two I spent earlier. So that's eight packs total. Hang on, let me do some math here. Yeah, six refills. So that's. 88 times 8. Yeah, that's $700 gone. And just now, I spent about a little over 500. So I exceeded my I exceeded my 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 little nest egg there a little bit, but it's not the worst. Once I um 
Once I get paid next week, I should be okay. Remember, show your friends this clip. Good already, okay. Uh, that means it's time for everybody to buckle the fuck up. It's Lost Belt Thoughts. Uh, as I said before, these are... Uh, Actually, first of all, before I say anything, dear future Robin or whoever, uh, make sure to put the timecode note right here. This is the part where future Omega has a problem. Oh? This right here. This moment, this is where future Omega is going to have to go back and do the cut. Uh, there's no way I can make it. Well, I can make a short out of this last couple of rolls, but... I mean, it won't be perfect with the time codes because the uh, the non-streamed audio I'm recording is slightly different. But yeah, it's it's this is where my problem starts. Uh, we'll because we'll, shorts have to be under sixty seconds. We'll see if I can punch a clip out. Allegedly, YouTube has tools for that, but but yeah, uh, and yes, I should I should clarify if people aren't sure. Yes, I will. Once all of Lost Belt Six is out and said and done, I will make a recap for it. I don't know exactly when and where. Oh yeah, there it is. There's the fiber. But yes, yeah, so this this is your moment to leave if you have done none of the thing. If you've done none of that. God, this graph is so weird. Sorry, I'm just looking at our our. Uh... The YouTube graph. Because, uh... It's funny, the stream was posted, you know, uh... Technically yesterday, so... It, YouTube's got the long curve of, like, how long it has been technically been out there, but with zero viewers because it wasn't live, and there's just a tiny curve at the end. That is weird, actually. It's so compacted. Also, later, I'll have to check where these peaks and valleys were. Obviously, the rolling really crested. People got interested in that. Look at all these coups! Hey, listen, that motherfucker was on right up. Alrighty. Well, time to get all your mana prisms back. Pretty much. Yeah, I believe everyone else is So let's go to the shop. Let us sell. I also see there's a Suzuka in there who's new. Yeah. I already have MP5 Suzuka. Oh, actually. Let me double check that. The rare prism lines. Yeah, no, no. If if, if if she if she wasn't, she'd have been up top with um with uh, everyone else. So all these guys can But while Lucky's starting on that real quick, I will uh, once again uh, step away. I'm sorry I'm stepping away so much, but I'm drinking a lot of water. Uh, it's... 8 o'clock at night, it's still over 80 degrees outside, so I'm drinking a lot of water. But I'll be back while Lucky cleans up his stuff, and then we can get into this, because uh, technically, most of these notes are his. Technically. I started to, uh, to keep loose notes uh, originally, kind of either planning on going back and expanding on a couple of things, or knowing that Lucky would be keeping some level of his own notes, but I think, if I remember rightly, it, it I think you got ahead of where I was, and then you, like, looked back and realized that my notes were a lot looser, and were like, oh, I'm gonna need to keep more detailed notes. Yeah. I had to backtrack from there. So, uh, a bulk of what you're gonna hear is from uh, Lucky's perspective, but like I said, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. let him clean up for a second, I'll be right back. Right. Well, I'll be right back as well. I'm gonna go empty my bladder real quick. Because we're gonna be here for a bit, so I think everyone should get up and take a walk around.
Honestly, the more I think about it, I think at 700 bucks for all that is probably, probably fair. Yeah, MP3, what, uh, yeah, MP3 Morgan, you were about to say. MP3 Morgan, I also got a Scheherazade in there, MP5 Gwen, MP4 Tristan. And there's quite a few other just random ass SRs in there as well. Statistically, if you, uh, you said that you got to uh, probably going to limit break. Did you actually limit break the new Sonic CE? The four star one? Or did you check yet? I haven't checked yet, but that's what I'm about to do. I got to start cleaning up my CEs. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's fairly solid. But okay, Lost Belt 6, Act 1. Uh, I'd say, you know, it's intentional for it to be in three acts, but uh, one, I think a lot of Shakespeare's plays are actually in uh, five-act structure, uh, and two, uh, this is not uh, intentional. Oops, somebody actually clipped it. Thank you. Just the multi. Yeah, I'll see if I can export that one later. It starts at the prologue. I don't actually have a lot of prologue notes. Oh, sorry, I had to. I'm scrolling back to the actually where I begin. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So, we start with the prologue. We start with a dream and a prophecy of our favorite trap villain, Merlin. Things are obtuse as always with these things, but as with said thing, it will make sense after all is said is done. Um, Merlin talks about a lot of doom and gloom and things are going to be weir weirdly happening, but before he can really talk anymore, he mentions a scary lady is coming and he has to run. I generally wonder who that can be. Who do you think Merlin considers a scary lady? Oh, it's gotta be Morgan. Mm, probably. It's just like, nah, man, I'm not, I'm not fucking with that. But we move on from that, and we choose alarm sirens. As usual, Foe is with us, but he doesn't seem to be his usual self, and is very quiet and non-energetic. We don't even get a single Foe, he just leaves. Foe doesn't want any part of you with this shit either. <laughs> so with that, though, we head to the command room, and Sion does a roll call of all the staff and their positions, which I do believe lists all the people we were able to save from OG Caldea. I think yeah, a couple think of these... are uh, our first introduction of these names like some of them were were out before obviously like Munir is named for instance but this is the first time I think that Nasu actually sat down and was like this is literally everybody yep so we have Munir as the pilot Tomlin as Quadic as operators Octavia Da Vinci's assistant Chen the video commandant uh, Cayenne, the munitions design engineer, Elrom, the record keeper, and Marcus, the Spiritron engineer. The names are about as uh, ludicrous as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. I, I do like how, uh, how Tom Lin, uh, Tom Lin feels about getting those reports back from Da Vinci later. <laughs> and I do like how our official title is the field op team. It's pretty nice. So, Sion breaks the news, and it's no biggie, it's just a crisis that's going to eradicate the Earth in 24 hours. Whoops. Uh, Gorodolf is there as well, and I don't know if calling the bearer of bad news in Egyptian knee sock wear is an appropriate thing to say, but I'm here for it. She does wear knee socks. Mm-hmm. So, we find out that it's been about three weeks since the Heian Kyo uh, incident. And most of our effort has been towards the South American Lost Belt. Our intended intent was to 
somewhat ignore the Bridge of Sloth spell because it was um, collapsing on itself, but not anymore. It's going to explode and take the entire Earth with it. Whoops. Big whoops indeed. So we got to loan up the Storm Border, which is pretty much a full-on uh, fob at this point for an operating base with its, you know, resources, capabilities, and all that stuff. And we got to head on over there. Uh, fortunately, even though we may have uh, 24 hours out in the real world, apparently the entire Lost Belt is in a fucking hyperbolic time chamber. And time uh, works differently in there. They don't ever actually mention the exact ratio, but they say it will literally not be a concern once we get inside. It's tiny whiny, wibbly wobbly. Of course, the British Lost Belt would be. Hypertonic Rhyme Chamber. <laughs> so she mentions that all the staff are going to have to roll out, but um, realizes what she said and says she will not be going with us because she feels like she doesn't belong or other reasons. I'm pretty sure it's other reasons, but we don't know yet. Yeah, I put this in, in, in my notes here. So, plans in danger as usual, and uh, uh, as as we would expect, uh, Sion refuses to leave the house. <laughs> She's the ultimate shut-in. Big Kiki energy. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to clean up things here. Oh yeah, you got so much stuff. So I'm only going to keep one copy of them. Well, yeah, she's studying Lost Belt 7, but mm. remember, it's, it's you know, 20, 24 hours outside is, you know, plenty of time inside, so it wouldn't have actually mattered. It is just kind of interesting how she calls a, a literal all-hands meeting and excludes herself from it. It's interesting. I kind of feel like uh, hopefully we're actually, when we get to Ordeal Call, we're actually going to expand more on uh, on Sion's character. Yeah, she's been kind of a weird non-entity, if I'm going to be real. Like, ar arguably, I think the captain has had more of an arc than she has, which is kind of weird. Oh, yeah, no, like, his participation in India and, um, and Imaginary, uh, Imaginary Sea did a lot for his character. But see, and obviously, he's a ma major player in 5. Mm-hmm. But yeah, see, not, not as much. Still very important. <laughs> As as we'll be we'll be discussing the black barrel off and on later. That is obviously her own design, uh, the black barrel copy that uh, Mesh has, and I believe she is credited as one of the the redesigners of of or the Ortonus system. So you know she she's helpful, but also she she is kind of a weird outsider. And not in the same way that the actual wandering sea guys are weird outsiders. Those those guys are literally the ultimate shut-ins, as in they shut themselves deeper in their weird mage base and haven't come out. World's ending? Doesn't matter. The world's always ending. Not our problem. Technically, I think that was Atlas's issue, was just because they're the ones about precognition and prophecy. They were just like... Oh, what's that, Sion? You say the world's gonna end this year? Yeah, put it in the pile with all the other world-ending prophecies. <laughs> no, we not for that one. And then, I, and then, presumably, as the Earth was being bleached, they were like, "Oh no, my hubris!" <laughs> um, but before we actually leave, we take a minute to talk about Rongo, why we want it, where it came from, and the inner sea. Uh, which turns out to be the mage name for the mythical paradises of legend. Yeah, this was a good to actually clarify exactly what is meant because you know the the inner sea of the planet has been bandied around in FGO and some other fate works before, but this is actually I think one of the first times that somebody actually straight up sits down and is like, yes. Yeah, so what we call that is basically the clock tower's term for all earthly paradises. You know, the Garden of Eden, the Isle of Avalon, etc. And it's here that big boy stuff happens. And specifically, uh, Rongo Miniad uh, and Excalibur come from there. But also, Sion wants the Rongo Bongo to defeat the alien god, which is interesting. Yeah. I find this a little weird, though, because I, well, I know not everyone, but we do have, you know, people like Grey and Lance Artoria who are running around with Rongo Minion themselves. 
Like, does that not count? Not to mention whatever other servants we have with, you know, just doomsday level devices just on their belts. I assume it's got to do with, like, the difference between our, our temporary summoning, which actually gets brought up as a thing we do again in this story later. Mm -hmm. Um, it, It's a difference between, like, you know, sending our, our Caldean servants along for a ride-along to actually, like, having the proper mystic with us at all times. And um, it, uh, with Grey especially, I there could be a concern because that's, you know, the... the sealed form of, of uh, Rungo Miniad inside ad, so it, there. I don't know, is there a question of like, would that actually mean we get to undo all the seals, you know? Whereas, obviously the signs of Rungo Miniad shown by the the Lost Belt 6 King, which we can clarify later, is Morgan. Um, it's not known at this point, but it's, that's a weird one to bandy around, because I'm sure chat knows that one already, actually. but that one, she was actually able to fire from her Lost Belt through the Wall of Light, through the Storm Border of, uh, you know, the Barrier of Storms around Lost Belt 5, and actually hit the top of Olympus, which, by the way, is in a hole in the ocean. Just to remind everybody. So, like, that's a very different read than, like, summoning one of our servants to do something to, like, actually whatever, however the hell she pulled that one off, mm. so... You know, there's definitely some some questions here. Some questions. Uh, well, technically the lances are the terminals. The act, it is true the actual Rongo Miniad is described as a a nail that pins the texture of Earth in place. So it's like a tower of light or something. Or something. Actually, I should probably use the lower level ones now that I think about it. Leveling. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to... I got a lot of DCEs, and I realize I should be probably trying to put them into... Um, CE bombs rather than just selling them all. I got enough mana prisms. I do not have enough leveled CEs. It's true. I actually had that thought after I, after I burned all my CEs. I was like, oh wait, I'm at like level 96 on my... Actually, it might be higher. It might be like 97 or 98. My my Prisma Cosmos is my highest leveled CE. Mm. Uh, it's That one's very close to hitting 100 for like those three extra Saint Courts or whatever. And I'm like, oh, shit. I should have dumped all my stuff in there. Doofus. Mm. Well, I'll be rolling again eventually. CE bombs. Very spiced. So, with that, um, Gordolf gets up to his usual antics and demands that we dial about... Dial us back to dial us back to about thirty percent of our usual antics, which means we can still do some of our antics. But he still wants us to be on our game face. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like this that really puts into mind how Gordoff is actually a reasonable authority figure, just you know, a bit pompous and foolish about things sometimes. Like if we're gonna talk about characters, like I know someone mentioned, like you know, like maybe servants or something. But I think no, the character who's probably actually gone the farthest for me is Goldolf. Gordolf. He who literally shows up as, um, you know, like, this villain-type character but becomes, you know, Uncle Go Uncle Golf to you. It's like... Yeah. And and even though it's, like, all talk, it, there have been several conversations where he's... He has basically said that once this is over, he's going to be willing to go to bat uh, for us with the Clock Tower, which is a whole different thing. Yeah. That we already know from story is kind of complicated, as evidenced by our... our our previous experience, which was, uh, here's a promotion now, get the fuck out of my face, we're gonna sell your organization. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, Gordolf, very interesting person. I also want to bring up, that's, that's what I was thinking as before we got off in the CE discussion, um, it is important to note that this is, I believe, where our, because uh, we're talking about, uh, Gordolf talking about, you know, being 30%, this is where our mission statements are actually clarified. Oh yeah. And going in, we are told by our quote-unquote bosses that we uh, want to figure out what's going on in this Lost Belt and meet with its king so we can figure out, you know, a, a negotiate a truce and perhaps get access to the Rongo Miniad. We do not come into this thinking that we're going to explicitly beat up this Lost Belt because their tree is already dead. Weird. Yeah, that's basically the prologue. 
Yep, and that's the prologue title drop. So we start with section one, beginning. We begin with a mural and a legend slash prophecy. Surprise, surprise, we had gotten knocked up and had a dream. We still be taking naps. A lot of naps. I'm not gonna let this one go. We take a lot of naps. <laughs> Th there's less naps in this Lost Belt than in five, but that's because we don't take a black barrel nap every time we kill a boss, but still, a lot of naps. So, something has gone awry immediately. The storm border is non-functional and everyone has jet lag. Um, apparently it's more serious than that for the servants. Apparently there is no concept of proper human history here. That means that PH8 servants have no foundation to exist here. Um, because the Vinci and Mash are non-standard though, they are the exception. We gotta have exceptions to everything. Yeah, we run into a few over the course of the story, but uh, they pitch this as being similar to Lost Belt 3 where uh, because that Lost Belt basically had its own way of preserving heroes, there was no foundation for heroic spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is different, but similar. Okay, so I will put that one in there. Why does it do that? But, um... <clears throat> so, in the course of speaking about this, Holmes brings about technological milestones that are needed to progress civilization and how such cases cause people to specialize in certain things and become famous for it, creating legends and myths. And don't think I didn't see you sneak in detectives at the end there, Holmes. Be glad I can't call you out on it. I, I put this in my notes as uh, Holmes explains the civilization tech tree, basically. He explains how there is a certain amount of required order of technological process that, as you said, naturally leads to specialization. And so for anything resembling human civilization to exist, we should have hit certain foundational, you know, technological milestones to reach. But uh, there's not here. Uh, there's actually a great analogy where... Gordolf is like, but we should be able to summon Robin Hood, right? Because he's like weird and fake. And and we're just like, mm, no. None of that. Where did those other two I had go? That's selected and then you can slightly weird it out here, but you know what? I'm not gonna worry about it too much. I'm just gonna keep shoving these guys in here. But after that, um, Da Vinci basically explains what happened. We entered, upon entering the Lost Belt, we lost all power and made an emergency landing in the Southwest Ocean. It seems that the closer to the island we get, the less the Storm Border functions. This is the same for the Shadow Border. This means that a lot- This one is uh, hmm? still not fully explained also. I don't know, it might have to do I with- Go ahead. I assume it has to do with technology? Or maybe the yes, flotsam? Um, yeah, I don't I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, I was going to say this may also be related later to uh, a concept that's brought up of the fairy domain. Mm -hmm. It may be possible that within the Wall of Light, that is actually Morgan's fairy domain, and she's just like, no. No. Uh, so yeah, I could see that, because we're definitely not the first <laughs> thing to uh, to drift in, but it is interesting that specifically our, our, our storm border and shadow border are... Pos uh, depressed they are low powered and it is probably related to the technological advancement but it is still interesting because obviously you know the the storm border is apocryphal for lack of a better word it is based off technology that doesn't exist in proper human history right mm -hmm. it's based off of the nautilus submarine at its core the, you know the aranex phantasm and then tech we scavenged from lost belt 5 so it, it's it should probably still work in a weird alternate future, but doesn't for reasons. So we got to refer to more archaic means of communication, a.k.a. the hottest new social media function, Carrier Pigeons. I like how excited DaVinci is about pigeons, by the way. 
Why not? He's just like, hey, yo, Holmes, can you use Carrier Pigeon? And he's just like, uh, I mean, I guess. Why was that one not locked? That one needs to stay locked. So, uh, with the current supplies available of, in the, the Storm Border, they can last 30 days. 50 if they stretch it. Uh, this is where uh, Goldorf gives our full command, our mission brief of what to do, and says to, that we need to return within 40, no, 45 days. Another point in Gordal's re reasonable, reasonable authority figure in this, he is willing to tighten his belt if need be, but also doesn't want things to come down to the very last minute, or the wire. I'm assuming he said 45 because he wanted enough leeway to escape without pushing too hard, but give us the most amount of time available. Yeah, this is another moment that, that uh, stuck for me with Gordal directly. He's just like, like he hears that our standard is, you know, th standard is 30, 50 if we stretch, and his immediate thought is 40. No, no, 45. 45. Like, he's just... He, he's... He doesn't... Uh, I've... Like, if this was still Lost Belt 1, that Gordolf would have been like, you definitely must be back in 30 days. But, you know, even do... This is our sixth go at this. He's like... Mm -hmm, told him 30%. You need 45 days. Yep. Just imagine him counting on his fingers. So, we're about to head out, and people notice that um, Small Da Vinci is putting things into a rucksack, and it comes to me that she's going to go with us. We need someone to deliver the carrier pigeons, because I'm going to be real, I'm pretty sure neither I or Mash, I mean, the Master or Mash, needs, knows how to use carrier pigeons. Correct. So, uh, Da Vinci Chan has joined the party. Doo -doo -doo. So, we head out in the Shadow Border to make, uh, to make Landfall, which is basically all it can do. And it's we have arrived to the Isle of Britain. It's warm and funky and mash. Why did you just glow there for a second? Weird, huh? That won't come back at all. The lack of foe has been noticed. Yep. Suddenly, Tristan. Tristan joins the party. Doo -doo -doo. Apparently, he was summoned due to the fact that he has ties to the land of Cornwall. So even if maybe they don't have direct history, be no ties to land is something that is still strong enough. Yes, uh, they they appear to have explicitly uh, landed on the uh, the southwestern peninsula of Cornwall, which is where they talked about in the sea. So mm -hmm. makes sense. I'm just gonna put all the four stars in here. I don't remember uh, Cornwall being particularly foggy all the time, but it was windy and very cold. I don't know. I always kind of think of the Isle of Britain as kind of just a gray and foggy place. It is overcast and rainy a lot. This is true. Uh, but yeah, specific, <laughs> specifically, I don't remember it being foggy in Cornwall. But even in, I think it was spring when we went last. And this was several years ago. But even back then, it was fucking windy and cold. Very rocky as well. But yes, Tristan is from the region of Cornwall, and he just kind of pops out and is like, Hello! Hello, I am here. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Someone please explain this to me. Q explaining. We need to do that a couple of times on this lost belt. Yeah. But, um... Tristan basically takes off saying, he's like, I've been here before, I know where I'm going. We immediately get lost. But it might not actually be Tristan's fault. He meant just trying to keep lay a trail and messing it up like he's forgetting. Oh shit, it's time for a battle. We encounter a new enemy, enemy type here. They are very squick. Yeah, I think the best way I describe the Moors, uh, is what we find out what they're called later, is uh, it's basically like we ran into the demons from Princess Mon Mononoke. Yeah, they're no. just kind of dark and gooey. And they're very mad. They're upset about something. About Many some. Curses. Many curses. So, uh, let's see. What was I leveling up? And that's 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 our intro to the enemies of this lost belt. Hey, you want to fight a lot of goop demons with curses? I hope you like goop demons. So much goop. There's a lot of goop. It's going a very on. gooey lost belt. But the fog gets, th after the battle, the fog gets thicker and things start getting weird. 
Uh, if you pay attention to like the UI enough, you start noticing things get weird immediately. People have changed from their name to Child with the Furrow Brow, Grieving Knight, Knight. Um, as we continue, N Mash's armaments start breaking down and she goes down. Da Vinci runs off and Trister forgets who they are as he speaks and forget who he is. We only remember him for his red hair and we forget what we are doing and then who we are. We go down as well. Time for your second nap. Yes. We we immediately get lost in a fairy forest and take another goddamn nap. <laughs> it's almost like we should have fucking known better. But a stranger appears who a stranger appears who knows us and will help us. But not right now. They do warn us to not let anyone know that we are human though. Too bad they warned us while we were fucking passed out. <laughs> Actually I'll use this for for fodder. You know what? I'm just gonna use all these for fodder. How are we doing on the four other four stars here? Looks all like three stars left over. So, we wake up in an unfamiliar room with a new girl that looks real familiar. Clearly, this is MASH! They have lost their memories too. I, apparently, am Lysander. It was on my name tag, which is a leaf for some reason. Uh, for context, if you don't know, don't know, Lysander is one of the four main characters in A Midsummer's Night Dream. One of the humans that fell under the effect of a love potion and uh, fell in love with someone who was not their love. Uh, yes, I believe if you are the uh, female master at this point, the name is Hermia, which is another Midsummer Night character. Ah. Same deal, basically. I didn't think about that, but yes. Yeah. It's a reference. It's a reference. Apparently, we are in the Nameless Woods, which has fog so thick you can't escape it, and it will rob you of your memories. One of the most dangerous places in all of Britain, and that's where we decided to start this journey. Good job, us. At least we have the excuse that all our senses were broken, but damn, we're <laughs> bad at this. We are bad at this. Oops. Uh, let me see here. I really feel like I had other fucking... Or did I already sh shove them into something? I might have. Oh, also, I need to unlock these. That's my problem. Do I have full ones of these? I don't remember. I'll just shove them in there and if they are, they'll pop up. Smart sort. <laughs> Smart sorts. But. We wake up, and who is this red hair arch with us? He serves us, though, and is willing to die to keep us safe. Sounds legit. Doesn't matter. Best friends now. High five. Yeah, this I put in my notes is the Knights of the Round are truly on a different level. Tristan remembers literally nothing, and he's just like, I would lay my life down for this person, by the way. Like, thanks, you know, Assault really Best. <laughs> thanks, Assault Best in Class, as that's what he names himself. <laughs> with Along with several other things, shows that even if you erase their memory, you can't erase what kind of person they are. Um, luckily, they have a name tag as well, and are Tristam. Written in Old English, which Mash doesn't understand. Hmm. Also, by the way, I, I I have mentioned before about how Celtic names work. That is one of the possible spellings of Tristan. Is Tristam? There's also uh, Dunstan or Dryston. You could sometimes spell it with a D. It's wild. Celtic oh. languages are weird. Wait, I think that I know why I'm having the problem here. Hang on, let me go over. Yeah, that's why. Okay, everyone's still in. There, so let me. Uh, clear the seas. There we go. Sometimes I forget that I actually have to, you know, take um things off before they'll let me like remove them or burn them or anything. Did I? Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, they get sort of weird if they're in your party. Yeah. Okay. So, as we wondering about what we're doing if these failures are slave trading, already... Oh, wait. Nope. Yeah. Um, here we go. 
As we wonder about what we're doing and if these fairies are slave training or already hinting at oppression in this world, we meet a new face, a wing girl that wants us to meet the others. Here is another sign of something wrong. While her clothes look okay, her face has a scar and her, her wings are tattered and she speaks about how people scold her for being useless. These are clearly signs of abuse and or neglect. But we go on out, we go to meet everyone. Oh no, it looks like these fairies are going to eat us. But nay, they're actually super friendly and helpful. What a twist. Apparently this is the village of outcasts for outcasts. But enough about that, it is time to party. But amidst the fisting, it is time for lore. So we have... So we have six different clans here. Um, we have the Wind Clan, which are basically elves. The Earth Clan, basically fucking dwarves. The Fang Clan, who are wolf people. The Mirror Clan, who are missing slash extinct. The Wing Clan, who is mysterious. The King Clan, that is only one person, but is someone that apparently ha Mash has a lot uh, to say about. I bet they're frenemies, like, you know, Salter Jalter. Uh, Tristam is concerned about the Fey folk and how they can rip us to shreds, but Mash is like, that's not how we work. Followed by ominous prayers outside asking forgiveness. Again, talking about how the fog apparently just strips away your memories of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, e even even down his memories of who he is and what the fuck he was doing, Tristan is like, yo, dog, we don't trust fairies. This this is this is lesson numero uno Tristam teaches you and you should remember it. We don't trust fairies. Also, yeah, somebody in chat asked, I I assume because he names you after a character from Midsummer's Night, Oberon had to be responsible for the name tags. Probably. Actually, let me put all those in there. Let me see here and what else? All right, then we go to second origin, then we swap by held. Oh, okay. Oh, let's... Let's see here. So if I take out these and that, then both of these, I guess combine those. It is interesting to note, by the way, Chad, because we brought up the we named out the clans and stuff here. But um, that uh, while the Wind Clan and the Wing Clan are separate, the Wind Clan do still sometimes have wings. Yes, despite their elvishness. So there is some some you know back and forth there. There is some. I think at one point Oops. um were uh we are mistaken for uh, Wind Clan fairies who have lost their wings. Yes. They talk about how they think our wings have been ripped off or something. I can't do that. Okay, so that should make that easier to deal with. Uh, let's scroll down here. Ah, yes. Turn that off. So. Uh, next morning, it's the unknown wing girl who wants to show us around. She talks about about the areas. You talk to a few inhabitants. They seem to really, really like us. Apparently, our aura is really nice. Afterward, uh, Mash decides that we need to go test our skills out in the forest and seems a little trigger happy, it seems, but after a battle, seems to uh, regret our act her actions immediately. We are not strong boys. Would you, uh, you say that she offers us a test of your reflexes! <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> the soundboard is based. It is based. So, man, so there's something called an annual existent tax, and that sounds like a fucking thing. Also, command seals exist here, and having them is a banned thing. We don't get any more context on that, though. The Nameless Wing Girl continues to be abused, and you start to see the cracks in the mirror and how they treat Nameless Fairies. Uh, nameless Fairies are those that have lost their purpose and their name and are doomed to wither away and die. But enough about that, check out the latest new fad, a fucking handshake. 
But being on being the ones to being ones to not let things lie, we try to help out how we can. Mate, Mash can apparently use Magecraft. Same as the Queen, but not Sacrament. Magecraft is something that Mash taught herself. And it may seem that Mash remembers more about herself than she lets on. We have a bittersweet moment with the Wing Girl, but it only gets more bitter. It seems things are about to go downhill. On things that went weird really quick, fairies don't need to eat, so the fact that we got uh, hungry gives us away. They found out that we are human, and the village is ecstatic and touchy, and immediately lock us up to keep us safe. We are locked up with Tristam and Mash, but Mash doesn't know if they are a fairy or not. Apparently, humans are needed by fairies as a sort of mental aid, but are regulated by the queen. Things go immediately from bad to worse, as some of the fairies cannot contain their emotions over the human and want to do everything to us, from feeding us and combing our hair, to skinning us and chopping us into pieces. And when Doga, the uh, friendly uh, fan can guy that we met earlier, we had a rousing game of ball earlier, speaks up about maybe not doing that, he has his head ripped off. It immediately devolves into a bloody fight between the fairies. I'm sorry, what was that? I said, can I get some Fs in chat for Doga? But also, yes, in that in that note, I feel like it's a good part to insert one of my notes. I feel like my our watchword for this Lost Belt or our, our keynote phrase for themes will be, and then it got worse. Yeah. Because that happens several times. We're just minding our own business, and then we're just like, and then it got worse. <laughs> I think this is like, we, 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 I talked about this earlier in the mailbag, but I think this is a good representation of the fairies here. They don't think or act like humans. Their love is heavy, and they don't like others getting the way of what they want. Yeah, even when they get, even when they get logical, some of them are still suspect to it, and, you know, there's also some real fucked up shit in their logic. At one point, when it looks like the Earth Clan is on top, the uh, chief Earth Clan guy, who was very friendly to us before, is like, we should break their legs first so they can't run away. And we're just like, damn, that's still cold. It's creepy fine. Yeah. Also, I, I mean, it's, again, talking about fairy stuff, like, it, it's explained earlier that the, the Wind Clan and the Earth Clan have kind of a rivalry, and that, uh, once yeah. again, just gets thrown full force out here. Because uh, the... the uh, they mention at this point that our uh, our Wind Clan friend, the elf guy, uh, used to be an attendant for uh, somebody named Aurora that will come back later. Mm -hmm. and that's why he's so uh, reasonable and dignified. Also makes me wonder later what the fuck he did to fuck up, but, you know. There's a lot of room for fucking up with the fairies. Apparently. So... We do escape with the help of the wing girl, but Tristam has to strum his heart for some odd reason, making it into a chase. He just he just remembers that's his thing. Kanashi strum. Fuck. It's like oh. <clears throat> uh, we managed to escape our pursuers, but with one last twist of the knife, the wing girl collapses, and when she try to help. Screams her frustrations at us before turning into a moor is one of the things that attacked us earlier. She says that she was just leading us away so she could have her herself, but I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 weird. It's like it, it, I, I like you said, she just screams her frustration. It feels like it's just her her boiling point of like we already knew things were gonna go badly from the way that our visit with her her little camp went, but then it turns around as like this breaking point of like when we turn back and and show her concern she like can't take it well because apparently she's been if I, I remember this apparently she's been suffering this abuse for like over a hundred years like a hundred years and um we mentioned you know things getting even more bitter she apparently started turning into a moors like after uh, mash left her the before and so she laments that after all this time it's only right at the very end that people start showing her kindness and it's yeah, Very sad. That, that seems to be the, the the break point. There is like we we hit this moment of like the ultimate frustration where she already knows she's doomed, but for some reason now we we show her this moment of kindness. This is also, I think, very thematic of like. There's a lot of people, we'll get into this more in detail, but in this Lost Belt, there's a lot of characters who are just sitting around waiting to be saved, and. 
there's also a per very pervasive feeling that for some people or places, it's just too goddamn late. The, the time just doesn't line up, you know? Mm -hmm. And so th this is kind of like, I mean, as you'd expect, um, you know, and, and Nasu has written some pretty heavy openers. Uh, he wrote, you know, the Fuyuki chapter of uh, FGO, for instance, which has a lot of hard hitters to suck you in. Um, you know, this is a very heavy hitting intro to like slurp you in and, and definitely sets up a lot of the thematic stakes. Yes, Chad, it's very sad. It's very sad. Uh, I believe this one. Yeah, I could get rid of that one. This is also, I think, why in my mind the Moors are uh, very uh, Ghibli demon esque because of kind of like where they come from, you know? Mm. When, they're, when fairies are, are either cursed by physical contact, as we find out later, or uh, they are overcome with their despair and dark emotions and mm -hmm. they just go full blarg. Go full blarg. The big goop. Uh, we do battle, but don't finish her off. And with a thrust like the wind, someone swoops in to finish her off. It's Oberon, the Fairy King. Ta-da! Oh, I should have looked up the name of of the character designer because they are they're they're a mangaka who they're the one who wrote um, March comes in like a lion. It's a very very noticeable art style. I can't remember her name to save my life. Hang on one uh, sec. Chika Umino. Yes. A uh, funny thing about this is um, she actually has a fear of insects. And um, drawing a Oberon was a bit of a trial for her. Yeah. Ugh. Well, I do not have to look that up. Um, him calling us our name is enough to jog our memory and let us remember everything. Uh, not Mash is confused by Oberon, thinking that they were Merlin. I can understand why you would get these two confused. Yes, I do too. It's actually a little weird. Especially when we get to Oberon stealth mode later. <laughs> All he needs is a hood. So not Mash. Do you is... think Foe would would beat up Oberon too? Probably. I had to think about that. And I'm like, mm, wait, no, yeah, I can see it. I can see it happening. Just nibble at his ankles. Something like that, yeah. Uh, let me see here. It's just that one left. Okay, so I'll just I'll just shove the rest in there. I don't got time to be playing too much with this. I think that'll be everything. Uh, I believe, and it's actually it's a little bit of a sad story, but I believe that um, uh, Umino was given an art book of fairies by uh, the late mangaka of Berserk, uh, and that's or was recommended a specific book that he used. Mm -hmm. Um. And that is where a lot of the initial design for Oberon uh, came together. Uh, and uh, I, I believe there was a recent social media post that was recirculating. Uh, she actually really wanted to uh, uh, show like Oberon's final designs to him, but unfortunately, he did uh, pass away before uh, the the like banner fully took off. So it's a little sad, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, great mentorship going on there. I'm also interested in whatever book with a basis was there for those tips, because damn. There's a lot of good fairy work in the in this in the lost belt, y'all. Mm -hmm. I'll just stick it back in there for now. Huh. Me, I actually wrote it that way. Weird. Yeah, you wrote it that way a couple of times. Probably because you were just transcripting from the text. Mm-hmm. So not Mash is actually Artoria Castor, but Castor is just the name of the village she is from. Yeah, that one I'm actually chat. You can double check for me. I don't want to disbelieve Lucky because obviously, like I said, I'm pretty sure he literally transliterated it from the page. But how I remember that dialogue going was she said that Castor is what they called her in the village, because later they say she's from Tintagel, but that is technically the name of an island. So I'm not actually sure. Yeah, I'm trying to think about it, and I'm not sure. E either way, it's kind of... Um... Okay, so Castor is... People are saying Castor is what they called her. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was her name in the village. But it's... It, no matter what, it's weird. Robert's saying Castor was her family name. That doesn't make any sense. 
That's even more confusing, Robin. <laughs> yeah, no, no matter what, it is it is still just like, hmm. That's a little weirder. But we have a CG at the end here showing us as we look over the beautiful British countryside, except there's the broken remains of a tree of emptiness, which is quite stark. Map unlocked. Yeah, what my first thought when I saw this with like the, the broken tree kind of heaped like a giant crystal in the background, I was just like, this is a Final Fantasy. <laughs> like just this big sweeping shot and there's like this this big, you know, rocky blob. They say later it's the tree, but I was like, this is a very crystalline with its very sharp edges, you know. It looks very different than how previous trees are handled, obviously. Alright, so I should probably do a few more runs to get my QP. Well no, actually, you know what? No, I'm just gonna start slapping uh Rank ups. That's what I'm gonna do. It's like a job, baker, fisher, caster. Uh, I mean that is kind of how all of the the names for everybody but assassin are formulated in, in fate. If Assassin had a name like that, their their class name would probably be Killer. Kira. Oh, I fucked up my art sloop thing. What the hell? When did that happen? Okay, I'm way behind. Uh, I gotta fix this real quick. He's got to fix his team comp. I do. I must have not been paying attention to what team I was on. It happens. Uh, all right. Still like 10 teams. Mm-hmm. Where is it? Actually, the more I think about it, if I remember correctly, doesn't the Liz doesn't the Liz thing have a thing where they do all the previous CEs? I do believe there is a banner there, yeah. Cause I would love to get my little Halloween Devil MLB. I only have one copy, but it's what I like to really use for for the Sashi. Yeah, they should. I, I'm pretty sure there should be a, a rerun banner. Do that, do that. Uh, this will be a good chance to actually get in. Get to that question. Yes, uh, community questions do sometimes get filtered. Uh, if you guys do, like, links or hashtags, YouTube may occasionally grab them. I make sure to, to check, but there's also something to keep in mind is um, if, if you posted a question, uh, like, right now... Um, or, or earlier in this day. We've already recorded the show by then. Uh, Lucky will usually say when he is refreshing and how many there are. And so it, it is possible. People do occasionally do it uh, to just miss the deadline. Yeah, no. I make sure you check our health comments occasionally, but uh, YouTube does only keep them for like 60 days. Yeah, no. Usually about... The cutoff time is usually Friday. Friday about... Five uh, lucky standard time, which is the same as uh, Pacific time. Usually, and then I'll usually do like one more check just to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Sometimes some people sneak in. Some times people don't. Basically, if you're one of those people, and I know you exist, most of them are patrons. But if you're one of those people who posts the mailbag as we are recording the show, you understand that you're playing with fire. But I, I assume those people get that. What is lucky? Uh, does also uh, <laughs> call uh, old mailbags as well, so sometimes it's hard to check. Yeah. Well, then, if I, as if I didn't, our community page would be nothing but mailbag posts, which irks me. They are a limited time offer. Uh, we can go on. All right, but I do believe that is okay. Fixed. Well, yeah, no. They say they say um, I'll treat a caster. Like I could have swore, like I could be wrong, but I could have swore yeah, they. That's why I said I don't want to. I don't want to say you're wrong because, like I said, I'm, I'm sure you literally typed what they said in the text box. But okay, yeah. I mean, I'll double check no again because now I'm because now I'm I'm weird. But um, 
Oh, or, you mean on her? Are you talking about on her profile picture? I mean, yeah, but that's that still doesn't mean anything. Oh yeah. So honestly, like with the with the with the first section done, I kind of feel like this whole entire section was just kind of a tutorial for what is about to happen. I think, like we. Ran into some trouble, we met some nice fairies, oh no, shit bad shit's gonna happen, and then we have to, you know, move on. I feel like this story is just gonna be a lot, a lot of ups and downs like that. Yeah, I, I said this in, uh, <laughs> not quite so many words earlier, but yes, it is It is definitely setting the, the strong tone for what this lost will be like, thematically. Um, yeah, also there'll be these moments where you like you think everything is normal and fine and then it's like oh suddenly it's not fine because that's just how fairies are yep. also I don't know when this actually shows up but on the map screen there is a note section that has the lost belt timeline which is hella neat in my opinion yeah it's it's a very interesting addition it's still really good and I'm curious, um, like, how it came to be. And I wonder if we'll see, like, a call day break room or a steam it somewhere later. Because that, that to me feels like that was a tool that maybe, like, the the right, the right the games, like, programmers and writers needed to, like, be, like, understanding what the fuck they're turning the script into. Mm -hmm. they're awesome. like, they say that the word count was it was worth nine stacks of printer paper. So, like, it, 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 it seems like the kind of thing that would have started as an internal tool and they would just would have been like, Wait. We need a thing. <laughs> yes, it's very important. It is very important. And then we get a flashback question mark? Side side. We can get something called Fragments 1. Apparently this is the part where we follow what happens to Mash with a narrator that calls her my favorite. That doesn't sound ominous at all. So, Mash gets picked up by slave traders who are, you know, going to, you know, sell her. But before they get too weird and handsy with her, a white wolf sh um, shows up to keep them in check. While she remains ignorant of all these facts. She is the most preciousest Kohai. She is. Um, I also have a note here, as, you know, some terms are probably of what is an odd, goggy caterpillar? Um, and Omega very uh, helpfully um, got me a description. And it is a creature used by parents around Yorkshire. Or is it Yorkshire? I don't know how to pronounce it. It's just Yorkshire. Yorkshire? Okay. Yeah. To discourage children from going into forests and orchards unsupervised, the odd guagi is a bogey that will take the form of a massive caterpillar. He can move invisibly through the trees and descend on any children who try to steal the right fruit he protected, swallowing them whole. This is fucking terrifying. But that's a freaky one. This is a freaky one. Also, is this when they start uh, calling her a niece, or is that later? No, this is when they start calling her a niece. Yeah. Uh, which, in this case, in the spelling that is used by the text, uh, th that's the name of a uh, flowering herb uh, that is similar uh, to uh, star anise, fennel, licorice, etc., but is not uh, quite the same. It's also interesting, by the way, that it, regular anise, anyway sometimes called aniseed or annex is um it's usually from originally from the mediterranean hmm. so i give you some notes that things are not always what they seem. so from here though we go into section two i actually don't know how to pronounce this is it salisbury yeah salisbury so salisbury. 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 salisbury okay so we start with some local trust us chat these will the the spelling and pronouncing of things that are brave will keep coming up mm-hmm Oh, yes, Salisbury. Salisbury. So we start with some local deity of Fairy Britain. Camelot is in the center with North Britain and South Britain. With most people being in the south, there are four main cities. Salisbury, the Great Cathedral, Norwich, the Port Town. How do you pronounce this? Glau... Gloucester? Gloucester? Ah, Gloucester? Gloucester. Yeah. Oh, welcome to this shit, everybody. Yeah, it's Gloucester. Gloucester, the city of fashion, and Oxford, the great dining hall. Each is run by a clan head. We meet Oberon's assistants, Blanca, the cutest moth, super assistant. 
Why did Oberon use a question mark when he called her a friend? Don't know. Is she an employee, maybe? I don't know. My notes my notes for this were just moth. Moth. Not quite mother or mothest, but moth. Through our bond, we do know that MASH is alive, at least. You know, speaking of other people, though, apparently it is hard to tell between a fairy and a servant, so Da Vinci is probably okay, too. We have a bit of a talk, and, and Artoria decides to join the party. Do -do -do. She also seems to have a bad habit of assuming things. Yeah. Oberon seems to have schemed something. And with that, there is a fairy song talking about Artoria calling her the Star of Hope. By the way, I still think the moment of Starborn is more thematically appropriate here. They also mention six spells that are needed and the location of Orkney. There is a scene of a burning village and someone saying that Arturia is the spitting image of someone. But alas, it was a nightmare! Tristan, why did you call her maid Arturia before almost calling her my liege? <laughs> You're having a moment, I guess. She has the face of a king. Mm. We seem to be wrestling with something, but we are reassured that it will not be by our own hand that destroys its, this lost spell. It is falling apart on its own. Boy, howdy. <laughs> but after this, we do finally learn the name of the High Queen of Fairy Britain. It is Morgan. Tristan is shook. And Oberon really wants to hammer home defeating Queen Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be talking about that one a couple of times, but yeah. Um... I think we can say right here off the top, like, this is our first big interaction with Oberon, and while there's lots of uh, nice tidbits here that, uh, you know, we've got some notes back and forth about, uh, the general vibe I immediately get is while he's pleasant enough and very helpful, this motherfucker absolutely has his own agenda. He has his own reasons why he is here, and like, what he's getting out. Mm -hmm. And they are not necessarily one-to-one -one with us, I would like to reiterate. We, we were not told explicitly to fight the Lost Belt King. You assume we might have to, but that is not exactly how our mission is going. No. Nah. So apparently fairies here use sacrament for magic, not magecraft. It's considered unnecessary and only practiced by weirdos. Though I will say, Artoria, if you didn't want to talk about it, you probably shouldn't have commented on it in the first place. Seems to be a bit of a sore subject for her. After this, we do learn a little bit about Oberon's setting, including his awareness as being a plot device in a play. Um, they also mentioned that while A Midsummer's Night Dream is the most popular version of Oberon, there is a record of Oberon the Fairy King existing before that. Titania, unfortunately, was completely original. Do not steal. Yes, I actually uh, had this in my own notes. This is absolutely correct. The name Titania that uh, Shakes picked comes from Ovid. It is just a generic term for the Daughters of the Titans. Typically, prior to Midsummer's Night, the Fairy Queen is not mentioned. For instance, in the Ballad of Tam Lin, she is just the Fairy Queen. Uh, actually giving her a name was uh, a com more common mm -hmm. Funnily enough, this is also actually um, uh, common in uh, the Arthuriana as well. Um, the character who later comes to be generally considered to be called Morgaus, uh, that is the wife of King Lot of Orkney and the mother of those guys. I don't want to list all five of them right now. Um, <laughs> uh, in a lot of older legends, she is literally just called the Queen of Orkney. Or like... Uh, or Kea. Like it's 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 interesting that, that despite being honestly part of the plot, they... There are some characters that writers don't feel the need to actually name. But yeah, Titania, uh, OC, do not steal. Um, as we discuss uh, having to deal with uh, fairies and stuff, uh, Tristan wonders about um, being able to lie to fairies because where he comes from, you can't uh, you can't lie to them. They see through any falsehoods. But Oprah is quick to be like, no, 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 it's fine. Um, apparently these fairies, fairies are unable to automatically know the truth from the lie, so, you know, we can get our subterfuge on. Lost access to their special eyes. Mm-hmm. Which is a thing, uh, fairy eyes are a thing that has been mentioned in several other Nosifer's works. Oh. 
Um, they, we continue to talk here, and Oberon says a line that I think really hammers home what's probably going to be a lot in this Lost Bell does. The only will that you can tell of dealing with someone with us uh, dealing with a good persona or not is when everything is said and done. Yeah. Like I said, i I'm only like I'm only in like what section eight here, and I'm I'm seeing this. I'm feeling a lot of this. Yeah, I I, I uh, paraphrased in my own notes as basically like the only way you can tell who was good is when it's all over. But yeah, no, that's like that's a line that really stuck with me as like this is going to be thematically important. I think. Because this is in that conversation about falsehoods, obviously, but it's definitely got that raised point of just like, yeah, no, uh, the only way you can really be sure is is when you're all done with everything. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's definitely a theme we have run into before. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, sometimes you can tell that somebody is just a scumbag. <laughs> Looking at you, Barrel. Yeah. A fuckboy from top to bottom. So we do learn that humans are present in this Lost Belt, and some of them are even free and independent, but they are a tool to enrich fairy society. Being slaves so that fairies have something interesting to look out and ideas to copy. Fairy society and culture in general is just a superficial copy of human society. Yep. Oberon keeps pointedly calling Morgan our enemy. It's quite... odd. We learn of another new kit location here called New Darlington, the National Slaughterhouse Theater. It sounds like a place I never want to visit. God, please, especially with later shit. Please, no. I don't know shit about New Darlington. I don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. should actually look up where is New Darlington in real life. I bet it is real. I'm curious myself. Interesting. New Darlington appears to be a village in the country in New Jersey. Maybe just Darlington. Yeah, I do believe. I guess that would just be yeah, the original non-new version of Darlington. Yeah, because I do believe they say later that Darlington got destroyed. I think it was in the calamity. Yeah, it makes sense. So yeah, the original Darlington is a, a town in. Uh, Durham, which is in the north. Uh, it's near some. It's near Yorkshire area. So interesting, yeah. <laughs> that one, we'll discuss that later. That one at least has an explanation. Oh, so to keep suspicion off our back, Artoria is going to pretend to be our owner, but from her reaction, I'm curious to know what fantasies were playing in her head and what she was too young to do. In my notes, this is just written down as, Castoria's kink is pet play. <laughs> this is my new uh, head empty, no thoughts, only X Miyamoto Musashi quote. Because believe it or not, with how emotive she is, the jokes about Castoria's kink list come up a couple of times. <laughs> She's really not good at keeping it at keeping it in. So arriving at a bar to gather information, we learned that Oberon is quite well known and popular and also owes a lot of people a lot of money. This, this, this guy just seems more and more Merlin-like every day. Apparently when he first arrived he had nothing but the cloak on his back. Apparently he just ran around performing plays and stories. And apparently arrived a long time ago and has been prepping ever since. Also, please spare the world from the Oberon Tristan team up. That will not end well for anyone. But enough of those dial thoughts. Let's check out the cutie new server, Da Vinci, serving you apple waters on roller skates. Oh. Is this why Da Vinci had a maid ascension, or did they just see the maid ascension and go, we can use this? Yeah, this is where I, I, I inserted a note. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, one of. Uh, Da Vinci's natural genius skills is keen marketing. <laughs> Put it up there with uh, Mixologist later. When she tells uh, the inn owner, Mike, uh, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to make cocktails later. I'll be back. What? Natural genius, baby. It's a hell of a drug. Hell of a drug. Apparently, before Da Vinci, as Mike likes to call her, the inn was... <laughs> Apparently, the inn was so superficial that Mike, the order owner, didn't even think about renting out rooms until the paint perfect angel, Dubinci, told him about it. 
But as thanks, we got to use rooms as a base. Arturia is thrilled to have her own room. Retire to our rooms, quick recap of the Lost Belts, and their discovery that there is no world outside Fairy Britain. It is all ocean. That is very weird. Um, apparently, our, the fairies are uploaded to the cloud, so even if they uh, shouldn't actually appear, they will. Human history convergent is such a weird term. I'm not entirely sure I understand it. Yeah, it, um, my best guess is it's apparently like the concept of convergent evolution, but for folktales, basically. Mm -hmm. um, convergent evolution is, you know, basically just uh, one of the explanations of, like, why do similar creatures open similar niches? It's because evolution pushes them to conform to certain things so even vastly unrelated species can develop similar traits because it's just really smart of you to do that in in those environments hmm. uh this uh theory is used a lot in sci-fi to explain why so many aliens are uh bipedal uh the reality is so that we can save a costume budget but it may actually have a point that you know being bipedal and having sweet grippy hands may be important but yeah, the the other explanation, the way you phrased it, is like being uploaded to the cloud. The the way I think Da Vinci, or is it Oberon who actually mentions it? One of the two of them explains it as basically like because a human once thought up a fairy that looked like X, that idea is permanently enshrined in the vagueness of mystery. So because there's a lot of fairies here, those fairies show up even though there's no reason for them to do that. Basically, even, despite the fact that there's no Germany, it's just ocean. Germanic fairies or French fairy stories, etc., will show up here. Which is interesting, but weird. Mm -hmm. So we learned that apparently Morgan took power 2,000 years ago, stopped the war clanning, war six clans from warring endlessly, gave humans who were nothing but cattle limited freedom, and had to build societies so fairies could have something to distract them. She also had put a limit on the number of fairies born, not fairies, number of humans born every year. Rules up fairies with an iron fist and sucks the life juice out of those living in the cities. Um, one of the things she likes saying is, I offer neither absolution nor salvation. I only demand that you obey without question or hesitation. Show me your fealty and word and action and I shall keep Britain safe. So, from what I can tell... Like me, I know I'm I'm pretty amoral in a lot of things, but you know, just follow me here. From what I can tell, Morgan seems to have shown up and turned what was basically a chaotic mess of an island, slapped everyone and said, "Behave or else." Um, from what it sounds like, she improved the lives of humans. And I'm gonna be real: if the fairies back at Cornwall is any indication, I don't know if I want humans just running around riling people up with being all interesting and shit. And apparently, and these are fairies, so ruling with an iron fist is probably the only the actual way to keep them from rampaging. It does seem that she doesn't care for humans or fairies itself, but just for Britain as a whole. It's like she's an AI with Britain's protection being her highest priority. The only thing I don't understand is the existence tax. Is that to keep citizens from getting too strong, or is she using that energy for something else? Yeah, we might get into that a little later, but mm. I, I kind of took this that those whole block of points Lucky talked about. This is uh, the point where I usually keyed into the theme that seems to recur in Lost Belts of like, ah, this is the part where we explain how this timeline is royally fucked. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing but the sea and Britain. Uh, not even all of Britain, you know. Um, Scotland appears to be kind of fogged or cut off on the map. Ireland is nowhere to be found. That kind of stuff. Um... But somehow convergent evolution replicated many many European fairies. But this doesn't explain how, and somebody in chat was mentioning this earlier, but I left off commenting until now. Morgan has reigned for allegedly 2,000 years, but there are still normal British place names for things. Um, you know, stuff like that. And why is she using command spells on every fairy in Britain? Or at least the ones that live in cities. Also, yes, the existence tax, because apparently living is rent-seeking behavior. Um... <laughs> You know, th this is taking... It, it's like she heard about in a story what humans call taxation and was like, ah, yes, I know how to work that. Give me your magical energy or die. Like, it's it's real weird and bad. And it's just like... Like, she seems to have obvious positives. Like, I agree with you that, like, I know fairies. I have seen fairies. Obviously, I think the, the, the fairies in the Nameless Village were somewhat riled up because they even said they hadn't had a human around them in a long time, mm -hmm. you know? So th maybe th maybe it's like they were jonesing for their human fix. But in general, fairies are 
very chaotic and very mood swingy by their nature. And so obviously like in general, from my lo from my experience in this Lost Belt looking at it, I actually don't think many fairies, some of them would be reasonable, sure, but there are a lot of fairies who would only do what you want if you held them at gunpoint. Yeah. It, it seems to be a theme. Like, there's a lot of them who, who, who their, their, their only rule is, well, I'm going to do what I want until somebody, you know, threatens to cut off my legs or whatever. Like, it, it's... They are not easily controlled by their, you know, their mercurial nature. Uh, at one point, it's even said how fairies are supposed to be nature spirits. So, you know, they are embodiments of, of Mother Nature. So, yeah, naturally, they don't play by our, our normal civilized rules. But they think civilization is neat. So, it, it's it's complex. But I, I definitely got the vibes, even this early, and especially later. Uh, Morgan is not necessarily an intrinsically bad person she is just like a lot of the other fairies and seems to have her very strict specific worldview and if you do not conform she will fucking nuke your ass she is very uh, cold and earlier, ruthless goldorf uh goldorf applied uh described her firepower as like having an intercontinental ballistic missile in her, in her pocket mm -hmm. also sorry i was i don't know if chad understood you but i didn't catch what you said because i was mid talk what did you say oh she's very cold and ruthless Yes, she is pragmatic as fuck, but also maybe not because there's a lot of opportunities she could take to be more pragmatic where she's just like, no, this is not a problem. Ignore it. It's it's weird. Um, She fears very, feels very tropey, honestly. Like, she she plays the role of the High Queen very well. Also, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but Robin did say it. He got the, the cutout. The line literally says, Caster was my name in the village where I'm from. Oh. So she introduces herself as as Artoria Caster. But Caster was what her name was in the village. But yeah, still a little... No matter how you slice it, odd. odd. Oh, okay. Somehow I missed the my. Maybe replaced it with a the or something. Yeah. Yeah, no. Caster was just the name in the village. I'm Okay, yeah. So that's what happened. All right. Weird me. But thank you, Robin, for giving me, giving me that. It was going to bug me. Now back to other bugs. pa dum pa Alright, let me pull up the notes again. Alright, apparently Morgan's also Morgan's army also does protect the realm from the Moors. Those squicky things. Uh, Morgan is feared and hated, but also depended on. Which, to be real, sounds like any modern nation's government to me personally. Like, actually, I'm gonna be real. How many people are actually happy with the way the government runs things in their life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Lots of people aren't. No. But you need them for stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and then behold, a prophecy about a young girl with a staff. I probably actually should have wrote that down now that I think about it, but I didn't think about it too much. The prophecy. No. <laughs> uh, there is some specific language to the prophecy, and it gets quoted a couple of times. Chad, I'm sure, will know what we're, uh, mm -hmm. we're talking about. But yeah. All right. Uh, before we move on to section three, I will once again be stepping away. We're at three, three and a half hours, everybody. And we're only at section. Uh, we're only at section three. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll hit Four five six. hours or something. We'll probably hit a fiver in this one, especially as our notes unfold like lotus petals as we go on. <laughs> like, the, this, the, you think the story is deep now? We only go deeper. So I will once again step, pause my audio, and step away for a second here. He'll be right back. You also should consider uh, taking a stretcher. Take a stretch. Watch Castoria buff Musashi. Same with the Tamamamamamamo. Timamimamamamo. Tamamamamamamamo. Tamamamamamamamo. Tamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamamam
If I made a new Toma? What's a Toma? I do not understand. Hmm. I seem to have a problem here. Oh, new Tomamo? Mm. I don't think we need more like Tomamos. We need more of the Tomamo 9. Like, as we know now know the official story with uh, Koyan Sky, uh, we still only have one of them. And that, and that is illegal. How dare. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Alright, but Robin has also done us a solid and captured the prophecy. The prophecy. Which honestly, uh, you know, says a lot. Yeah. Though it be too small for any other to see, the child shall be drawn to the light here as a moth to the flame. That's one line. Once the child has averted catastrophe in the city of iron and the sea of soot, their pilgrimage shall truly begin. Chosen by the Staff of Selection, capital letters by the way, guarded by travelers from afar, shall reach the throne. The throne shall be claimed by a true king. Take up the bloodied crown. Let the six bells ring out like raging lightning, like grieving flame. Let them ring out and forge a path for the true king. Let them ring out before the red calamity reaches. I think there might be a second line after that one, but that's the bulk. Mm. So yeah, hey, what does that sound like? Sounds like crazy. Crazy talk, all of it. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. So, yep. So we move on to section three, Aurora. Da Vinci has also had to invent mattresses. We were just using rocks before. It, it is a little crazy. What if Da Vinci showed them a water bed? How 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 mental do you think they would go? They go pretty mental. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be real. So, apparently we only have light mode and dark mode here in Fairy Britain. The weather never changes except from occasional uh, rain. We learned that Atoria has an unreasonably high opinion of proper human history. Yeah, I put in my notes here that uh, I phrased this as Morgan skimped on her skybox budget. She can only afford a day texture and a night texture. We go out to gather information about maybe find the mash, and we learn that fairies like to gossip. Only about the child of prophecy and the calamity. But it turns out Oberon gives no fucks about your secrets. Artoria is the child of the prophecy. Who could have guessed? Artoria gets real timid all of a sudden. Yeah, I think I think this is the part, though there are several parts of this chapter where I could have written this note, but I, I'm pretty sure this is the part um, that I wrote where... Uh, Oberon's true uh, bug Sona is not a moth, but a gadfly. <laughs> uh, that's a type of uh, horse biting fly. So yeah, uh, that that seems to be one of his go-to moves. Is just 
Hey, you know it would really stir up conversation if I said this. Yes, our Tori is very, very timid. It does make sense, though, because as far as fairies are concerned, she isn't very strong, so no one would give her the time of day, including the leader of the Wind Clan, Aurora. But Oberon is a face with Max networking, so he can get you in, no problem. Except when the snooty fairies are all like, ew, humans. Thankfully, it doesn't seem like this mindset is prevalent overall. Uh, fun fact, both uh, Coral here and Aurora are designed by Ta, the author behind today's menu with Emiya family. Neat. Very neat. So after slapping around some dudes, we prove that we are not pushovers and we get to see the head ho oh, Jesus, she is bright. Gets a ho intro and everything. Yes, I was like, God, this fairy is too shiny. <laughs> Aurora seems very love and peace and light, airy thoughts, but for some odd reason, I find it hard to believe. Could be my years of years of understanding the Fey folk. She did go give permission and assistance in helping to find Mash, though, so there is that. You know, just just one like one line here: devious smile. This is also just in my notes: devious smile in parentheses. Mm hmm. I don't know what's going on here, but I do think that Oberon has a hate boner for Morgan because he is just going around really pushing the narrative forward here. He constantly tells us to defeat Morgan, tells others we are going to defeat Morgan, and seems to have no problem dropping the bomb that our insecure Artoria is the child of prophecy. Yeah, uh, this is very funny because this is technically, I think, chronologically the first time we do this, but... Um both of us wrote this very same note, just devious smile, and had basically the same thought. Like, my, my thought about this whole conversation is basically like, I can't tell if fairies have offsec or not. Basically, I guess this goes to the point of like, they they can't no they can no longer tell the difference between lies and and the truth. Oberon has supposedly been spreading the word and pre-prepping for our arrival, Lost Belt Five style. Like, that's what he says he's been doing. But also, every bone in my Anglo-ass body says not to trust fairies. <laughs> like, I, at no point should I take anybody in this room at face value. And this is also where I put in my friend's medical note. Oberon seems to be really trying to get me to fight Morgan, which is technically not my mission statement. I don't know why yet. But he's he's pushing. He's pushing his own agenda. Maybe I should have done the art boost there. I wanted to save it for this one, but I guess I'll hold off. So, after seeing Oberon get tackled, I can kind of understand why Nasu Coach Kasumi-san for this Artoria to be nothing like the Earth. others. This is like Lily before Lily, before she accepted the weight and responsibility of her path and really doesn't have a mentor to help her. She is much more lively and emotional than any Artoria I've ever seen, even the joke ones. Yeah, this is another case of parallel thoughts. This is also the exact point where I wrote that down. Like, that she reads very different than every other in the role. Castoria is very emotive and volatile. She switches very rapidly from like every single thing she is like super excited about or super annoyed or like super depressed, you know. It's just so back and forth. And I feel like it has even more breadth than even the comedic Artoria is. Like yeah. a lot of the joke characters are kind of flat. Like there's a lot going on here. And not to say regular Artoria is flat, by the way. She actually has a lot of depth. It's just being stoic is kind of her thing. Uh, this, whatever the opposite of being stoic is, that's Castoria. So we get into more talking, and we learn that apparently the child of prophecy has to ring six bells, one of which being the cathedral in Salisbury. Aurora doesn't allow this for some odd reason, saying Artoria needs to prove herself. Turns out her test is cleaning out the calamity of Norwich. Figures. Apparently, these calamities appear every hundred years, and is a curse that even Morgan can't get rid of. Also, yeah, by the way, man, this really is just a Final Fantasy. We can't <laughs> fuck with the plot, plot coupon until we do a quest. <laughs> but that gets put on the bass burner. Gotta find MASH. While well, Oberon gets in for those, we can do some odd man jobs to make some cash and gather information. Uh, Le Gaspo, there seems to be another Child of Prophecy. And someone called, I believe you said, is, is it Naknera? Naknoria. Naknoria. Yeah. 
Also, yes, by the way, chat, that is how you pronounce that. It is pronounced Naknaria. Naknaria. Has an army up north. Back a bit. Uh, do we want some uh, Naknaria facts now or later? Yeah, let's go for some Naknaria facts now. All right, so, hey, the name Naknaria, uh, which I can spell for chat because this is an alternate spelling. I'll dump it in our text box. Um... So, this is the name of a hill in Ireland that is also known as Maeve's Cairn or Maeve's Tomb, as in that one. Yeah. Uh, also, the name can mean Hill of Kings, but also Hill of Executions. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Also, yeah, no, I'm, I, it's, it's, a, it's a literal hill in Ireland where they think uh, Maeve is buried, according to myth. Yeah. So, yeah. Nocnaria. Nocnaria. I gotta remember that. Naknaria. Yeah, I don't know. They went for the very, very Gaelic spelling. But that's that's why I had to... The, like, after the second time I saw it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna Google now how the fuck to say this. And I was just like, oh! Huh. Naknaria. Back at base, we gotta talk about Autoria after sending a pigeon off. I think uh, the pigeon name was Tafon. Now we need to talk about Altoria Caster. How, um, how about Altoria Caster? Is this a law spell to King Arthur? And now it's time for a dummy's guide to King Arthur. And my notes, I put this down as Da Vinci saying, "Hey kids, want to hear about the once and future king?" <laughs> That's kind of how it feels. We find it weird that this is happening right now, but we're on the grapevine. Is that the child of prophecy is the reincarnation? Re Incarnation, excuse me, a someone named I'm gonna butcher this. Ask, is it ask? Yeah, I think it's ask or it might be ish because um the that that three le uh, four letter word, I'm not good at math chat. Uh, that is basically the same Nordic root as ash tree. I think they mentioned so. That yeah. Uh, ask the savior. Um, the, we learned a little bit about the fairy timeline and learned that it is split up into the Fey era and the High Queen eras, pretty much at the same split between BC and AD that happens in pre proper human history. Your wife who sentence must be tingling because you can't, one of the options you can say is you can wonder if Morgan is actually a bad person. My personal answer is yes, but. Yeah. Uh, also, this is another point where uh, apparently the way that was written in Japanese was Tonelico. Um, Tonelico? Yes. Uh, I'm going to assume this was either something uh, litigious because there is the name of the uh, RPG series R, R Tonelico. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, literally, I googled Tonelico. I just get results for the RPGs uh, or people asking about it in FGO previously. Um, so I'm going to assume that it was... Uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, a loosey goosey name there, probably related to whatever th that series got its name from. The phrase "esk" is definitely uh, directly related to the the concept of the ash tree, as in possibly the world tree, or you know, that as well. So, and yes, uh, somebody in chat said they talked about the uh, the tree of emptiness as an ash. This was frequently referred to as an ash tree here. So, yeah, I think that's just a case of like the original name wouldn't have uh, transliterated very well into English, so they went with something that maybe you may have heard of. There's also, I have a couple of notes about the conversation we have about the Knights of the Round originally, because Tristan and Da Vinci kind of go back and forth. My first note was, Mordred? Taciturn? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess to Tristan, she would seem that way, but it's a weird one. But also, he gives us the full the full list of 15 here, so the playable characters we are missing from this list is Kay, Gaharis, Agravain, uh, Palamedes, Palinor, and Bors. So, still got a few opportunities out there. Okay, so I'm looking this up. This is really fucking weird. So, the, apparently, Arc Tenelico is from the game. Like, like it's 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 from a made-up language called the Hymnos, I believe it's going to say. But it basically means R is the only, and Tenelico means divine tree. So, basically, Arc Tenelico means the holy world tree. Yeah, so it, so it sounds like Nasu may have done a cute pop culture reference that just doesn't translate into English very well. So they did their own wordplay on the world tree. 
for, like I said, for Esk. Yeah. Uh, also, this is where my notes are. I'm like, oh, hey, so we're working for Fairy Jesus now. It's kind of what they're saying. This is the second coming of the Savior. Mm-hmm. Um, with all this, though, uh, Caldea Opsec is a go. We cannot let her know that we might have destroyed a bunch of our Lava spells, and depending on how things might go, might have to blow this one up, too. Maybe. I, I, uh, I too, appreciate, as as a man who wants to assemble the Orkney Rangers, I appreciate that, that some people in chat are still ex excited to remember Gaharis. Yes. He is real. We do keep, we do keep mentioning him. This is important because... Sometimes, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, there is only uh, one member of those twins. But yes, uh, Probably. 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 Uh, another point in learning about fucking how weird fairies are, they didn't even use wheat for bread into Da Vinci. It seems that fairies fall into two categories, those who just copy society and those who are interested in the workings. Apparently, when a fairy needs something, they just make it straight from their magic and does not care about the... They just go from A to D and do not care about B and C. Yeah. They're I've just like... The, the way that uh, it is explained is like, yeah, so because fairies can use sacraments, they can just remember they ate bread once and summon bread. But, you know, Da Vinci actually teaches them the process for making bread, which it turns out to actually be, you know, uh, more unique and memorable than just vaguely remembering what bread is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Honestly, also probably something... I think at a later point you, you compare some of our, our tones and themes to Babylonia as well. That's something very interesting about that, because in a lot of those uh, ancient Mesopotamian cultures, uh, the like methods for how to make bread and stuff were uh, imprinted on clay tablets and basically distributed to everybody as instructions out of temples as needed. Hmm. So there's something like very interesting and subtle about how like Da Vinci is handing these people, these fairies, some of the most most basic like instructions for how to civilization. I guess you could argue she's also teaching them about beer because she was talking about cocktails earlier. Mm -hmm. Like. It's intriguing. But anyway, yeah. Fairy Jesus. Fairy Jesus. Bread. Bread. So after a nothing fight, uh, we listen to someone gripe about the Queen, and we hear about the Tom Lynn, Gwen of the Sun, Tristan of the Witch Bow, and Lancelot the Light of the Lake. We are immediately bamboozled and have to have a team meeting, or we info dump on Atoria. Arrow 404, Atoria not found. Yes. Da Vinci just blowing Castoria's mind right now. Mm hmm. Love this effect, by the way. <laughs> I do believe they actually have the uh, free, the frozen sound. The, the ch yeah, just the. I love it. Uh, turns out the Tamlin have been around for over 100 years, but that begs the question: How did Morgan know about proper human, proper human history all that time ago? Not entirely yeah. sure. We do have towns that same that share the same name as Britain, but maybe they were around before. I don't know. And there's, there, we'll circle back to it. Uh, I think that'll technically be next week because that's not until way later. Because, uh, hey, semi spoilers. But uh, we're going up to section five. Uh, Tamlin Lancelot will not actually appear in the story in that time period. Um, it, it I've, interesting enough, she's kind of held back and, and hyped up as a character. So, uh, but she says some stuff we're probably going to come back to in a week or so. Mm -hmm. About. Also, at some point in here, they talk about what Babo's kill streak is like. It's like, an it, it's bad. Yeah, I just put I just wrote Jesus Christ, Baba, what a kill streak! Like she has killed a lot of people. I'm also not entirely sure where this note was. Like I said, my notes were a little loosey goosey, but they're arranged in roughly chronological order. I think it's the point you're going to talk about, so I'll save my joke there. Uh, actually, no. This is a good lead-in because uh, b basically my note that that we can jump off from is I just wrote in my notes fetch quest. Woo -hoo! <laughs> also, this takes on a different meaning. Yes, we be doing fetch quests. We be doing fetch quests. Well, yeah. No, the whole basis of this thing is we're just running around doing odd jobs to make money and get information. But after this, uh, Tristan and uh, Art. Man, I put Altria again here. Weird. Chris and Artoria have a moment. Basically, Artoria wants to know what. What King, you know, what King Arthur was light in. Tristan regales her with tales. 
also gives her some encouragement. So after completing... <laughs> So, so after completing some Oberon quest, TM, we have a visitor in our room. It's Coral, and she informs us about a human ranch where a human was taken a few days ago. We have to go tonight, though, so we are off like a shot in the dark. We got to go. We got to go. We, got to we meet up with our guides, and they are human, and they don't like us too much. And like Aurora, way too much. They tell us of a human as strong as a Tamlin, Percival of the White Light. Apparently, Morgan had offered to make them a Tamlin, but he refused and took up arms with the Rebel Army. Yes, and specifically, he was. Uh, she offered him this job because he was an equal of Tamlin Lancelot. He uh, bested her in a joust. So that's very interesting. Mm. Um, and also, shout out to Morgan. Would have taken him as one of her knights. Sounds very open-minded for, you know, this weird, cold, oppressive lady we keep being told about. So we make it to the ranch, but they basically call the ranch a factory, but make it look like a town so it doesn't affect human creativity. It's very weird. They also mentioned a breeding season. This it's is a little. It's a little model village. It's a little creepy, is what it is. Yeah. Listen, I'm not here to kick shame Morgan. <laughs> well, I might be actually. Hold on, I haven't actually met her yet. We might need to have some conversations. But yes, no, it's weird. It's weird. This, this lost belt is very icky. Very no no. So we try to infiltrate, but disguising a surveillance familiar as a streetlight? That's pretty smart. Okay, there must be a lot of streetlights here at this human ranch. Yeah, this, my no, my no, no version of this is just Ace Christ, there's a lot of street lamps here. <laughs> I thought, oh, we'll have to fight a street lamp. What's that like? Nine hundred. There's uh, ninety-nine enemies remaining. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they do at least justify it in story after the fact. Da Vinci is like, ah, there must be a fairy nearby somewhere just making these familiar. There was. There was. But as you said, we point out the fairy. Is that a Tam Lin? No, it's just a new mob. This is the fairy knight. Apparently Morgan likes chess. No, that makes sense. There is a, a common variant of uh, house rules of chess are called fairy chess, so. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Well, we take that down, too, but three take his place, so, oh no, we have to flee. Oh wait, no we don't. The cavalry is here. The rebel army is here to help and rescue the humans. While that goes on, though, we need to go. We need to make sure Mash is here, so it's time for Tori to show off her lockpicking skills. And by show off, I mean show off how bad she is at it. I believe they said there was like something like thirty of them, and the Rebel Army got through all all got through twenty nine of them before they got through hers. And you know, just to make matters worse, had to open up that one as well. Yeah. But everything well, is. That said, you know, the the, in, the intervention was very timely. We were saved by the bell. This Artori is a lucky child. Clearly, clearly. Look at look at all look at all look at all these people. They're passing out blankets. People are happy that they are freed. Everything's going well. Scratch that. Everything is foo and on fire. Actual Tam. Not worse. <laughs> Actual Tamlin Gwen is here, and she is hot. As in people turning into ashes around her. Yeah, my notes for this were just. Did Fairy Gwen just reduce those guys to atoms? That's what it looks like. She already knows who we are, and that's not good. But the queen wants us captured alive for some reason? Uh, my initial impressions of her, while Tamlin Gwen is cold and ruthless, she isn't cruel. She doesn't seem to be playing around or getting a kick out of it. This is just her job, and she is going to do it the best way she knows uh, she can. Yeah, so. she even, at the start of the fight, even holds back from using her full power because she was ordered not to destroy the human ranch. So mm. she's like, I could just blow you up, but that's not what I've been told to do. Yes. So we have a fight, and she is too strong and sucks up our command seals. Giggity. So we can't fight her, we have to escape. 
Uh, Tristan decides to take one for the team and hold him back, and we see Tristan, our lovable dork, become Tristan the Badass. He speaks about the Serpent's view of death, and he even gets a couple badass lines before he gets an in-battle CG. Alas, he does not make it. Yeah, my, my first note here was, wow, a CG in animation. It's like Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I don't want to undersell this here. Uh, to, to repeat what at least one of our Discord users phrased about, this is real king shit here. <laughs> uh, he does technically job, but, you know, the man said he'd lay his life down for me, and he stuck to his guns to the very end, and he probably left Tamlin Gawain with some stuff to think about. Yep. Like, he, he he went out there doing his best. Also, honestly, I think it's for the best. He retired from this story now. Future spoilers, if he actually met Tamlin Tristan, I think Tristan would have exploded. Yes. It's just better he doesn't have to see that shit. Mm-hmm. Take a lap, King. <laughs> just thinking of Tristan running around a fucking athletic field, arms held high. Woo! <laughs> We, we dump the Gatorade over Merlin, because, you know. <laughs> um, also, I do want to say, I didn't realize this till later, but I'm personally glad that the seal suck isn't actually permanent. <laughs> After you get Yeah, that, that seems to be the general vibes. I think I said in the pregame, I'm like, I don't actually know if it's permanent or not. It just says that she removes your, commands, your command seals, so. Yeah. Mm. No, I looked later. They're back. I was like, oh, thank God. But we try to make our escape, but unfortunately, the Queen's army is hot on our heels. Luckily, Oberon shows up to bail us out on Red... Rabbit? Red Rabbit. Or just in my notes, I wrote in all caps, Red Rabbit. Who is pulling a carriage and is most definitely not a horse. Apparently, it is illegal to force people to be burdened, but it's okay if they're okay with it. Uh, also, I believe during this ending monologue uh, somewhere with uh, Tamlin Gawain, we get a, we do a big hype of Tamlin uh, Lancelot. Ah, uh, yes. Basically saying, like, if she was here, it would have been over completely. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we start that hype cycle. We start building. Um, train. I do also want to say this is another point in um, Gawain's uh, temperament. Uh, the fairies are afraid that she will just, like, you know, explode and instantly kill the dude. But she's just like, no, you're right. But mind your words. Like she's a good doggo. Yeah. She also says that um, at having, you know, basically failed and fucked it up, she's like, okay, card off the rest of these humans. I'm going to eliminate the rest of the rebel army. I will go back to Camelot and I will explain to her majesty about how it's all my fault that I blew up her human ranch and let them get away. And mm -hmm. I will take whatever she has to, to deal out. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the, the dog comparisons are very apt. She is very, you know, loyal to her master right or wrong kind of a thing mm -hmm. it's just like nope this is what i'll do and from there we go to fragments too we we run into the three goblin brothers except they're not all brothers uh rob is the older brother wag is the younger brother and winky is the unsavory friend apparently mash has charmed the hearts of these three goblins and they seem less inclined to sell her to just anyone but they talk about various things before moving on to Gloucester? Yeah, Gloucester. Gloucester. Gloucester seems to be I a can't si spell Gloucester off the top of my head, but I can say it. <laughs> uh, Gloucester seems to be the city of get whatever you want, headed up by Murian. We also learned that apparently the queen was attacked by an assassin that almost did the job. More on that later. We speak about the Tamlin and who how Gwen is the most feared, Tristan the most hated, and Lancelot the most beautiful. Again, hyping up this girl. Also, I want to say this. In other words, I know exactly what type of girl these goblins like, especially because they're so keen on Murian. I think they like their girls small. <laughs> but yes, I also wrote, wrote down that comparison because it's very interesting. As we say, Gawain the most feared, but Tristan the most hated. Correct. Mm -hmm. They get attacked, and Mash steps up the bat to defend them all, and I have to ask, when will our playable Mash get AoE attacks, hmm? We I don't get... know, but in my notes, I just wrote this down as Awaken my Kohai! <laughs> like, this is, this is where we start getting for real Smash energy, and it's good. Mm, it's not gonna be enough. <laughs> 
Um, seeing Vash's strength, they wonder if she may be the child of prophecy, a, a fact that excites both Wab and Rog. But Winky seems worried about this with, with the additional tension it'll bring, and says an interesting line. Even lies have a way of coming true. Yeah, lies have a funny way of becoming true. Uh, I want to know what fairy tales Nasu digested for this, because this Lost Belt story is so on point. That is such an appropriate thing to say in this context. Uh, there's also another thing I want to bring up, because they explain these, these fairies a little bit. Uh, apparently, Morgan claims that she and all of her kingdom are the Seelie, and the Unseelie court are the Wild Fae. Very interesting break there. Mm -hmm. uh, because in traditional folklore, well, not necessarily the, the, the good and the evil courts, the Seelie are supposed to be the more reputable, civilized court who, you know, uh, often associated with summer, they, you know, uh, play by the rules. They try not to trick you too much. They try and, you know, uh, if you give them something, they will give you something back in return. The Unseely are much more, uh, much more cutthroat, much more, you know, opportunistic, more predatory, uh, often associated with winter. And it's kind of interesting that despite the way that a lot of the clans under her banner act, like I said, Morgan seems to be explicitly calling herself and her followers Seely. Very interesting. So yeah, that's that's the bulk of Fragment Two. That's the bulk of Fragment Two. So we move on to Section Four, Gloucester. What's this? There are three peddlers that found the fairy with an iron weapon near the nameless wood. We know a person like that. Red Rabbit's got to throw down for some odd. <laughs> Red Rabbit's got to throw down for some odd reason, reason, and I do love that Arturia before fight just goes carrots. But uh, we fight, um, fight Red, Red Red. <laughs> I just like calling him Red Rabbit. Red Rabbit. He's a lightish red horse, everybody. Because we we somebody talks about being whisked away by a white horse, and then there's a beat, and he's like, he's a lightish red horse, okay? He's a whitish shade of red. Um, something else that I found slightly amusing, um, after the battle, he, uh, Red Rabbit talks about how he never broke a speed limit ever, and I'm just like, there are speed limits in Fairy Britain? Lightish red hair obeys all traffic laws. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get an overlook of Oberon fashion, and Arturia cannot be handled being teased. Kessaria's other kink is maids. <laughs> Oberon reveals that Morgan's objective, uh, objective is that she is gathering magical energy in order to overwrite proper human history with, with Fairy Britain. This is probably what the existence tax is. Also probably bad. Probably bad, yeah. Might have something to do with that whole, you know, collapse of the Earth. That's going to happen. Probably. Something like that. But while that happens, meanwhile at the villain's social, Yas Queen Slay. Or as I wrote in my notes, meanwhile at the Legion of Doom. What, you thought that joke was done just because Morgan blew up Olympus? No. Do it again. I think they even used some of the same music for the Cryptor readings here. Also, Morgan, quality interior decoration, has a giant chair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do want to say I find it hilarious. Even after we summon her, she keeps that chair. Mine. Pretty good chair. I like how she whips it out in her skill animations. But we have a round of introductions. We meet the six heads of the clan. Lord Spriggan of the Earth Clan, Lord of Norwich. Lord Woodrose of the Fainclads, Lord of Oxford. Lady of Aurora of the Wing Clan, Lady of Salisbury, who actually wasn't introduced. No, we just know who she is. Mm -hmm. Lady Marion of the Wing Clan, the Lady of Gloucester. Side note: Who is this little pepperon? I hope I, I hope it's who I think it is. I also hope these things. Mm -hmm. Lady Nagrabia of the King, uh, of the King Clan, Lady of Edinburgh, absent, and Lady Ansel of the Mirror Clan, Guardian of the Lake District. Absent. I find it interesting that she specifically is guardian of the Lake District. Seems interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, is let me let me double check. The Lake District is obviously a, a district mm -hmm. in uh in Britain. I don't know if there's like an iconic city, 
but there should be. Yeah, that's close to Lancaster. Uh, Keswick is actually in the center. It's also near Carlisle, so it is it is definitely well. Like I said, there's not necessarily an iconic central city uh, of there. Like th there's still some notable towns in the Lakes District, so it is definitely probably a point that she is not specifically associated with a township. Uh, also, the Lakes District really beautiful. Lots of lakes and also mountains. And uh, leftover Roman forts. Oof. So we move on with the meeting, and Tamlin and Tristan, when I said slay, I did not mean that literally and without warning. It is easy to see almost immediately why Tamlin and Tristan is the most hated. Thankfully, we have Tamlin Gwen with the interference. Give the dog some hand pats. She reports on the situation, including all of all, uh, including our involvement. Apparently, Beryl Gut has informed people of our coming. That said, my I couldn't resist writing in my notes. Shit, Oberon, this is why you shouldn't be telling people about it. <laughs> Camelot knows the game is afoot. Pun not intended. But yeah, no, it's it's like it it. I don't know which came first, you know, chicken and egg shit, but Oberon has supposedly been chilling for a while, so it's kind of like, maybe we shouldn't be out here talking about all the stuff we do. But, alas, alas, they know. Mm -hmm. uh, Babo does slay. <laughs> uh, we speak of Artoria escaping from Wood Rose, and Tamlin Tristan does not seem happy to be compared to her. Apparently, they both use Magecraft, and both have been referred to as Morgan's daughters. Very interesting, by the way, again, thematically, for reasons we'll uh, be getting into uh, a little later down the line. Gloucester is a very thick chapter. Um, but yeah, they the phrasing ends up being daughter, even though obviously with this being, we, we elaborate that we're pretty sure that Castoria is this world's Artoria Pendragon. Obviously, in, in you know, uh, the, the classic, you know, mythology, Morgan and uh, Arthur are you know, siblings. It is kind of interesting to hit that point of, like, just, that's how fairies compare it. Mm -hmm. Apparently, things are not as held together as they would seem. Apparently, the North is waiting for the South to show weakness so that they can invade. Hence, they are unable to send trips to Norwich in, in order to deal with the Calamity. In this discussion, Morgan says that she will use the Water Mirror to destroy the Calamity and give one-third of the proper human history of Flotsam and the Western Treasury to help rebuild. Something Spriggy there seems to be excited about. I guess our trash is their treasure. New and exciting things that can't be found on the island? He is from Norwich, which is the tech place, so yeah, probably. They speak of evacuating citizens, but none of them seem, wants to seem to move for one way or another. But no one seems particularly bothered about this fact. Not until at least Barrel Good shows up and says that he'll take them in. And immediately everyone says, fuck this guy, one guy in particular, and offers AIDS. Yeah, so my my, my like my thought process in the scene is like, so Barrel introduces himself. He owns the slaughterhouse because of course he does. And then he starts talking with, with Tamlin Tristan. I'm just like, ugh. He and Tamlin Tristan have cutesy nicknames for each other. Barf, kill him now. I shudder at Lady, Lady Spinel and Red Barrel. Ugh, they are such that couple. Ugh. Note how I don't say kill me now. Kill him. Get rid of him first. This will solve uh, the problem. But then, like, apparently a lot of the clan leaders agree because Spriggan and Woodwoods immediately reverse course rather than have Barrel do anything. <laughs> They're like... They, they are completely non-committed to, like, actually organizing any kind of evacuation, uh, though Aurora, like, offers her hospitality. But the moment Beryl steps in, they're like, no, nope, none of that. None of that. Ugh. Ugh. So, BG there calls themselves Morgan's first ever uh, boyfriend, but I'm going to go with the head counting that he doesn't even know what intimacy is. Unfortunately, this goes on as we learn that Tamlin Tristan wants to complete the Oyakodon, and I am shuddering at this. But Beryl talks about how once someone has something, others can lose interest, which I think talks about his character a lot. I also think that, uh, in general, kind of like Tamlin Tristan, Beryl is just, as we say later, a fuckboy. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I, I'm fairly certain he, he makes these claims about like, oh, I'm the future king of England. I'm, I'm Morgan's spouse. Because he knows that it is going to really grind the gears of certain fairies. And he's basically, he is doing the eternal taunt stance of just like, come at me, come at me, bro. You mad? You mad, bro? Like, I, I, that seems to be his thing. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I also put in my notes, which many other people have replicated, Beryl is truly our dark mirror. We must destroy him before you can get any more waifus. Mm -hmm. We must remove him. Remove. Yeah, Morgan truly does not seem to give a single fuck either way, so... Yes, um, as by my point here, Morgan ignores this talk to talk about how her plan is to take over the planet, and the clans will die if the CERN has the foundation. I'm getting this feeling that while fairies are concerned with death, it's more something like an annoyance than a full stop. Yeah, that definitely becomes, I think, a little more clear later, but we're mm -hmm. we're ap rapidly approaching that exposition. But yeah, in general, um, I feel like Morgan's really rocking her Dark Queen Evil Overlord management style by basically doing going out of her way almost to do nothing to stop our heroes at least in this present time well yeah because we go on to say here um morgan wants us captured alive because she wants to ask us something and you know clearly have tea yeah. and which but just like like her her focus is so hands off it's very interesting like she doesn't rebuke like and it's just in general too like she doesn't actually rebuke tamlin Gwen for the things it's like no, you did great. You did great at Sheffield, so whatever. You know, I'm gonna blow up Norwich. It's all good. No, we're not gonna. We're not gonna make more humans. We're not gonna get more. We're not gonna build up the army. Everything is fine as is. Yeah, and there's also like I think a point of like where some of the others discuss like they again they bring up that point like oh well why didn't you send uh, you know uh, Tamlin Lancelot to just hunt those guys down and destroy them if you really wanted them gone. And I think that's where she brings up, like, no, I want to make sure I want to capture it alive. I need to ask them about something. I need to have a conversation. And it's just, like, it's weird. It's a little weird, yeah. It's also, it's also, I mean, I think I understand why Beryl is the way he is. This is a good point to bring up something that's very interesting um, that some people in our chat have noticed and is not going to be resolved in these first uh, ten parts, so I'm pretty sure we can discuss it a little. So Beryl's a cryptor, right? Right. He's a master. He claims to be Morgan's master either now or later. Uh, definitely later. I know the uh, part that where he does. Oh yeah, yeah. I think it's technically it might be a technically I think it's a flashback from here, but yeah, it's it's later in the in the actual text body. Um, but Morgan has been ruling this lost belt for two thousand years, so unless the timey is really whimy, that doesn't work out. Um, so I. I I have a sneaky suspicion that uh, Beryl either never actually summoned a servant, because remember, uh, the cryptors summoned their servants in the Lost Belts. That is the thing they did all the way back with the Lost Belt 1. This is how it happened. Um, so either he never got around to summoning his servant in this Lost Belt, or he may have already lost his servant and Morgan just took his command spells, basically, because that is a thing casters can do, we know. Uh, so, like... I understand probably why... Well, one, he's having fun. Like, he doesn't give a shit about stuff. Um, but... Also, like... He doesn't have the normal master relationship. Like... Morgan doesn't really seem... Fussed. You know, doesn't seem nettled about, about way too many things. I feel like if Beryl tried to, like... Drop a command spell on her... She would just be like, no. I just, like, punt him into the pit. There is a giant pit outside. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have a giant pit outside of Camelot. It's super cool. Yeah, it's so great. No one comes back from it. <laughs> Again, a bit, then we discuss later. Not right now, but later. But yeah, so there's a... Uh, as always, I love our asides with our quote-unquote villains, our antagonists. Mm -hmm. And th this is just as world-building as all. But yeah, there's, there's quite a lot going on here. Yep. Uh, Tamla and Tristan has something called the Infinity Mirror that would let her find us real fast, but Mother doesn't want her involved with this. This leads to an argument between uh, Gwen and Tristan, and turns out that Tamla and Gwen is just a pure girl looking for love and might just be a bit too eager about it. Yeah, they have a have a discussion where like Tristan is like, "Oh, maybe you could teach me about the ways of of love," you know? Your type and Gwen is just like teeth grinding sound, and Tristan is like. No, no, I understand. You mean it honestly every time. You just can't help yourself. Um, but also, yeah, uh, this again, talking about our management style, Morgan is once again very hands-off with her, her Tamlins, her favored knights. Like, 
you know, they they act very full Mean Girl Posse here. Um, Gawain has a big appetite, obviously, but like seems to be mostly on the up and up. Again, chaotic good. Uh, and Tristan is exactly the kind of spoiled brat you'd expect from Morgan's. I put in notes here, adopted daughter. That, that becomes much more clear later. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then Taylor Lancelot is completely absent on the screen from this section, but is clearly the favorite knight. Like everybody understands, she is the best assist and the strongest. Knight. But she's just not here. Uh, this is not the kind of like camaraderie and equality you would expect from the people named after the Round Table Knights, right? Right. You know, the whole point of the Round Table is that none, nobody was sitting at the head; they are all equals. That is not how Fairy Camelot works. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot. So after that little tiff, Tamlin Tristan returns to her room of heels and talks about how Beryl is having gladiatorial games that no one actually wins. But she is stressed and needs to go shopping. Plus, there's a special offer. So off she goes to Glockster. Speaking of, we're about to arrive there. We talk about Mirren and what fairies are. But Omega, I'll let you explain this part. Yes, in my notes, this starts with just fairy facts, all capital letters. Okay, fairies are spirits. Generally, understand we use the capital S spirit in the Nasuverse. When you see somebody say, like, heroic spirit, divine spirit, etc., fairies are spirits, capital S. Some are actually degraded divine spirits. They used to be gods, but became something else. Others might be human or animal spirits that are left over, basically, you know, not completely uh, assimilated into the world, and wrapped in some mystery. So, yeah, a, a fairy cat, for instance, might actually just be, like, the spiritual pers personification of a cat that gets wrapped in a legend. Neither of these are actually pure fairies, as explained by Oberon. Real fairies are called Great Mothers or Great Fathers. They are born from the planet. They are effectively divided spirits, Bunre, of Gaia, of the embodiment of the Earth. So they are extensions of the planet. This is how fairies have previously been described in Nasuverse. They are meant to be actual, like, the sensory organs of the planet to kind of feel itself out. Uh, they are also sometimes called A-rays. So Oberon explains about Morgan in proper human history. She is a... Uh, human fairy hybrid. So she it was born, a, you know, a normal human girl, but inherited the authority of the great mother who gave Arthur Excalibur. That's Vivian is her given name in Nazifers. There's a couple different ways to write it, but yeah. So uh, this explains some stuff, for instance, why Excalibur Morgan is called Excalibur Morgan. So there's some, you know, interesting things going back on there. Uh, Ares basically generate their own realms, fey domains, they're called. Uh, somebody earlier has been talking about Marble Phantasm. I do not know if it, that is explicit comparison, because that's not the phrase used, but given some things we're going to talk about in a second, that is probably in the same vein, yes. Um, they also generate their own descendants, aka terminals, on their own. Uh, probably similar to how the uh, Olympus deities, the, the Atlantean gods, generated their own terminals, right, once mm -hmm. upon a time. So just by existing, a great fairy, uh, you know, great mother, great father produces extra fairy shit. They have their own territory, they produce descendants, they gather mana from the planet directly. Uh, da Vinci specifies that the phrase A-Ray is a local term. Um, this is a notes reference. Uh, that was one of the names for uh, super-evolved humans in the, the you know, post apocalyptic future was A-Rays, so it's, it's just a cute reference. Uh, she says we would call them elementals or true ancestors in proper human history terms, like Python. So, yeah, um, you know, uh, true ancestors and elementals are, are basically the equivalent of these great mothers and great fathers. This probably explains a little that has always been unclear about true ancestors in uh, Fate and in, in Tsukihime works. Like, it, it's not necessarily like, you know, uh, Ark, for instance, or the other uh, true ancestor type vampires are out there, like, necessarily literally infecting everybody or, or having descendants the normal way, though some of them do seem to do that but also just their presence seems to shape the world around them, and lots of big, scary fairies are like that originally. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. And then, of course, uh, I have a personal selfish note, but if only we could summon forth our own elemental Pison from the throne, wouldn't that make an interesting conversation to have right about now? Mm -hmm. Alas, alas. Honestly, Technically, from the end of LB3, we don't know when she's going to arrive at the throne, but, you know, nonlinear time. I... I'm gonna be real. I am slightly upset that we do not get to drag around Pison through through the main story, since you know she was a part of it. Yeah. 
she's part of the story and she like it's one of the rare cases where we can absolutely literally just summon her up and she's so mad about it but also she, literally she would have input on this in, on this information because she is an elemental you know being a genren immortal she is this same type of being but yeah so there's there's your fairy facts um and uh, uh, this is not in my notes, but somewhere in there, Oberon is talking about how the because he's using this to explain some stuff we're about to talk about with Gloucester uh, and Murian's fairy domain. But uh, you know, Murian as as a clan head is supposed to be a very powerful fairy, the equivalent of an A ray. But a lot of the lesser fairies are not. They are the like we said, the divine spirits and the uh, the nature, you know, the animal and. Uh, human spirits that get kind of wrapped up in mystery. Mm. This also probably explains that convergent human history thing we talked about earlier, because some fairies are just, you know, folklore rappers on spirits that, again, because folklore exists, they get to be there. Oh yeah, fairy facts, TM. Fairy facts, TM. So, an, an interesting point that came up through all of that, which kind of avoids uh, King Arthur and uh, Morgan, is that King Arthur fought to preserve humanity, you know, make a world for humanity, while Morgan fought to preserve mystics. It's clear to see which one will win, win considering our timeline is not called, you know, proper mystic history. Yeah. Um, but it does turn out that Mirian has a fate domain that basically brings everyone down to level one. Um, the way they put it is, you can only come in with the strength that you were born with, which yes, all, I all strength uh, achieved through training is uh, negated. Which personally, I find a little weird because I don't know. I've run into a lot of dudes that were, you know, born of you know, like like things. Like, are all fairies like born with like just like strength of like one? Wouldn't like some of the fan clan just naturally be stronger than others? Like, I don't know. Yeah, probably, but it, it seems like any level of training or dedication. They do also talk about, by the way, how this used to be different. Apparently, um, Murian tried the, the old inversion method where the weak are strong and the strong are weak, but that was also too chaotic. Mm -hmm. So it's just everybody is a flat scale. Except for probably Murian herself, because um, Oberon says at one point, the more uh, someone tries to enforce a rule, the more likely they are to be the sole obsession to it. Plus, it's her fairy domain. It's her fairy domain. But it turns out only her and Nakrabia have one. We do not know which uh, Nakrabia has, though. So we enter the city of Gloucester, and it is chaos. But is it time for a date? I guess. No one seems opposed to this. Yeah, I just wrote this in my notes. Oberon, did you just take my Da Vinci on a date? She didn't seem that opposed to it. She wants to go to a museum. Maybe find a painter. Also, Arturia takes this moment to talk about herself. Also, I'm going to be real, Arturia. We only know of, like, two others can, you, who can use Mage Cast, so of course you can brag about it. Arturia is just a humble country girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When she's not straight up murdering people, Tamlin Tristan seems like kind of a, just a snob a rich girl. She... Mm. Oh, wait, did I put this in the wrong space? Oh, I double... Yeah, you wrote this originally, and I think you uh, skipped down over it. This is technically later. Uh, we, we have our first incident, which is in my notes marked as just, These are not mice. Because somebody calls out and like, Oh no, my mice are escaping. Oh yeah, okay. So I saw this. So wondering while... Okay, so sorry, I fixed it. While wondering what to do, someone accidentally releases our mice in some general vicinity and refer to the story of the Straw Millionaire. For those who don't know, the Straw Millionaire is a story about a fool who prayed for wealth and starting from a piece of straw traded up until he was a millionaire. And same as Omega, I said, these are not mice. Excuse you. Yeah, even though I did the pregame, this one still hit me because I, I'm pretty sure I saw in the notes that it said, like, oh yeah, you gotta fight a couple waves of dragons. But I was like, ah, it'll probably be wyverns or something, and I didn't just put any stock into it. And then just the lead-up of the story of, like, oh no, my pet mice! And then you're just like, dragon! And I'm just like, what? <laughs> Artoria does at least explain it. She reminds you that she said, remember, it's Gloucester. Uh, things that are close or far away, things that are small, etc. So, yeah. Mice are huge dragons. Dragons are tiny mice. Wild. Wild. Yeah, I don't know why I put that out of order. 
I was probably because uh, I... I think that's where you started writing your notes at 4 and then did your whole big rewrite. Yeah. Because I remember your comment about uh, Tamlin Tristan being there even before I got to this point in the story. So I think it was just you wrote it very early. Right. But our reward is a coupon to a famous store. An actual surprise. It's useless. Apparently the store got bought out and is getting replaced with a new one. So once again, we have no idea what we're going to do. Enter. Yes, my, my favorite phrase here is, I have obtained the plot coupon. As in that all that coupon did was advance the plot. <laughs> we meet up with a snobby rich girl who we don't know is Tamlin Tristan. But us, the audience, we know is Tamlin Tristan. And when she is not straight up murdering people, Tamlin Tristan seems just to be a snobby rich girl. One that Artoria thinks that they could have been friends with? Of course she is going to the ocean and we can and she likes to rub our face in it. This also might be to my superhuman aura of getting along. Not entirely yeah, sure. My, she, she, uh, Babo does say like, why am I being so nice to you? I, I, normally I would fucking like eat your eyeballs or something. Whatever. Um, but yeah, no. Um, she definitely has those like mean girl vibes as in the movie Mean Girls where it's like Obviously, she is a terrible fucking person. Mm -hmm. Mostly because she's not a person. She's a fairy. But, like, e even among fairies, her sole existence, her raison d'etre, seems to be gremlin. Chaos. It's probably why her first skill is called Grimalkin, a.k.a. Fairy Cat. Um, so, she's not, like, normally seen as a positive influence on anybody, but also... Because she's not really, like, committed to anything, she's not necessarily, like, I don't know. Like, e even when she causes suffering, it's nothing personal for the most part. It's just how she has fun, so, like... It's weird. Yeah. It's like that blue and orange morality kind of thing going on there. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, and I think Artoria herself, of being a native of this law school, understands, like... Yeah, no, you know, we could have... You know, been doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. But she goes off, and we don't know what to do, and we move on. But later in the day, of course, Oberon has to take it to the auction. Also, 70 million in fake fairy bucks. Yeah, I wrote this down. I think this point encapsulates several things that happened here where I'm like, Oberon is still a fairy. Don't forget this. Yes, he's he's he is a faker, and he's got, you know, cheap ass cash. But also, uh, at this point, he talks about how. Like he really was was hoping to like um, with his fake money to to buy some like uh, unpublished work of Shakespeare or some some artwork or something. And Da Vinci at some point is just like, don't don't worry about. It. I'll paint you a portrait later. And he's like, really? Hell yeah! Because he's a fairy too. He he wants that that you know uh, milk of human creativity. Mm -hmm. So the auction is about to begin, and we see several people entering it. <laughs> Um, I find it interesting that they used uh, servants um, for this, except there was one that looked quite different from all the others. We go through the auction. Um, this is where the point where um, Oberon mentions the unpublished work of Shakespeare, and we get to our final, our final um, item: the child of the child of prophecy. Behold, the child of prophecy, Maramasa prophecy, thirty percent. 30% chance he's real. 30 chance he's real. Grandpa is completely done with this. Yeah, I wrote in my notes, this child of prophecy, old man edition, is so tired. It's very <laughs> I do like, I do like it. It's not a choice. We just yell grandpa. Yeah. Oh, gee, John. Oh, gee, John. And he's just like, who said that? Oops. <laughs> Even though he's our enemy, we can't hate him. So we have to get him out somehow. Um, so we start the bidding war. And of course, Oberon using Artoria's name as the bidder seems like another move. Yeah, he, he used it under her name. Either because he's trying to drum up public or he doesn't want to get caught. Uh, I do want to say, when, when Castoria gets her angry little a little fang mouth and grasses at Oberon, I almost imagine like chewing on his shins or elbows or something out of frustration. <laughs> Maybe nibbling his wings just like... <laughs> just like, Oberon! <laughs> Like I said, like just chewing on his shin or something, and he just doesn't care. But yes, big bidding. Big bidding. 
Unfortunately, Artoria cannot restrain herself, betting everything plus more, none of which is heard, and immediately dies for the stage when called. Surprise! The other big bidder was Tamlin Tristan. I'm gonna say this out right now, Mirian is a fucking character just laying out everything. Basically, they have a moment where they have to say, who here is more worthy of winning this bid? Tamlin Tristan talks about how, you know, talks about how she, she's motherfucking Tamlin Tristan. And Miriam's be like, ah, yes, the such and such, you know, daughter of Morgan, wielder of Madcraft. But then just turns on a dime and just talks about how Artoria, you know, escaped from Wood Rose, kicked up a lot of people's ass, is the child of prophecy, and is accompanied by a human mage from another world. And people are just like, la gasp. And it's just like. Yeah, uh, uh, in, in my notes, I just wrote this down as, yo, Miriam, what the fuck? Yeah. She just, she just drops it. I'm just like, what? I do think it is important to note that while Tamlin Tristan, before all this happened, Tamlin Tristan did recognize us and was just about to let us off before Mirian interjected. I mean, of course, we weren't probably going to let that go, but I think it's important to note. Yeah, she was just like, oh, you're getting way over your head, country girl. Just get the fuck out of here. I don't care. I'm, you know, having too good of a time. Mm -hmm. But then her authority as mommy's bestest little babo was challenged. Mm-hmm. Again, a person is referring to this, a person is referred to as a star. I believe this was during Mirian's whole spiel, and yes, I am digging my heels in with this one. Now, since the scope of the deal has gotten too big, you gotta do things through might makes right. It's Artoria versus Tamlin Tristan, or country fairy versus city fairy up in here. Yeah, it kind of was like that. With everyone being level one, I don't actually know how impressive this fight was. Um, this is actually one of the scenes you see in the CM, and so I guess it was a little flashy, because it was Magecraft versus Magecraft. Yep. Reg regardless, Tamlin Tristan runs out of gadgets and loses, and she is not happy about this. It takes Miriam pulling the mother won't be happy for her to back off. Yeah, basically, you know, there's a lot of good lines here, you know. At one point, you know, Castori is like, I'll show you what comes from eating vegetables every day, you know? <laughs> um, and I think she drops the, it's a hundred years too soon for you to come at me kind of speech at the end here. Yeah, and she, goes, she gets real fired up is what I'm saying. But you do actually get to see that like, her her hard work at developing Magecraft really has paid off. Cause even when her potential to do Magecraft is reset all the way back to one, she still has all of her knowledge, right? Right. She's gonna be quote unquote strength. And she still has the Staff of Selection because she was born with that. So she has a good Magecraft tool and is able to keep her control and pull off some impressive spell work. I believe several of the characters in the audience actually say she did some impressive spells. Whereas Tristan is much more reliant on specific Magecraft tools she was given by Mother. And also I think later they imply that Beryl showed her how to make some, some tools as well. But still, like... She's very limited in her repertoire, and so she runs out first. This is shown in game by her getting stunned after a couple of turns. Um, and like, she's like, I've, "I've got more at home. I can run. I can literally run back right now and get it." And that's when Murray and it's like, mm. "But if you cause a scene, that'll reflect poorly on Morgan. She'll be happy about that, will she?" And Tamlin Tristan just basically is like, "Murray, and I'll remember this." And I just imagine Murray is like, "Yeah, I bet you will." <laughs> Uh, I think I think I wrote this in my notes here as well. Um, you, you know, you talk about her her uh, fucking off. I'm just like, do I get kill Bill Sirens? <laughs> there's some there's some good facial expressions. Um, several people have cottoned on to it, uh, but Castoria has a specific facial expression she adopts when she's really mad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, there's a couple of those shots of the sprites, and you're just like, Ooh, it's tense all of a sudden. Ooh. So, um, after all this, and, you know, everything's getting resolved, there is a mysterious person talking about how cool Artoria is. Sounds adorable. Muramasa is freed, and he is our enemy, but you know what? Grandpa is Grandpa. Or is that the way I phrased the same thought in my notes? Grandpa is Grandpa, don't you understand, Castoria? <laughs> Just, you know, he Grandpa. And for his part, Muramasa is the same way. It's like, yeah, we run in a few times. I don't hate him or anything. I'll even make you some tea. <laughs> Artoria is just like, how do you look so young but talk so old? 
Also, I'm with it. He's grandpa. Mm -hmm. By the way, if I had a nickel for every time there is a strange fairy that is strong and has an iron weapon but got lost in a nameless wood, picked up by palers and taken to Gloucester, I have two nickels, which is not a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. True facts. Our target men's is just killing Muramasa so offhandedly. She's like, oh, I guess he's got to die then. And you're just like, shit. But luckily she's into blacksmiths, her third kink. So it all balances out. Muramasa joins the party. Do do do. This time you actually do say that. We also get a little bit of a flashback here. Or flashback. Back, back. And we learn that the foreign god sent Muramasa into this lost belt to just Rambo Morgan. Yeah. Just like, was like, yes, go into that lost belt and kill that king. Goodbye. And it would have worked if Lancelot hadn't jumped him. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll phrase this as, God, I want to see this full thing animated. Because this is, a, this is a note. You never finished writing this, but you already said the back half of it. Oh. But this is technically in the CM. You do see a little bit of him flying over the pit. But it's just like, the way they describe this is like, he gets right up to the he point where he would have, I think he even phrased it as, he would have taken her head. But... He got blasted out of nowhere by Lancelot's speed, and they then had a mid-air battle over the pit, uh, where uh, she punctured his spirit core like 12 times, I think he said? Yeah. Uh, absolutely batman his ass into the hole. Uh, but because the foreign god gave him a lot of extra juice, he survived and managed to crawl out three days later. So, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty wild. Honestly, in general, by the way, I want to throw this up there. This is like my... Currently, this is like my number two behind Lost Belt 5 to be animated. Uh, possibly this will end up number one at the end of this. But, like, this, there's a lot of good scenes here. Mm -hmm. No, there's a scene... Oh, we won't get to it this week. But next week, there's a scene that I want to see animated so much. And th this is why we write notes. Yes. So we need to go meet Murian and um, panic scream. Sorry, BB themes gave me PTSD. Yeah, my note in here is just external screaming. <laughs> like the the note hits and they do the little snap intro and I'm just like, ah! <laughs> Listen, I love BB. I do not. I love BB. You never want surprise BB. Yeah, they said this was a surprise. Uh, you've actually got the, the deal on this one, though, so... Yeah. I'll let you, uh, you read that out. So, uh, Mirian gets an intro. Uh, fun point. This character made a lot of people that this was Kazra drop in this LB, but Nasa states in an interview it is actually the reverse. Since Mirian is one of the parts that makes up Kazra drop, it is actually Kazra drop that looks like Mirian, not the other way around. Uh... Um, Nasu, Nasu in this interview did kind of be like, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so basically to, to, to further expound, um, Murian is one, uh, uh or, uh, Khazra Drop is a, I should say is one of BB's high servants. Yep. So, uh, Murian is then officially one of the three parts that made her up. Just like how, you know, uh, Actually, it might not even be three. Sometimes it's more. But, you know, like how uh, Parvati and Melt are made up of the ingredients of several different servants. So, canonically, Murian is one of those elements. Um, so, curious. she has kind of, you know, in that line. Yeah, I think she's a little taller than she looks, but it's she's still pretty small. Uh, and, I've, like you said, a lot of people misunderstood this or even deliberately misinterpreted this as Kazra Drop being in there. I I remember all the fake rumors of like, oh, Beryl's servant is Kazra Drop. No. Not how it works. Um, But yeah, uh, technically this is basically kind of the reverse thing of something similar happened with um, King Protea. Uh, because King Protea is made up of an amalgamation of Earth Mother goddesses. Technically she is part Tiamat. Mm. And some of her later ascensions and her concept sketches have elements that ended up being used for Tiamat, but funnily enough, um, you know, it's kind of like back and forth and back and forth. Uh, like, obviously, we saw Tiamat before playable King Protea, but King Protea was playable before Tiamat, etc. So, it is kind of interesting how these design things go back and forth as uh, well. Looking up Khazra Drop, it doesn't actually say what her component spirits are. It just says Murian and two unknown goddesses. It might have been that before... Um, it might have been that before this, no one knew what made up, um, uh, made up, um, cause of Uh, drop. well, um, uh, shit, I'm forgetting the name, but, um, 
uh, foxtail. Uh, foxtail. The foxtail manga is still ongoing, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's where we got a lot of our extra information about the alter egos like KP, Kazura Drop, and Violet. So it may simply be that the manga hasn't actually discussed what makes Kazura Drop, Kazura Drop yet. This is presumably why outright Kazura Drop hasn't appeared, possibly along with Violet as well, because there's still an ongoing stuff. God, that's so weird to think about sometimes, right? It's it's a tangent, but like this is probably why a lot of a certain Strange Fate characters haven't come in, because they're just not finished being written, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and even the ones we get are kind of different. Like, um, the in-story Enkidu is actually the uh, Kyu, so it's, like, very different character-wise, though. The Summonal one is normal. Like, despite the fact of just how many different type moon Nasuverse things come out, um, there also still so many of them that are, like, in dev. It's wild. Fate is a big franchise, and it's kind of weird to think about yeah. sometimes. And we're coming up uh, next next year's the 20th for Fate Day Night. But also, that means that they've come this far in under 20 years. It's a big franchise. It is a big franchise. But yeah, so they hit the BB Channel theme, and this gave... Ev ev everybody got a shock for this one. <laughs> well, apparently Miriam wasn't acting like their usual self, and I just find it very weird that they decided to act more... She, she acted decided to act more... BBS than normal at this one particular moment. It's like she knows. Yeah. But they go back and forth a little bit, but eventually comes around to talking about the Child of Prophecy, and Miriam and Obron talk about how Altoria doesn't necessarily have that star power. But fortunately, we ain't here for that or the bell. We are just looking for our friend. Uh, Miriam kind of talks about how Morgan isn't doing anything to help Britain. Um, the fact that she says this seems odd to me. Morgan might not be kissing babies, but she's working on something and isn't letting chaos rule the land. Though, looking at how uh, Gloucester is, that might be what Murian wants. Yeah, I put in my notes here. Murian says she dislikes Morgan's rule because Morgan is quote-unquote excessively cruel. Obviously, she enforces the taxation system, the population control on humans, uh, li you know, limiting their expansion. She oppresses clanless fairies. I... Um, not sure what this oppression which, is. I'm gonna be real. Uh, well, they get murdered or they end up in the, the nameless woods, I think. Is, is that, that's, I'm pretty sure that's what's supposed to be. Those who are, like, denied clans or don't have clans. I really uh, don't no, think we've also, really talked about clanless, uh, though, at all. Like, it's all been uh, it's all been about the, the six clans. The unseelie are feral, so yeah. it's weird. Um, yeah. She uses the detritus of human history as her personal currency. So, again, uh, Murian seems to have economic effects. And I think the one that's actually the most important here is Morgan does seem to actively ignore calamities. They just keep coming, and she does nothing about them. So there's some of this that seems like positives, but some negatives. But keep in mind, all this is filtered us through this sassy lost child. Like, mm -hmm. um, Murian, especially as we find out way later, Murian may have her own reasons for these kinds of oppositions. And... Uh, actually, I guess that is technically true. Castoria is clanless. Some people think she might be Wind Clan, but they can tell that she's not. So, yeah, it's a little bit of oddball. But I'd, even so, that's very. That doesn't feel very oppressed. That just feels like people ignore this weird, you know, country girl with no uh, political power, right? I mean, yeah. So, yeah like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real. That's that's how it is in normal life. If you like, people get weird thoughts about people living in a city versus people living in the country. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think some of this is just her sales pitch. Remember, Gloucester is the city of fashion, but also seems to be like the most late stage capitalism city. Chaos. Everything is for sale here. So like her opinions on like wanting more humans and less taxes and wanting more resources, more money. It seems like it's her sales pitch to us. The only thing out of these that seem like directly actable is probably the Calamities effect. That is something that indeed Morgan does seem to actively ignore and not try to interfere with. But also a lot of fairies can't be arsed to do anything either. We talked about this earlier about how a lot of fairies have this like complex to be saved. Um, they got their own they shit They talk about this when talking about the Calamity in Norwich, right? Mm. Spriggan says, oh, I've told my people to evacuate. They just won't go anywhere. They think the Child of Prophecy is going to save them. Also, what the Calamities, like, Here's the thing. We know that there's that one calamity, and they appear like what was it like every hundred years? Hundred years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If all these calamities are like nothing being done about them, where are all the other ones? 
How'd those well, get? There are a couple of empty pits on the map, in addition to the pit pit. So yeah, there's there seems to be vibes. Yes, but yeah, there's a lot of political positioning. And again, the reason why Morgan doesn't do anything about Norwich is because Nakneria's out there, right? Yeah, like, it's. Again, everything in this story is so dense, so deep, and yeah. take no fairy at face value. Yeah. It's very... Again, going to that line, you won't know who was actually good until everything's said and done, and... Yeah. Like, oh, they... We haven't even hit the end of the first act here. <laughs> we are still in the exposition curve, right? Yeah. Like, honestly, other than our general pursuit of MASH, the Master doesn't know what the fuck they're doing in this Lost Belt at this point. Uh, nor does Castoria, either. Like... We don't really know what the, the arc of the narrative is yet. We're still trying to figure it the fuck out. But yeah, they 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 discuss about how, you know, uh, Artoria doesn't have the stuff. In my notes, I talk about this. We need to grind more. We have to do more MSQ, Castoria. Our item level isn't high enough. I chose a different one, and I said that she needs to hit the leveling roulette a few times. Yeah, no, no, we both have the same thought. She needs to fucking grind it up. But it is, it is like that. It's like oh I was yeah, playing, I was playing Final Fantasy fourteen at the time of writing this, so that's probably what was in like, my head. Yeah, no, you know, this, this says quest level sixty, Castoria. You're only fifty. We got, we got, or you can do this part. Oh, I'm slowly getting through. All. How many am I at now? Hang on, fifty-eight. Have I only done four? Did I have 62? Damn, okay. 63. Oh, I've done five. Okay. Well, some of them are slow. And this is why I don't like doing my rank ups. Oh, I had two done of phantoms. I'll just do that one for a quick outie. All right. All right. Atoria is once again called the Star of Hope. No, I won't let this go. And unlike it's funny, it's it's almost like the script was written with the idea it would be called a star sport, and then they changed it later. <laughs> unlike Barrow, all the fairy ladies actually want us. Suck it. Uh, Miriam introduces her friend, panicked but slightly into it. Scream. Ah, uh, yes, this is phrased as external screaming too. Koyan Boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> And no matter what anyone says, I will forever believe that I jumped at Vitch for having another new nap, another new outfit. Yeah, I wrote this down as, is the game implying I tried to lay hands on her for having a new costume? Because there's two dialogue choices here. Lucky and I both obviously went with the one that says <laughs> another outfit. But no matter which one you pick, Murray and acts like you tried to physically attack Koi and Skaya. So, yeah, I think the game is implying that we just tried to shake her down for, for picking up another new outfit. <laughs> Also, the master's already thinking about all the QP and mats they're going to have to exchange at the dress shop for this shit. I will say, though, if these two are friends, there is absolutely no way they're up to any good. Yeah. So we have a talk back and forth, and while initially it seems that Fitch is going to be with in our search for MASH, Oberon puts a quick kibash of that and makes his disgust loud and clear. Yeah, I just wrote this in my notes. It's like Oberon just says, hey, lady, hey. Fuck you. Basically what he does. He just points at her and says, I don't like your guts. Um, I do want to bring up before that actually comes around, though, because she's discussing whether or not she'll be available. Uh, Koyan once again specifically phrases that she is on of equal standing with the foreign god, in case you forgot who or what you are dealing with here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, apparently uh, our discussion did not go any further besides Oberon just flipping her the bird. Yep. I do believe See, uh, I do believe later they say, that was the coldest you need to leave, need to leave now I have ever heard. It's a, it's a little yep. weird. But um, before that happens, we just get some time between Mirian and Koenskaya. And it seems that they talk about how weird it was for Oberon to have that reaction, seeing that he only arrived two months ago. Uh, yeah. Though I, mm, I phrase this as uh, I feel like after all of this, I know too much about Koyanskaya. Mm-hmm. So like, we'll we'll discuss her her enumerated capacities in a second because like he's got the you know, a little later than me and he's got some intervening stuff. But like, I don't know. It is strange, obviously, for him to have that reaction. But considering that at least his story is that he is a proper human history servant who was summoned to kind of pave the way for us by the counterforce. I would presume him to have that kind of response to Koyanskaya, a.k.a. the treasured beast. 
Um, she's bad news bears. She is. She is a problem. She might literally be a bad news bear. I don't know. And he's just he's just not here to fuck with it. Then again, I don't Oh my god, how would you explain the the, the beast of humanity to the guys in this lost belt? I don't think you could. I don't You're know. telling me if somebody loves humans so much, they freak out and become a giant world-destroying monster? They tried to blow up time? Like, they, they like humans, but I don't... I don't know if I would say they love humanity in the genuine way that some of our beast candidates do, right? Right. I don't I don't think most fairies would understand this fucking relationship. So maybe Murian doesn't understand what Koyan deal is. Well, Oberon also does point it out to Murian, you know, it's all like she's like he's like, girl, if you trust me ever on anything, get away from her. And Mirian's just like, I don't get it. But after that, they talk about how weird it was, and it turns out that Queen Sky is looking for information on the Fey area. She is looking for the bonic beast to incorporate into her, and uh, mentions that she can have up to nine big ones. Apparently, she has five tails. Yes, yeah, specifically, she phrases it as she has the power to control and replicate demonic beasts and can incorporate them into her body, basically her Saint Graph. She has a capacity of, quote-unquote, nine big ones. And she explicitly phrases that later as she has five tails. She was actually looking for her sixth tail in this lost belt, but uh, appears not to be able to find that one. Mm -hmm. And I take it back. Apparently, she doesn't like me, and she is just playing to the side so she can come out on top. Gee, I'm so surprised. Yeah, uh, in my notes, in italics, I wrote this as, Oh no, the one that looks like BB is a selfish trickster? Whomst would have guessed? What was that sound? Sounds like a moth taking off. So I haven't oh, been. Yeah, I, uh, th this is also earlier why I wrote, uh, you know, that stuff she said is about Morgan is according to Murray. And <laughs> again, don't don't take anybody at face value, okay? Yeah. So, uh, haven't been kicked out. We figure out Marian's plan almost immediately. Turns out we were not. We are not as gullible as would first appear. We have a small heartwarming moment with the lower class fae giving gifts to the child of prophecy. Muramasa seems to be thinking about something here. Well, it's too dangerous to be wandering around right now, so it's time to go hide in the Welsh woods, Oberon's domain. It is becoming secret forest. <laughs> it's becoming increasingly clear that we are moving according to Oberon's timetable, and it's kind of weird. Yeah, that's another thing I should say. We talked about this. There. If if you if you started quoting you know all the worlds of play to Oberon, he would be like, yeah, no shit. Like I feel like like Oberon feels like the character who knows all the stage notes ahead of time, and like he's just trying to put us all in our places, right? Right. And it's it's weird because he's not he doesn't explain to us he has the script notes, right? Right. But he, he does, and he understands there's some shit going on here. Um, I think it's like he's not in. Go ahead, finish. It's like he's treating everything like it's a giant stage play and we're all the actors in it with our lines and reads and stuff. Yeah, I don't think this is too big a spoiler to do, but he does explicitly in a conversation later talk to us about how he doesn't think um, himself or us, the master, is the the protagonist of this story. He doesn't outright say it's Kestori in that line, but I'm pretty sure he's implying it. Oh, yeah. But he still says that we have important roles to play in the story. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah, he's really treating it like this this is a stage play and everybody has to hit their marks but also he's not in complete control of the timing because later some stuff we're going to get into um makes it very clear that there are some miscommunication some missed timing here mm -hmm. uh and also before we go uh this is a future omega note uh, but i thought i just had i just realized that be uh, the way gloucester shook out that meant that the two wad arco designs from this story are hanging out <laughs> that's true because she, she obviously Wadarko drew uh, Coin Skaya's new version, but also drew Murian. So, uh, and as usual, they you know recruit a lot of their artist buddies. We talked already about you know Oberon's artist, the artist for uh, uh, Coral and Aurora. I'm not sure if we know the artists for some of the later boys like mm. uh, Woodwoes and so on, but they're out there, I'm sure. Uh, and obviously, Morgan's design was done by uh, Takuji himself. So, 
yeah, but th that's just a funny thought I had later, and I was just like, oh yeah, that is weird. Neato. Oberon is the is the, the the dungeon master of the campaign. Yeah, that sounds a little bit right. He's not outright railroading us, but he sure do be telling you where to go and what to do. Hey, you should kill some time in this town. Do some fetch quests. All right. So it turns out we move on to section five. This will probably be our last section. Yeah. Uh, for this, what are we at? We're almost at like four hours now. Yeah, this will be a good time. Yeah, we're almost at five. Five-ish hours. Oh, five hours. That's right. We started an hour yeah, early. Fifty-six. Yeah. So yeah, this, this is the five-hour show you were expecting. Mm -hmm. Not all of that is pure lost spell. We were we did mailbag and news for like two hours. So. Mm -hmm. But now we hit yeah, section three. Sheff uh, section five. Fragment three. Sheffield one, <laughs> uh, which I joked was we're rapidly approaching the end knuckles of chapter names. <laughs> It turns out the Goblin crew and Mash headed for Sheffield instead. The city has a hub in the north and a fortress city with enchanted walls. Apparently it incorporates the bark of the world tree in it. I also, have... uh, I, I believe they say this is the only other castle town, actual castle town in Britain, with Camelot being the first. Yes. Which is very interesting. Uh, Built by the lord of the city, Bogard, who apparently sounds like a character and was kicked out of the fan clan after become, failing to become its leader. He is known as Bogart the Braggart and Bogart the Loveless, and an interesting character fact, he is called the Loveless because he will never marry for love and only takes human wives. All of his fairy lovers before him hated him, even betrayed him, so he lost his battles with both Spriggan and Woodrose. Yeah, so this is more of that fairy politics stuff. Mm hmm Turns out that... Also, Matt I... Uh, oh. Talking about that that uh, that thing we talked about where Mash headed to Sheffield, this was apparently while we were still asleep as well. Did I? Oh, okay, I did write it down. Okay. Uh, Mash... yeah, I'm not sure when that gets inserted, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Mash has a castle fetish. Winky... I mean, it, make, it makes sense <laughs> with her shield. It does. Uh, Winky really wants to cut and run, but the white wolf is still there, following silently. At this point in time, we do find out that Mash is having this adventure while we were still passed out in the Nameless Woods. And I just have to ask, just how long were we out? Once again, talking about Oberon's timetable, that guy just left us passed out with name tags for this whole bit. We still haven't caught up to time time. Hmm. So it's, uh, it's interesting. So, uh, the gob, the, the gob, the grob, the gob crew... Takes Mash to see Bogart and tries to sell her, but Bogart sees through it all, seeing that Mash is human. The gobs almost get hanged, but Mash stops it, and Bogart finds that enough reason to let it be. He does you know, because she manhandled his guards. Mm hmm. I just realized I spelled this wrong. Oh wait, no, not no, I spelled it right because he thinks it's something different. Yeah, he... they're pronounced the same way, but spelled differently. Mm -hmm. The joys of text-based games. Also, I like your note earlier. Uh, Bogart clearly comes from the same from the Edison family tree. <laughs> He is a cat man. Yes. Oh, I missed that. I man. will not. I will not grace him with the title of cat dad. But no. he's in the same ballpark, the same the same family tree, the same genus. Yeah, he's he's almost a cat dad. Not quite. Um, he does suggest, suggest to stop going by Annis, which by the power of Wikipedia, uh, Black Annis, also known as Black Agnes or Black Anna, is a bogeyman figure in English folklore. She is imagined as a blue-faced hag or witch with iron claws and a taste for humans' flesh, especially children. She is set to haunt the countryside of Leicestershire. I shrug. Living in a cane in the Dane Hills with a great oak tree at the entrance. They do explain this a little bit later, but in the moment I was like, no, I want to know who this is now. Yeah. So, Which, by the way, that uh, and it makes sense because of uh, Robin Wang's backstory later, but that, that definitely implies that they had a certain thought about this, and then I feel strongly like... like Bogart says that because he's actually met uh, Black and Easton is like, no, it's not a good name. Actually, I wonder. I might I'm, 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 I'm make a uh, note about this later. Make a future note, yeah. Yeah. Um, They talk back and forth, and Bogart says that MASH is to be his 60-second bribe, and I imagine that this is the moment I woke up and screamed, MASH! That would be very funny if that's how that timing worked out. <laughs> that is the first thing we say when we wake up. It is. My co high senses were tingling. 
Also, chat, you can double check me on this. Um, but I feel like this is another point where Lucky has it one way in his notes later. And I have it in my notes now as something else. They start talking about about Mash, uh, and uh, I thought that at one point the 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 townsfolk or the goblins or somebody rumor that she she withstood a blow from Gawain. Uh, but Lucky has it later that that was something attributed to uh, Boggart. Yes. So uh, I, I would like uh, Chat's clarity on uh, if I'm misremembering that in any way. I'm pretty sure I'm right on the right in this one because later uh, spoilers, uh, Tamlin Tristan like also mentions like a, um, mentions uh, something about it. Yeah, like I said, it. it your way makes more sense later, but that, like I said, that's just not how I wrote it down in my notes. Also, that, that if you said that about MASH, that would be funny because it's more true than they know. But, mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. We still have some other other stuff to, to level up to that one. Yep. So, Bogger basically sends off to go get uh, properly dressed and Imter Habitrot, also known as Habicat, known as Habayon Someone the narrator calls matches Final Bastion. Uh, quote, I'm Lady Goddamn Habitrot. I adore her already. Yes, uh, Habanyan based. Based, completely. No fucking cap. Just like, I'm, I'm just, my notes were just like, oh, she's finally appeared. It's great. Mm -hmm. uh, Habitrot takes one look at Mash and decides to marry her on the spot, and I consider this fine. Yeah, I wrote that as uh, Habitrot immediately moves to Cuck Boggart, as is good and just. <laughs> um, Mash uh, learns that her name is actually Mash because she conveniently wrote her name on the shield. My precious Kohai is precious. <laughs> what a dork. But we... And chalk. And chalk. Actually, that's a little weird, but maybe she didn't actually want to write in like paint or ink or something. Uh, we get a new MASH look. I do believe this is the outfit we see in CMs and whatnot. It looks good on her. I love it. Yeah. But uh, while that is... Quote, bridal dress, but, you know, not what we would consider a bridal gown, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Narrator, why are you being so ominous? Please stop. I do believe they, um, at several points during the Sheffield chapter, just mentioned, DOOM IS COMING! And you're just like, No! Um, apparently have started spreading about Lady Mash, including, including being stronger than Boggart. More on that later. Apparently, Boggart can withstand, uh, withstand a blow from Gwen and Mash sent him flying. God Bros continue to be optimistic. Winky continues to regret every mo moment of this. Yeah, this is the part where I, this definitely comes up because it's talking about in the rumors about being stronger than him. At some point... Uh, you know, they do talk about, uh, like, Mash just mentions while she's walking around town, oh, you know, I, it's the least I could do because I destroyed some of the castle walls last night, and I was just like, Mash, what the fuck did you do to these people? <laughs> Don't worry, that comes back. That's a little comedic setup, buddy. Kind of debating the nature of chalk and who the narrator is. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, where was I on this? Oh, uh, Bogger doesn't actually think that Mash is the child of prophecy, and apparently something happened last night. The narrator calls Bogger a cruel but excellent lord. Uh, this seems about right. Mm hmm. Bogger tells a Mash that she needs to act dignified as the lady, and cue Mash acting dignified. Puffing out chest and putting on airs. Realizing there's more to dignity than that. I laughed a bit. As part of her queenly duties, Mash has got to help out with cleaning up more. Habanyan thinks this is adorable. And this this is where I put in the notes because there's a fight here. Damage cut's back, baby! Everything's right in the world! Mm hmm Oh, God, I missed damage cut. Oh, Habanyan... <laughs> Abanyan still claims Mash as her bride and clears her cuteness to the world as is right and just. But she also doesn't want Mash calling her Happy Cat. We get in this fight. Yeah, this is where I wrote in my, my notes um, that Boggart is not actually the worst dude. He's a bit focused on his pride and a little controlling, kind of appropriate for a cat man. But mm -hmm. 
he he has principles, reasons, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also, I believe, where some point in this line where uh, we, because uh, you're talking about you know, Habitrot saying she wants matches of Bright still. I just put note. Bogart's only married to match from Caper. Note, note. Habitrot still says matches are Bright. Yep. Um, behold a oh sorry, behold a level 100 mass in this battle. Give it to me. It was. Yeah, I can't wait for that shit. That's pretty nice. Uh, this is our first fight that we get to uh, play with Habitrot. It's great. She's adorable. Her lines have subtitles for some odd reason. It's a little weird. Yeah, so I I put this note here because this is what people have been saying, but there's two reasons for this. Um, either her NPC version has unique dialogue. This is seen with some NPCs later in this Lost Belt. Mm-hmm. Uh, who have like special skill comps for just the NPC version, they get subtitles because their dialogue is different. Or it's because she's unsummonable until we actually clear the Lost Belt. Because uh, she uh, is added to the FP gotcha later. Can't wait to spend 5 million FP on that one. I'm gonna work on it. Check it, I'm sure we'll know which one it is or be able to check like if the uh, summonable version has different dialogue. But yeah, they seem to be getting better about making sure that you can understand the the characters in context especially when like i said they have special dialogue i mean i wouldn't it might get a little cluttery if it was for everybody all the time but definitely in context where you can't just look up the lines it's the subtitles are good uh, yeah, yeah. muramasa has unique lines later yes well also muramasa is um, unique so yeah well, for a future note, he's actually an alter ego. That threw me for a loop the first time. I was like, wait, I'm doing my team comp rock. Toggable subs would be nice. That, I think, would be a good improvement. Choice is always, or, or almost always, more uh, better for everyone's experience if you can choose to activate certain features. But yeah, that's, that is indeed... Uh, Havanan does have... Uh, uh, which, by the way, that's a solid also translation translating that is Happy Cat. Oh, yeah. But also, one of her dialogue lines when you pick her NP card is just, <laughs> nyan, 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 nyan. And they just go, meow, meow, meow. Like, if that's not in there originally, I'm going to be the most upset person to be. Also, I fucking love her. Just like, I'm going to deal out some happy ends, baby. Literally, happy end mm, It's good. Great. I'm so glad she's an, she's an FP servant later. She's like the most positive gremlin. Yes, she 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 is she is your positivity grip. She's a spinner fairy. But yes, there's some stuff going on here. There's some more stuff going on here. So after the battle, Madishes looks out upon the lands and marvels at them, and Bakker tries to understand her. Not sure if he succeeded though. Yeah, he's not great about that, but he's trying. He's trying. Um, we learned that apparently the marriage is on paper only, but hearing Mash call herself a wicked woman makes my day. Uh, yeah, she is a really uh, oh, slightly overinflated opinion here. <laughs> but along with this conversation, Mash confides her worries with Habitrot about missing something in her heart. Habitrot tries to comfort her, but she says some weird stuff that I'm not necessarily sure I followed. I might actually have to go back. And on. even the narration is is keen to point out that like some of the things Habitrot is just saying to say stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, the narrator continues to be sus. It has to be like Oberon Barrel or Habitrot herself. It's like, that's what I think right now. My current money, I think, is I f I feel like given some of the way she talks about Habitrot, it's got to be like Habitrot at a later point, like cataloging uh, the story. Yeah. Um, but I could also see it being somebody else. That's just how I feel. Uh, some some people in chat are talking about maybe Merlin. I could see that as well. That could also work. He's sassy enough for that. But yeah, that's just my general. Vibe. At this point, narrator activates the reverse card and takes us back. Apparently, Mash is strong enough to shove Bogart through a wall when only a bit surprised. He takes it fairly well. Yeah, so, hey, uh, remember when I asked Mash what did you do? Uh, she just told Bogart, That's my purse, I don't know you! And kicked his ass clean out of this castle. Without trying. Without trying. 
I do want to say, I don't know if like I maybe like glossed over it in previous things or not, but this Lost Belt seems a lot less restrained when talking about potential sexual assault. I think this is like... Yeah, this is why I can't... I can't be like 100% keen on Boggart. Uh, he he does plan on doing a sex crime. Yeah. That is a thing he states he is going to do. Mm-hmm. And just, just because, you know, the girl in question has more of a backbone than most girls, or at least has more supernatural strength to fucking punch his ass out of a tower... Um, doesn't, like, undo that. I at least likes that he, like, doesn't try to repeat that mistake. He realizes that MASH is simply built different. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, no, um, he's not a great guy. You know, even, like, even before this, when the, uh, the Gob, the Gob gang got picked up MASH, they talked about when they sold her, they sell her, she would at least have, you know, a roof over her head and, you know, at least, and, you know, uh, a companion to sleep with. So it's just like, oh, it's like, hmm. Little weird. I don't know if it was necessary, but nothing seems to be actually happening I mean, about it. I don't. I don't know. There's some further dialogue. There's several points. I should phrase it as. There's several points where they discuss the concept of of family and relationships and generations, and all of it makes that kind of stuff weird. Yeah. Number sixty-two. Yes. I'm very glad. By the way, I don't know if Nasi would get this meme necessarily, but I'm glad we resisted the idea to use the sex number. <laughs> That would have been two on the nose. I don't think I could have taken it. Yep. But after this, we cut back to Rob, who's talking to, um... Who's, uh... Wag is his brother. Talking to Wag about their life and, you know, how they have to look out for each other and take care. And how meeting MASH has made them, you know, better people. And, you know, Rab, Rob, you're all right in my books. Yeah, I also put this in my notes. You're a good egg, Rob. Hmm? You're a good egg. We see more of Bogger talking to people and talking to Mash, and I just come to the real realization that Bogger is just a fucking tsundere. It's like he's kind of how they phrase it, isn't it? Because it, it's discussed like I don't remember if it's in this chapter or not, but it's we can talk about it now. Where at some point Habitrot talks about how like Mash is like Bogger's natural enemy. Yeah, not in the sense that like they are opposed worldviews, but just like she's the kind of person he can't deal with. Because apparently, like, his fairy nature, his purpose is he is strongest when he is hated and has someone to hate. Yes. So, MASH doesn't hate him because I think there's probably a list of, like, un I can count the number of people MASH hates on, like, one hand tops. <laughs> um, but also, she's far too adorable for him to hate. Mm -hmm. So, he just doesn't have any power over her and doesn't know what the fuck to do with his life. No, he tries to be the, you know, the cruel and uncaring lore, but he just says something and be like, yes, it'd be very, it would be a good idea to go, you may be out on a date. And he's like, wait, no! Yeah. He's like, away from me, woman! Ah, I gotta go be menacing somewhere. And then he flees. Yeah. And he, like, I think when he's talking about, that is much later, but he talks about, like, he disparages restaurants, which is something that Oxford was said to have later. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, you know, part of, um, Woodboys' whole deal. And then at some point, he just he just says, like, well, it would be uh, it'd be cool to take you to one one time. And then he just goes, why did I say that? Why did I bring that up? Ignore me. Nah. Nah. Bogart does seem like the character to, to swish his cape. Yes. Also, probably, I don't I don't know if the sprite ever shows if he's got a tail back there, but I bet he has a long, swishy lion tail. <laughs> But yes, plot stuff is happening. Also. And plot stuff is happening because we get a scene with Boggard and Habitrot later as they talk about an iron rod similar to Morgan's weapon that could be fires and makes Habitrot sick to touch. Oh. Oh. Mentions that MASH may be avoiding it. Yeah, I believe the story mentioned that MASH had a, a, a iron cylinder mm -hmm. uh, or the iron weapon with her earlier. But this is the first part where you start to realize explicitly what that is. Because mm -hmm. the, the, the Ortonax fell apart, but part of it did not. It's the Black Barrel. The Black Barrel chat. <laughs> After that, we learned that Morgan's 3rd Regiment is coming to do battle. The, the Ramprints are reinforced with the Bark of the Wool Tree. They do have a bad plan for the battle, though. It does seem that Boggart is at least a capable military commander. Later. This is also, by the way, in my notes, I was like, oh boy, is Bogger going to have to take a black barrel nap? Those were our best psychosomatic naps. Mm. 
delicious and life-threatening nap. But yeah, no. Um, also, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the com it's that conversation where Habitrat, where uh, he actually like, Bogart straight up understands what a cannon is. Yes. He talks about it in magical terms. He talks about building up magical energy as opposed to like gunpowder. But he understands the concept of artillery, which is weird. Later that night, we get some more history. Speaking of two major calamities, um, which apparently happen every a thousand years. Uh, let's see. So about 16 years ago, Morgan killed or attempted to kill anyone that might end up being the child of prophecy. And once upon a time, there's a savior up here who stopped inner clan warfare that almost destroyed themselves. That was one calamity. The second calamity was... The War of Summer on the uh, Fagir 2000, where the northern fairies of the Isle of Shadow waged war. They were led by, led by Queen Mob and her human warrior army. This the was Queen of Air and Darkness. This was stopped by the Savior Ask, or Ash Tree. Yes, interesting. Also, by the way, I love this note. This means that uh, Lost Pelt Morgan did her own Mayday Massacre. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys don't know this one, in some versions of the Arthurian myth, uh, Merlin delivers unto Arthur a prophecy saying that a child born on this May Day will cause the downfall of his kingdom. So Arthur does uh, what is generally considered a bad move and has every baby born on May Day rounded up and uh, executed. He may or may not have known about that part, but they're all rounded up and put on a boat and the boat burns down and falls in the lake. Except for Sir Mordred, who is concealed by his mother, Morgaus. Um... This is generally considered to be a bit of a dick move, and in some tellings, this actually causes uh, King Lot, the ruler of Orkney, to rise up again against Arthur in rebellion, which gets him killed by King Pelinor and starts a whole blood feud thing. But yeah, so um, I don't think that's canon to fate, but it is really interesting to, because Natsu obviously would know about it, to have it phrased as like, Morgan basically did her own version of that. Yeah. Which is interesting. interesting. I like it. Themes, parallels. So, Bonger doesn't believe in these saviors because the calamities are still present. Oh, geez, maybe there's something, like, fundamentally wrong here and the world can't take it or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm it's almost like somebody burned down your uh, existential timeline life support system and your world is trying to eat itself or something. A fairy is really, like, passing... I'm starting to realize, fairy is really, like, passing the buck. No one wants to be responsible for shit. Well, this one has so this hasn't been discussed too much, but Oberon, when doing his recaps of fairies at some point, did mention that fairies are are immortal, right? Yeah, they pretty don't much. Age or die. The only way they can run out of energy is basically they fulfill their purpose and and are complete, and then they vanish, or they lose their purpose and freak out and become a Moors. So this means that fairies, uh, like, are usually portrayed this way in folklore as well. But these fairies have a really fucked up sense of time. So to some of them those hundred years, those 2,000 years could just be like the blink of an eye, you know? Mm -hmm. True. So, y you are right in that they're not really good at taking responsibility, but it's probably because they don't <laughs> think of time in that sense. They're True. not being smart about it. Um, whereas humans, obviously, with our, you know, we only have so much time allotted to in our lives, would obviously be like, oh, the fucking world is constantly in danger of ending? We need to get the shit out of here. I, ne I need free time in my life to, you know, Drink mimosas on a beach. What the fuck is a mimosa? I'll tell you later, Mike. <laughs> it's canon. Da Vinci uh, discussed with Mike how to make a mimosa. So, I bet fairies would love brunch drinks. Oh, I bet they would. So, Bogart is going to use this entire situation to his advantage to put the squeeze on Morgan and just needs Mash to sit pretty. Mash is just like, okay. And again, I appreciate that, like, He's not a nice guy, but once he under like once he understands Mash better, not all the way, but like he gets a better grasp on her character and capabilities, his thought is just like, yeah, no, I don't need you to do anything. Just sit here and, and you know, be you. Maybe be a little less you, but just, you know, exist. <laughs> like he doesn't really demand anything from her. And in fact when she tries to help at first he gets a little annoyed because he's just like, Well you could get fucked up out here. I need you to be fine. But like, once stop he that. realizes again how capable she is, he's just like, well, it's good for morale to see you going around, and I, it's not like I, you know, 
don't you don't need the assistance punching more because that's you know shit that other people have to do so fine it's fine everything's fine it was not fine as we go on to the next scene and my only note is winky no yes i wrote basically the same thing winky you fool both in all caps which was followed a different date i compared this to the um the uh walter white screaming in the suv <laughs> meme. it's just like you just you see what he's doing you're just like winky no don't do that winky you fool no don't do it it's too late he did it yep and i followed this with a uh, barrel oh hell no yeah Ugh. with my final bit of oh winky's dead yeah he did a dumb he did a dumb but Somebody in chat asked, if fairies are immortal, why is it scary to have a life tax? It, It's because they still have a finite amount of magical energy. That's what Morgan is siphoning. So if if their energy is siphoned, they also do just, you know, shrivel up and explode. But the, the main thing is that, like, they do not have a biological clock of dying. Honestly, Morgan may have uh, partially also uh, levied the existence tax so that, you know, the fairies who are weak and just fucking around, you know, just die. <laughs> Because otherwise she'd be stuck with them forever. I can't say I hate that idea. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, be real. No, I'm gonna like, be real. Listen, listen. I, I don't think Morgan is a great person either from from all of this, and we know for a fact, pen human history, Morgan had a lot of problems. Yeah, um, she was not great in a lot of ways. Uh, but like at the same time, looking at this society run by fairies, it's also like. Yeah, no, if I could come up with a scheme where where these guys have to pay me money or just fucking die every year, I would. Like, <laughs> these guys suck. Like, I do not want them running around for forever. No, just like, I'm gonna be real. More, yeah, right now, I, I'm just gonna say, Morgan is like a is a bad ruler in a, ruler in a land of bad people. I'm not gonna say that everyone's like, you know, bad and evil, but a lot of people here just yeah. seem to, their number one concern is themselves. Like, yeah. Their secondary concern is themselves. Their third concern is themselves. I and mean, it's yeah, like it's I, weird. I mean, if you if you want to do a one to one comparison, obviously, while uh, Arthur Artoria was not a flawless king, she tried real hard to live up to that unreasonable ideal. Mm -hmm. Morgan is not doing that. No. Morgan almost sounds like, but it's really weird. I hope we once again we get into this in the backstory, but. It sounds like even before she became queen, she was done with this shit. Like, her initial speech, I bring neither absolution nor salvation, is such a, like, no, don't fuck with me. You will serve me, or I will fucking obliterate you. I don't care what you do in your downtime. All you have to do is listen to me. Okay, cool, we're going. It, do like, it really is. It's like she came, like, just pre-done for some odd reason. So, and I, I, I have a strong feeling that will be unpacked. Um, especially because, obviously, I think there is something to be said where, like, we're casting Morgan as, like, the false the false king, you know? And, and Artoria is the rightful king. It's kind of interesting, given their familiar relationship, and how, um, at least in the way the fairies treat it, is they treat uh, Artoria as Morgan's quote-unquote daughter, even though they're not in any way physically related, so... Uh, I think she's a little similar to Saber Alter. They definitely have that kind of, like, coolness factor to it. But um, Saber Alter is much more overtly lawful evil. Like, she definitely has very, very strict codes of conduct and is, like, forward. But also would be the kind of asshole who does the louche move of saying, like, well, if the king doesn't go first, the people won't follow. I will personally leave my room to kick your ass. <laughs> Whereas, as we've seen, we're five chapters in. We have literally not seen Morgan outside of the context of her throne room. Uh, we haven't seen Tamlin Lancelot at all, but that at least implies that she is out in the field, right? Right. You know, Gawain is out in the field. She doesn't ask Tristan to go out in the field, but Tristan does go out because she can teleport anywhere. So, like, it's it's really interesting how just, like, like I said, hands off and done with this she seems. And the more we see from the other clan leaders, this definitely, like other thing like all of them have their own little agenda and it makes me kind of curious about how that works out like are they just truly like like we said following their fey, fey natures like you know woodwose is woodwose because he is the most fang clan fang clan there is you know he's spriggan spriggan because he's the most earth clan of the earth clan kind of thing 
Because honestly, from what we see of the Earth Clan, I totally see it like his only worry is whether or not his bell or his treasure will be blown up. Yeah, that kind of follows what we know about the Earth Clan. He's obsessed about his treasure. He at least, you know, tries to get his people to move, but when they're stubborn like he is and won't budge, he's like, fuck them. Whatever. It's only when the idea that, like, Beryl could get something that's his that he's like, mmm, no, don't like that. You know. Well, not all fairies are born from the planet. They do actually have that discussion earlier. Um, some of them are, are divine spirits, and some of them are out there. This is another thing that I don't remember if we've outright discussed yet, but there is a lot of a recurring theme that fairies don't have religion. Mm -hmm. Even though writing-wise, the like the prophecy and the treatment of, of Aesk and like, the Child of Prophecy is, like I said, very vaguely Christ-like, which obviously makes sense. Um, a lot of Christian stuff was backported into the Arthurian mythology. The Grail cycle got bolted on. Oh, really? Kind of out of nowhere. Um, until, like, the medieval romances, there's no actual reason for the Holy Grail to be anywhere near England. It's just kind of a thing some people thought was cool. Uh, everything is so, fan fiction. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting back and forth. Um, another thing, you know, Percival hasn't appeared on screen, though he's been mentioned. There's a lot of lot of stuff going on, and so we'll, we'll be happy to dig into this uh, next week, because there's still all the real... I mean... Tristan versus Camlin Gawain is pretty good, but like all the real shit hasn't even happened yet. We are still expositing. So there's there's some heavy stuff in there. But yeah, so that's that's the the, the end of our note point. Uh, we'll do a wrap up here as we've we've almost hit five and a half hours. Yeah. Oh, I am definitely gonna go. Uh, you know, get some food, stretch my legs, and uh, try and edit this monstrosity. Uh, this, I mean, this setting alone could be its own RPG setting, yes. I think there are actually some that are like this. Uh, but before we go, I do want to mention, since I have been shilling our Patreon a little, we do have polls. Uh, Fanservant Friday for this, uh, month is going. Uh, and I picked a couple of our more wildly girls for this. Um, so your options this month are, uh, Sir Dagonet Berserker. Uh, as in, uh, Sir Dagonet of the Round Table. Uh, Dead Moros, Rider. Uh, Frau Gauden, also a writer, and uh, Berserker Grendel, who is winning with 55%. Oh. You guys really want to take a crack at that one. But yeah, there's uh, still like almost a week left in the poll. Uh, you have to be at our supporter Patreon at the five and higher level to vote. Uh, I think there are still some people who are eligible who have not voted, so uh, also consider swinging your vote if you want to. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, uh, a place you can go. And yes, no, this is just five sections. It is dense. Uh, and the later segments only get more dense. Uh, like I said, I, I'm at I'm at nine, which should be the end. I think that's like eight pips long. I mean, I'm I'm uh, somebody asking if we're gonna blitz our take. I'm almost done. So is Lucky. He's like in the middle of section eight. So like, we're we're close to being done, but um, it was looking like uh, you know both of us wouldn't be fully done. I could be could have been done earlier, but it, I definitely would have had to distract myself from working on some other shit. Um, you know, so there was a, a few hoops to jump through there. And uh, so we're probably just going to wrap up in, uh, in the next couple of days, I would imagine. Yeah. Like I said, I'm probably going to, I don't know, I might be done. Like, I'm probably done with Fate for um, today. Like, I, I'm probably going to play some other games and stuff. But I'll probably get back to it tomorrow. And I might finish tomorrow. Might not. I still want to take copious amount of notes just so we can maintain a good flow and not have to bounce around all over the place. I... Yeah. It like, like I said, it took me a while, but I do think that me writing so many fucking notes really did help streamline us and keep you from getting too scatterbrained with things. Um. Yeah. So I like it. So I want to keep going with it. Um. Yeah, and it's definitely our our very solid uh, uh, breakthrough in the notes, uh, which I think does generally help a lot of the organization and stuff. Obviously, they're longer, but they're a lot more like detail oriented and thought out and we were we're still able to to unpack our thoughts about like individual characters and stuff as we go through so there's there's definitely some stuff um and uh like if you go back and check out our recaps the only time where we stuck 100 percent to the note taking was lost about five part two that is probably one of our most direct and on the point recaps because it's just beat by beat word by word and we still get the jokes in there as well but like there's a lot of moments there mm -hmm. for lost about five part one you took detailed notes for the first block of sections and then just finished the whole thing in a rush. Yeah. So you stopped taking notes. Yeah. Um, 
and because you were ahead of me, I was just like, oh, I, I decided to rush story rather than uh, take detailed notes. And for Heianko, both of us were just like, oh, it's done. We just zipped right through it because it's only 16 sections. Yeah. And and uh, those 16 se- I think those 16 sections might be shorter than the, the, the 10-ish full sections of this story. It is, is intense, y'all. So yeah, like, um, I, I was really happy re-listening re- to the recap of 5 Part 2 about how detailed our notes were, so hopefully this one stays similar. Definitely got similar length on it. But it is almost midnight. It is indeed time to log into FGO. We'll be letting you out of there. Um, I'm sorry we can't take more time to discuss other, uh, like, um, what's up type thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, there was Summer Game Fest and, uh, you know, the Atlas leaks and stuff. But it is almost midnight, and I'm hungry. I need some food. I've had some snacking earlier, but, yeah. you know, we, we've been doing this for, like, five hours. So I, I would like to get off mic. Uh, just keep your ears open for future thoughts and stuff out there. But uh, other, uh, just in general, video games, good. <laughs> Do what's up on Monday. No, we're going to play Hollow Knight. Don't you like Hollow Knight X? I mean, we'll probably need to fill some time <laughs> on Hollow Knight as, as lucky. Wanders around, around like, where am I? Yeah. Where the fuck am I? Where the fuck am I going? It's a Metroidvania. I do be like that sometimes. So we'll, we'll have some discussion points. But yeah, keep keep your, your eyes out for that. I right, so appreciate you guys talking about resting and eating. Yes, we'll go do that. So I'll do the outro. It goes a little something like this. If you're watching this video on YouTube and haven't already, give us a like. Let me see those likes go up. You can also leave your comments in the comment section down below. We have a Discord, a community Discord. You can follow that link in the video description and on our channel page. You can talk about FGO, Final Fantasy XIV, all kinds of other things here yeah, as well. You can also uh, subscribe if you haven't already to get more of this. We uh, Not necessarily live, though expect to see that a couple of times with these upcoming Lost Belts. But we record Let's Like FGO every week. And post it on our channel. We also normally do a live show about just whatever we've been doing in the week. What's up, like I said. And uh, do other streams and videos throughout the week. Uh, in, in a little bit over there, we're going to get in there and uh, talk about, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, you know, Tamlin Lancelot. That'll be a Wanted at some point. If you haven't seen the Wanted Morgan, check that out as well. Even if you're already subscribed, make sure to ring that bell for notifications. You always know we post a new video or we stream. It's cool. It's important. Ring that bell. You can also click the button to join our channel memberships, get access to membership badges and emotes displayed by people in the uh, text box as well. And also, uh, as I said earlier, sorry, I just realized that my, as usual, my YouTube preview is way the fuck behind. Um, but, uh, uh, as I said earlier, you can support us on Patreon. Get access to episodes early in audio format for as little as a dollar a month or approximately $10 a year. At higher levels, get access to topic polls, video releases early, lots of other fun stuff. And at our higher levels, you can listen to us record Let's Talk FGO live every week, all the time. So, it's a great way to support us. Uh, with that, that's everything I got. So, you know, good night and good luck, everybody. Yep, have a good LB6. Everyone, we'll see you next time. Have a good evening.